Council of Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? The clerk. Mr. President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I'll call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one is Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment, Titles Administration and Other Measures Bill 2021 and a related bill, further consideration in Committee of the Whole. The committee is considering the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment Titles Administration and Other Measures Bill 2021 and Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Regulatory Levies Amendment 2021. And the question is the amendments moved by Senator Hanson on sheet 1377 be agreed to. So if there's no takers, I intend to put that. Deputy President. Oh, big Deputy ahead. President. Sorry, Senator Wishwilsa, I was looking for you in the chamber. Please go ahead. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> I'm just, just glad the systems work, worked first go this morning, which I'm very pleased about. Um, Senator Hanson was in continuation uh, yesterday speaking to her amendment, so I'm not sure if if she's on the if she's on the line at the moment, but I'd be very happy to to give the Greens' views of this amendment. Um, of course, we support retrospectively uh, asking Woodside and other companies to pay uh, for their cleanup in the ocean. Um, the legislation before us today uh, basically is putting in place a pathway to a levy on the oil and gas industry for future liabilities. And the Senate's debated at some length uh, in recent days what those future liabilities are. Um, on some estimates, between 50 and $60 billion future liability of oil and gas infrastructure, uh, like pipelines, like plugged uh, cased wells in the ocean, like uh, rusty rigs sitting there in the sea. Uh, and we know that uh, courtesy of an extremely generous uh, oil and gas uh, petroleum resource rent tax, which PRRT, we call the petroleum wrought rent tax in the Greens. Um, the oil and gas industry has very craftily uh, been able to write off some of those future costs uh, and put the onus back on the taxpayer. Nearly $17.86 billion, according to the estimates the government provided yesterday. But of course, those oil and gas companies have to carry the can for the rest of those liabilities. So they're going to do everything they possibly can uh, in this chamber to uh, move away from those, those liabilities uh, and, of course, make the taxpayer carry the can. Uh, or, uh, as we uh, heard yesterday from uh, Senator Small, and I'll, uh, I'll actually make comment about some of his contributions in a minute, um, the plan seems to be to leave that infrastructure in the ocean as is and do very little uh, remediation work. So the Greens will support this amendment uh, by One Nation. Um, can I, can I uh, raise that? Uh, Senator Small said yesterday he was very pleased uh, commenting on my second reader contribution uh, the week before last uh, that I acknowledge that Woodside pay uh, income tax. Well, I'm happy to put the facts on the table, uh, Deputy President. Woodside do pay income tax. Uh, but my point was that, like a lot of other oil and gas companies, they pay uh, virtually no 
petroleum resource rent tax. In other words, no super profit tax uh, on this industry. Um, the Greens initiated a quarry back into this in 2017 and 18 to push really hard for changes to the PRRT to remove the ridiculously generous uplift rates that oil and gas companies were claiming, not just on operating expenditure, uplift rates of 5% per annum, but uplift rates of 15% per annum on all their high risk exploration costs. And of course, uh, the ridiculous situation we found ourselves in, where if there was a, an oil leak in the ocean, uh, like we saw up off the northwest shelf uh, in the Timor Sea in recent memory, uh, the oil and gas companies can claim those expenses against their, uh, their future payments to the Australian people and create an even bigger uh, liability for the taxpayer. So the Greens have pushed really hard to, to try and get these changes. Um, and, and yes, look, let's put the facts on the table. I was pleased, uh, shall I say, that Senator Small yesterday also declared uh, that he is an ex-employee from Woodside Petroleum. Uh, I listened with interest to his first speech to the Senate and I don't remember him saying, and he be, of course can come in and correct the record, I don't remember him saying he was an executive at Woodside Petroleum prior coming into this place where he replaced uh, Senator Cormann. We have heard a lot about the revolving door between Australian politics, including this Senate chamber and oil and gas companies like Woodside Petroleum. But it seems as though the door is uh, revolving the other way. And we're now getting uh, oil and gas executives coming in to the Senate chamber. And of course, uh, while he briefly acknowledged uh, the details in the bill and the amendments before us today, um, what did Senator Small do? He spent the majority of his speech doing the bidding of Woodside Petroleum. He spent the majority of his speech uh, talking about how we need to reduce the future financial liabilities to Woodside and their shareholders. About how, I think to quote uh, his exact words, um, we might uh, work uh, closely um, on more legislation uh, in consultation with the industry uh, to reduce their future liabilities. And of course, the plan as we've seen uh, in media in recent weeks is to uh, adopt the principle of leaving this oil and gas infrastructure uh, in, in the ocean. Uh, and of course, uh, the Greens have significant concerns as do a number of other stakeholders about the environmental impacts of that particular issue. And of course, what has been new uh, since uh, the debate started in the Senate the week before last? Well, Woodside Petroleum has now bought uh, the fossil fuel assets of BHP, which makes Woodside one of the biggest fossil fuel companies on the planet. What they've also purchased was not just the assets of BHP. Lo and behold, they purchased the future liabilities that BHP had in relation to the cleanup of their infrastructure offshore and onshore, particularly in Bass Strait off the coast of Tasmania, where I live. I recently uh, spoke to Jacob Grieber at the Fin Review. Uh, he was writing an article about Woodside Petroleum, and I said, why would you be a Woodside shareholder? What, you've seen BHP, a company that's been burning fossil fuels and extracting fossil fuels for decades, making a decision that they want to exit from oil and gas uh, and coal. Why would they be wanting to exit? Because they realise these are going to be stranded assets. They realise that the oil and gas and the fossil fuel industry has significant political risk. Indeed, I would say that's the biggest risk to these companies, is that they rely on government to have their back in a place like this, like in the Australian Senate. And that's exactly why Senator Small was in doing the bidding of Woodside yesterday, exactly why he was doing their bidding. And it shows the risk to this company in the future is that they have invested in a model of crony capitalism. Yes, they've invested in the assets of BHP, but what they've actually invested in is that politicians in this place have got their back. They won't get a carbon price, uh, which will tax their pollution into the future. They won't have to worry about the, the, the 40 to $50 billion worth of trailing liabilities for cleaning up their mess in the ocean with all these oil and gas rigs and other infrastructure. They also will be relying on political support for a whole range of issues related to emissions controls, 
specifically uh, Australia's emission reduction targets. So when I think of Woodside Petroleum, I think of risk, risk, risk. And the only thing that's going to mitigate that risk uh, is uh, politicians who are in their pocket. And let's be honest, we all know the problem in this place is corporate donations, and we've never been able to break that nexus. With proper transparent disclosure rules, with independent commissions against corruption, all the things the Greens Party have been fighting for for decades to break this nexus between corporate donations and the political power that they wield in this place. Well, we know from the, uh, the ICC report that the world is on the edge of an irreversible climate disaster. A code red for humanity was the exact description that was used. This is such a critical time in history for us to break this nexus between the fossil fuel industry and politicians, pay for play, getting what they want in this place. And this amendment before the House today by One Nation is a good start. I commend One Nation for bringing this forward. Uh, it's good to see them joining the Greens in the fight to hold big fossil fuel companies to account. We need to see a lot more of that in this place. And I'll look forward to making a contribution to Senator Patrick's amendment, uh, which will be coming up after this, I understand. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Wishelson. Um, Senator Watt, I believe Senator Patrick wants the call, if that's okay with you. Thanks. Senator Patrick. Thank you very much, um, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I want to speak also in favour of this, uh, of this amendment from One Nation. Uh, it is a good amendment. I just want to sort of reflect on the debate that's taken place thus far. We have uh, seen people talking about Northern Oil and Gas Australia, so NOGA being a company that was unable uh, to, uh, or purportedly unable to meet its obligations. Uh, and you know, so a lot of the damage, a lot of the blame has been uh, basically directed towards them. But they are not the only party involved here, and they are not the uh, the, the only party that needs to share uh, the blame. Now, uh, as uh, Senator Bush Wilson has just been talking, Woodside played a significant role in this. Basically, they decided that they uh, had. Uh, exhausted what they wanted to get out of the Laminara field. And so they offloaded, or in fact, they started to reduce maintenance on the Northern Endeavour. And then eventually they offloaded uh, that uh, asset to, uh, to, to Noga. And uh, they did so, in my view, completely irresponsibly. They knew exactly what they were doing. They were getting rid of their um, obligation to clean up the mess uh, or, or clean up the, the, uh, the field and mm -hmm. remove the Northern Endeavour. Now, the strange thing here is that after the, the whole uh, uh, liquidation of, of NOGA and the taxpayer starts to pick up the bill, Woodside has been paid $8 million in consulting fees on how now to clean up the mess. So they Rid, they rid themselves of the responsibility, and then the taxpayer is now paying them to give advice on how to clean up the field. And that is just an unbelievable uh, situation. We also have uh, NOPTA. Now, NOPTA, uh, of course, uh, they are responsible for uh, uh, the issuing of titles and, and looking at uh, 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 each of the different entities that uh, uh, deal with... Um, uh, or that, that, that wish to operate uh, in and around Australia. And of course, um, uh, in this circumstance, and, and the thing this bill is trying to fix up, uh, Woodside didn't sell off the tenement, they sold off the company that owned the tenement. Mm. The, the controversy that this bill is trying to fix uh, uh, today. But on evidence that has been provided uh, at estimates, they they realised this loophole existed back in 2015. They realised this from another situation, and yet they didn't do anything about it. And so we ended up with the, the, the situation that's now taken Woodside and, uh, and the Northern Endeavour, uh, but basically uh, occurring when it was all preventable. They knew about the loophole and they did nothing. So NOPTA also has to share some blame here. NOPSEMA. NOPSEMA are the safety and environmental uh, regulator. Uh, they, of course, uh, are responsible for 
uh, a vessel that might be moored off uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Australian coastline, extracting oil and gas. Uh, now, they, um, uh, they were the ones that stopped the production licences. They, they initi initiated a, a prohibition against uh, Northern, the Northern Endeavour operator, uh, which is a company called UPS, basically stopping the, uh, the company from producing oil. Now, that company would have continued to operate had there been uh, cash flow available from the production of the oil. But they effectively stopped that, and I understand that they did that for safety reasons, but I say, and having uh, worked with uh, Senator Hansen at Estimates on this, I say that uh, that uh, NOPSEMA did not work collectively with NOGA to try and uh, deal with the safety situation. Ironically, the safety situation that uh, initiated the prohibition was the falling of a pipe. Uh, and, no, and it was self-reported. It wasn't as though, as though uh, the operator uh, didn't do the right thing. They reported it. Uh, and no one seems to know where the pipe is. That's gone missing. And that uh, became the start of all of this. Uh, all of this, uh, this. And uh, I said the other day, I went to uh, Noxima at Estimates and I said, uh, after they'd entered uh, into uh, administration, I said, you need to help this company. You need to put on the table what it is they need to do to get the vessel safe, uh, safe again. And uh, Noxima simply weren't interested in assisting. And of course, that left the company in no position uh, to be able to continue because they didn't know what the pathway back to operation was. They didn't know how to get cash flow uh, returning. Uh, I said to uh, the, the head of NOPSEM at the time, you are going to drive this company into administration or into liquidation. He said, no, no, that won't happen, Senator. And a month later, we find the taxpayer having to step in to operate the vessel. We see uh, upstream uh, uh, production solutions operating uh, the vessel. Now, they were operating the vessel prior uh, to this mess, and now we're paying them again to operate the vessel in lighthouse, lighthouse mode. And if you look at the, uh, the, the auditor's report that uh, uh, dealt with uh, NOGA, you can see that the government is paying something like twice the odds to operate a vessel in lighthouse mode uh, than uh, what uh, NOGA were paying for them to operate a vessel that was producing uh, oil. It's just incredible. Uh, Lloyd's International. Lloyd's International was the classification society that had issued the class certificate for Northern Endeavour, which is a key document that, uh, uh, th that is required in order for them uh, to be able to operate and, in effect, uh, not, uh, not seem or were relying on that. Thank you. Uh, they were found in a report, and I'll read from it uh, just so that uh, I get this correctly. Uh, from the NOPSEMA report. Serious concerns regarding the veracity of Lloyd's Register's international application of its rules and processes and the resulting information. The indication of this is its calls, of this is it calls into question the reliability of information provided to the operator of the facility and the extent to which they may use it to assess a risk of structural failure, which could lead to catastrophic consequences for both personnel and equipment. So bottom line is, uh, Seema went in and looked at the organisation Lloyds, and Lloyds were found to be remiss in their ability not just to issue uh, certifications in relation to the Northern Endeavour, uh, but also the other three vessels uh, that were uh, examined at the time. So we've got other vessels that were, that, that were out there that Lloyds had certified improperly, and Seema had a responsibility to make sure that they were doing their job. Now, I can tell you right now, Lloyd's is still getting paid to do classification uh, certifications on the Northern Endeavour. And I might point out that had Lloyd's done its job properly, uh, we would have known much, much sooner that the Northern Endeavour had some issues. Uh, and in fact, Noga, the company that bought it, they bought it when it was in certification, uh, would have looked much, much uh, more closely at the, at the vessel had uh, they not had that class certificate. So there are a number of players that have been responsible uh, uh, for this. We shouldn't just sheet home blame to NOGA. Uh, and it's for that reason, uh, and particularly in relation to Woodside, 
who knew exactly what they were doing, uh, that I'm supporting Senator Hanson's amendment. Uh, her amendment takes the responsibility back to 2015, not 2021. Now, people might look at that and say that's re retrospective. We don't like retrospective legislation. But this is remedying a conscious act by a company, Woodside Petroleum, to offload their own responsibility, to offload their own responsibility. And so uh, in terms of uh, this being retrospective, and uh, it, all it does is remedy unconscionable conduct by Woodside Petroleum, unconscionable conduct by Woodside Petroleum. That's what we're trying to remedy here. And that's why the Senate should be supporting Senator Hanson's amendment. Companies ought to know that if they operate in and around Australia in a manner which is not consistent with their ethical obligations, then the parliament will retrospectively uh, hold them to account. And uh, you know, there is enough evidence on the table for that to occur. Uh, people just have to go and look at the reports, uh, the Walker review, uh, into this whole affair, look at Senate estimates. We have examined this properly, and the right thing to do is to uh, hold Woodside to account. Uh, yes, it goes back to 2015, but that's when they were committing unconscionable acts trying to offload their responsibilities. Thank, Thank you. you. Senator Patrick. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, as the government has already announced an industry levy to deal with the Northern Endeavour uh, and Noga issue in the budget, Labor won't be supporting this amendment. Uh, Labor has been vocal on the government's negligence on this issue. In April, Labor released a statement welcoming the Morrison government's acknowledgement of serious and costly shortcomings in the regulatory system that cover the critical issue of how to ensure the proper and timely deep commissioning of oil and gas infrastructure in Australian waters. It's a shame it took the Northern Endeavour fiasco to trigger government action on this issue, especially when you consider this profound regulatory failure will cost the Australian taxpayer an estimated $210 million. However, the government has announced an industry levy already to pay for this. This is separate to the regulatory reform proposed in this legislation. Making policy retrospectively is almost always bad policy and undermines certainty. The decommissioning framework has the support of the industry because it's not retrospective and therefore not going to undermine the integrity of investment decisions that have already been made. This reform is too important to rush through amendments uh, which could have unintended consequences for the safety of these projects and the environment. So to reiterate, uh, we absolutely have concerns with the way the government has managed this process. It's why we moved a second reading amendment, um, being highly critical of the government's failure to take action on these matters. It's unfortunate that that second reading amendment was not supported uh, in this chamber, uh, but uh, we do not support this amendment that has been moved by One Nation. Thank you, Senator Watt. Um, I'm going to Senator Hanson on the screen. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Deputy President. Um, look, it's quite interesting. And I just want to say thank you very much to the Greens and to Senator Patrick for their support in this matter. For over the years now, I've been raising issues about um, the oil and gas, especially the, off the Northwest Shelf and other issues. Um, Senator Patrick is right. In the Senate Estimates Committee, we actually questioned the Senator Matt Canavan, who was a Senator for Resources at the time, when I was brought to my attention what was happening up in the Northern Endeavour. We need a full investigation into that. I believe that there's been a cover-up. I don't believe it's been um, dealt with properly. And even now with this amendment, to listen to Labor say that this is a rushed through amendment, well, that's a I, I just I just can't believe it. We hear every time that we may put up an amendment to a bill that's going to prove legislation for the people of Australia, that's Labor's answer to it. It's always rushed through. We haven't had time to look at it. Well, that's a weak excuse because then if I'm questioning the Liberal Party or the coalition government over their deals that they've done, why have they allowed Woodside to pay $24 million to, um, to Noga to actually take over this company to forego their responsibilities in the clean-up. 
So then I've got to ask, aren't you, don't you want um, representation for the people? Or are you quite prepared to sit back and let the, the taxpayers pay for this? Because that's exactly what they're doing. You are pathetic in, your, in the way that you are dealing with this and saying it's rushed through legislation. You also said about an industry levy. Well, where is it? Where's the legislation? They say they're going to bring it in, 48 cents a barrel. Haven't seen the legislation. So how do you know it's going to happen? Or do you trust and believe the government that it is going to happen? That's a change, isn't it? You'd be the ones jumping up and down and saying, well, where's the legislation? Don't you think it's putting the cart before the horse? So if they're, they're, yeah, we have a responsibility here. It's cost hundreds of millions of dollars. As I said yesterday, something stinks to high heaven here. When you have a company like Woodside paying $55,000 a year to have access to the National Party ministers in the resources portfolio, which they always hold, that tells me something is not right. We know because we, Senator Rex Patrick and I really investigated that about the Northern Devon was going on there. That was a cover up there, if I've ever seen one. But they, we were shut down and asking questions in the Senate estimates because they didn't want us asking the questions. And Senator Matt Canavan was absolutely hopeless because he didn't really know his portfolio or didn't know what was exactly going on and was also in cover up mode. So it's not fair on the Australian people that we have to wear this. We're trying to get accountability here, which is most important that we do. We're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. What I'm asking for is I want the Labor Party, I want the others to really have a look at this retrospectivity. Yes, I, I agree with you that to bring this in at a time is not really good. But when we know that it was purposely done to actually get rid of their responsibilities, then you've got to question that as well. And why was it allowed to happen? And why was the um, Woodside paid $8.8 .8 million to get their advice, as Senator Rex Patrick said? Honestly, I think it stinks to high heaven, and I'll keep saying that over and over again. And for every member of parliament there who sits back and doesn't ask for accountability, you're not worth the salt and you shouldn't be sitting there on the benches in that parliament there to represent the Australian people. This is important to the Australian people. Let's have some accountability. And once again, I will say thank you very much to the Greens for your support and your common sense in this matter and to Senator Rex Patrick. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Hatz and Senator Small. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And I have just been gutlessly defamed in this place under the guise of parliamentary privilege by Senator Wish Wilson. So I wish to raise under 1933 of the standing orders uh, that he has effectively accused me of corruption in being uh, paid to do Woodside's bidding in this place. And I'm happy for the Hansard to be reviewed such that you can make a determination. But it is shameful uh, and I won't stand uh, as a representative of the people of Western Australia in this place to be accused of such things uh, and for there to be no consequence. So I request that you make a ruling uh, and I request that the record stand corrected because this is an affront to me and it is an affront to the rights of uh, our democracy in sending people to this place to act in the best interests of Australians. Uh, thank you, Senator Small. I don't believe uh, Senator Wish Wilson has transgressed, but we will. Uh Get the Hansard reviewed and come back to you if necessary. Thanks. Are you seeking the call, Minister? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, look, thank you very much, um, Madam Deputy President. Um, in response to the contributions that have been made in relation to this amendment that has been put forward by One Nation, uh, the government would just like to, to make it very clear um, that we do not support retrospective legislation. Uh, because it has significant impacts on Australia's reputation and credibility, and it breaches fundamental principles of law and justice. Um, however, we also believe that this bill that is before us at the moment strengthens Australia's offshore oil and gas decommissioning framework and ensures former title holders can be called back to decommission and remediate the environment in a broad range of circumstances. Uh, I can assure the Chamber that the government is absolutely committed to ensuring the costs of decommissioning. Uh, remain the responsibility of the oil and gas industry. Uh, and as noted by um, one of the contributions um, on this particular amendment, uh, in the case of the Northern Endeavour, legislation will soon be coming before Parliament 
to impose a levy on the industry to recover the associated costs, and I can assure this chamber that the Australian taxpayer will not be footing the bill. I'll put that. Uh... Oh, sorry. Deputy President. Senator Hanson. Sorry, Senator Wish Wilson. Deputy. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Deputy President. Can I can I also add? Like how disappointed I am that Labor is not supporting this amendment today. Um, it is good to hear the minister's reassurance that she will be bringing some legislation forward uh, for debate. But while Senator Small is in the chamber, could I remind senators what he said yesterday in his contribution? He said, in terms of the liabilities to the industry and to the taxpayer, which he outlined, 17.8 billion dollars over the next 10 years, uh, that we should reduce that liability with, quote unquote, some smart regulation and industry cooperation, which suggests to me that there's a move afoot here to negotiate with the industry or go through a consultation process in terms of the upcoming legislation to this place. That involves a bigger push by the industry to get out of their liabilities that they signed up to, uh, going back to when they originated these projects. Uh, it's no secret that there's a big push on through Appia and other organisations to uh, leave these uh, infrastructure assets, whatever you want to call them, uh, in the ocean uh, and reduce their future liabilities. So I would urge Labor to reconsider this opposition to this amendment. Before the chamber today, we have a chance to make Woodside pay for this. Um, two other points I'd like to make in relation to this debate and this amendment, uh, Dep Acting Deputy President. Um, Senator, Senator Small said that I've shamelessly defamed him. Well, I'm sorry, Senator Small, if that's what you think. That is not what I have done today. I have simply outlined that you came into the chamber and did the bidding of Woodside and the fossil fuel industry. Your words will speak for themselves. There's uh, a point of order. Sorry, Senator Wish government. Wilson. There's a point of order, Senator Brockman. As, as Senator Wish Wilson is repeating an accusation against a member of this place, clearly in breach of section 1933 of the standing orders, and I would ask you to get him to withdraw. Senator Wish Wilson, uh, there has been a point of order. If do you agree uh, then uh, to the proposition? Can you withdraw your comment and then proceed? The President, I, I, I perhaps ask you to take advice from the clerk on this. I understand that the deputy president was going to was going to review that. Uh, I, her statement was that she doesn't believe that I had transgressed. Uh, so um, I. I would rather not withdraw until that deliberation has been made. If that is what the Senate has decided, I would be happy to withdraw that. Uh, thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Um, as I understand that the Deputy President is going to review that, um, so there will be a report back to the Chamber. So, Senator Wish Wilson, you can continue with your remarks. Yeah, thank you, President. I'd also like to make some remarks in relation to uh, Senator Patrick um, yes, and what he said. Senator Wish um, Wilson, there is a point of order again. Point on on yeah. the same point of order, I would ask then that while this matter is being reviewed by the President, that Senator Wish Wilson ceases making those accusations against a member of this place. Thank you, uh, Senator. The point of order. Um, has been raised previously. It's the same point of order, and I report again that the uh, deputy president is having this reviewed. So I will ask you, Senator Wilson, Wil Wish Wilson, to be mindful of that and to continue your remarks. Uh, yes, and on that point of order, President. Yes, I, I won't bring it up again. Um, I'm very happy to uh, to not bring this up again while it's being looked at. Um, could I just relate, uh, in, in relation to Senator Patrick's comments on uh, NOGA, on Northern Oil and Gas um, Australia, um, I said over in the last week of Parliament that this looked like the perfect scam. 
uh, in terms of Woodside selling uh, an, an asset at the end of its shelf life, uh, probably written off to next to nothing on their books with a massive trailing liability. Um, I can't comment as to the intentions of Noga when they bought this, uh, this asset, uh, except to say they, they obviously thought they were onto a winner, buying a production asset that may have, may have had some prospective expiration. I think I mentioned that in my previous contribution. Um, I would have hoped uh, that they would have done their due diligence and realised they were buying into a significant liability over time and that they had the uh, we're all to deal with that in terms of raising equity or other finance. Uh, but I certainly uh, don't uh, stand back at all from my comments uh, about Woodside Petroleum. I mean, they must have known that this came with hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars worth of future trailing liabilities. Uh, they must have known that when they sold the business. Uh, but I do accept uh, the additional information uh, that Senator Patrick has provided today um, that there were other failings, including with the regulator. Absolutely there were. I participated in those estimates questions as well. Um, this is a, a collective mess uh, that we never want to see happen again. And while we have this significant issue ahead for Woodside Petroleum and their shareholders with the massive liabilities that they bought by purchasing BHP, um, this is an issue uh, that we absolutely must deal with and it needs significant public debate. So uh, once again, um, I thank One Nation for bringing this uh, forward and I'll uh, look forward to continuing my contributions in relation to Senator Patrick's amendments. Thank you. Minister? If there's uh, no further speakers, uh, I will move the... Chair. Sorry, Senator Patrick. Thank you very much. I just would uh, also like to follow up on uh, a couple of the contributions as well. Uh, it is a shame that we find ourselves again uh, in the chamber uh, trying to hold uh, people to account in relation to uh, past uh, indiscretions, the unconscionable sale of a, of a, of a vessel uh, that was uh, in fact uh, rapidly becoming a stranded asset. Uh, to a smaller company, um, we, we, we find, again, only the, cross, only the cross bench pursuing this. Labor not really wanting to stick up its hand and support uh, Senator Hanson in her attempts to hold Woodside to account. Now, um, I, I would uh, encourage the Labor Party to reconsider their position because uh, this is about making people accountable. When we recognise that there has been a failure in a company, a failure that ultimately sought to have the taxpayer uh, bear the cost of a stranded asset, uh, the, the parliament should act. We should do that. We shouldn't always, uh, as it seems to be, we, we shouldn't always be uh, trying to uh, protect the oil and gas industry. I said yesterday, uh, that uh, at an inquiry uh, with the Economics Committee last Friday, you know, we went through the fact that this industry uh, has taken in, in 2018-19 $62 billion of our resource, they've exported it overseas, and the taxpayer has got in return $1 billion, $1.06 billion in uh, PRRT uh, as compensation for the sale of this uh, non-renewable asset. Every single time oil and gas companies uh, engage in activity here in this country, it appears as though the taxpayer pays. So uh, we end up with the taxpayer basically paying for all of their investments. If they make a bad mistake in terms of uh, a project, again, uh, that value is written off. The taxpayer basically bears the cost of it. Uh, and yet uh, we have an amendment that's put up that aims to hold one of the companies to account for an unquestionable sequence of events. And yet the Labor Party doesn't want to stand up. Now I'll direct myself back at, uh, at the Liberal Party here. Um, we know that uh, if we go back uh, two decades, Woodside again were the beneficiaries of the 
spying activity that took place in East Timor. In 2004, the Australian government, ACES, bugged the Timorese um, uh, cabinet rooms to listen in on their negotiating team when we were negotiating a sea boundary. Now, they did that when we had shook hands with the uh, Timorese and said, we're going to negotiate in good faith. We then uh, command, or the, the government then commands ACES to go and uh, set up under cover of an aid program listening devices inside the cabinet rooms of, of the, of the Timor-Leste uh, government. And uh, while they were doing that, I might point out, uh, there was quite significant terrorist activities, a rise in threats in Indonesia in re relation to Jamaa Islamia. And uh, they went on, of course, I think, uh, uh, within the month to, to blow up the Australian embassy. But no, we were focusing our efforts on uh, oil and gas negotiations for which Woodside became the beneficiary. Why is the government continually operating on behalf of Woodside, on behalf of uh, this, uh, 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 on behalf of this company? We've had uh, a, an expert in international law uh, uh, provide information to that, in fact, Australia's national interest is apparently whatever Woodside's national interest is, or Woodside, sorry, uh, company interest is. So I asked the minister, uh, I understand the issues associated with retrospectivity, but is it, is it not proper to hold a company to account when it is clear on, uh, on the evidence that they sought to basically dissolve themselves of a debt uh, in order to ab avoid their clean-up obligations. Why is that not uh, something that the government can do? Uh, that's all this does in terms of respectivity, um, is holds a company to account for misconduct. Why, Minister, are you not uh, going to support this, noting that in these circumstances it is, it is clear that the, respect, uh, the retrospectivity uh, is designed to remedy unconscionable conduct by a company? Minister. Um, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President, and thank you very much, Senator Patrick. Um, I think uh, I've been reasonably clear, um, has, has the minister, um, that we don't support retrospective legislation for the reasons that we've stated, and, and I know that you're an absolute stickler for protocol and process um, along those lines. However, we've made it very, very clear um, in this place that in the instance of the Northern Endeavour, for which you are referring, um, that we are intending to bring legislation to this place um, very shortly in relation to ensuring that it is the industry that is held to account on these matters and that the taxpayer is not the one to foot the bill. And I look forward to continuing our contribution and discussion at that time. Thank you, Minister. Senator Patrick, I saw you this time. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, to the Minister, um, uh, again, and I thank you for uh, uh, acknowledging that I do respect um, the principles around retrospective legislation, uh, but if it's clear that Woodside um, have engaged in conduct that sought to basically dissolve themselves of a responsibility. And uh, you, you have indicated that the intention is to bring in a, um, a, a levy. In fact, uh, Minister Pitt has uh, indicated that. Uh, that levy, as I understand it, will be uh, right across industry. So not that I think there's many good players in amongst that industry. They all uh, seek to maximise profit and don't really uh, give proper uh, due uh, payments back to the people who host them the, and, and who's, who's, who own the resources. But is it tr isn't it true that you will seek through the levy to recover the money right across industry, not necessarily with Woodside, who one can fairly look at and say uh, are mostly responsible for this mess. Minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, obviously, Senator Patrick, you have the opportunity to be able to, um, to investigate the, the legislation when it comes out in draft. 
um, very, very shortly in relation to the circumstances that exist around the, the legislation to impose a levy. Uh, but you're correct. Um, the government is seeking by um, this mechanism to make sure that the whole of industry is held to account um, for the behaviours of that industry. Um, but the details, obviously, of how that go is going to be achieved will be matters contained in that bill. Chair, it's Senator McKim here. I'm just seeking the call. Senator, you have Senator McKim. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll be brief. Um, I've heard um, Minister Rustin's um, comments regarding the government's uh, lack of desire to retrospectively legislate, and I can't let the opportunity go past without reminding the Senate that this government has repeatedly retrospectively legislated to deny the rights of refugees in this country. You have repeatedly retrospectively legislated to ride roughshod over the human rights of thousands of people who sought asylum in our country. And as a result, you have created humanitarian calamities and catastrophes, uh, been responsible for the death of, uh, of double figures uh, in terms of numbers of people and destroyed hundreds and, uh, and potentially thousands of lives because you have repeatedly retrospectively legislated to deny rights to refugees and people who have sought asylum in our country. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator. Any further speakers? Yes, Senator Roberts. Senator Patrick. Patrick. Sorry, Senator Patrick. Thank you very much. I just wanted to uh, note uh, in the chamber here that uh, according to the Centre for Public Integrity, uh, Woodside donated $110,000 to both the Labor Party and the Liberal Party in 2019-20. So my question is to the Minister, and I invite Senator Watt to stand up and respond to this on behalf of the Labor Party. Uh, has, um, you know, do those donations, quite significant donations, uh, have any bearing or any influence on you in relation to not supporting this bill that, of course, would have adverse effect for Woodside? Minister. Um, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Of course, they do not influence our decisions. Senator Patrick. I just invite uh, through you, Chair, that uh, maybe Senator Watt, on behalf of the Labor Party, might uh, make a statement on that. Senator Watt, who is seeking the call? Uh, thanks, Madam Deputy President. The answer is no. Um, the, I'm not even aware of whether Woodside make donations to the Labor Party or not. I know Senator Patrick is asserting that. Um, and uh, if that logic holds true, then every donation that Senator Patrick has ever received would influence his vote and the donations of people like Graham Wood uh, and professional gambling outfits that the Greens have received would influence their voting decisions as well. So um, I, I, I question Senator Patrick and the Greens whether the donations they have received. I mean, this is this circular argument we can get into. Um, we have made our position clear. We have actually moved a second reading amendment on this bill, uh, which a range of parties didn't support. Um, we have attempted to put to improve this bill as a result of that, um, and I know that the crossbench lives to criticise the Labor Party and to take votes off the Labor Party and take seats off the Labor Party. Um, but I would encourage the crossbench to think about the fact that this is government legislation, and it may be a better use of your time to focus on the government's activities rather than continuing um, to attack the Labor Party. I've got a news break for you: we're not the government. Uh, Chair Senator McKim seeking the call. Senator McKim. Um, thank you again, Chair. Well, look, I can't let Senator, Rot Senator Watt's remarks um, pass unchallenged. He seems to know more about donations to Greens and crossbench senators than he does about donations to his own party. So I'm going to assist Senator Watt here by placing firmly on the record that Woodside's political donations in the last nine years in Australia 
total $2,111,190. Of that, $1,110,190 has gone to the LNP and $1,001,000 has gone to the Australian Labor Party. So, Senator Watt, your party has received over a million bucks in institutionalised bribery from Woodside in the last nine years. And I'd urge you to stop focusing actually on the crossbench and start having a look in the mirror and understand how corrupted your party, as well as the LNP, has become through receiving uh, this level of political donations from Woodside. And of course, these are only part of the donations that the LNP and the ALP receive from other planet cooking companies who have a corporate profit making model which externalises the true costs to our climate and to our environment and to all of us and instead uh, embeds those costs in profits to their shareholders and uses some of those profits to bribe the ALP and the LNP for outcomes in the Senate and in the Parliament of Australia. It's institutionalised bribery. Corporate political donations should not be allowed and they certainly should not be allowed from companies whose business model is predicated on destroying nature and cooking our planet. Thank you, Chair. Any further speakers? Senator Patrick. Thank you, um, um, Chair. I just want to put on the record I have never received any donations from Woodside Petroleum or any other uh, oil and gas company. Senator Wish Wilson. I'd also like to put on record, uh, Acting Deputy President, the Greens have never received any donation from Woodside Petroleum or any other company in the fossil fuel industry uh, that I know of. But I think this raises this debate is very important. It's significantly in the public interest, Acting Deputy President. I might, if senators aren't aware of the very important distinction between institutional corruption and personal corruption. Uh, institutional corruption is an accepted definition. Uh, a significant amount of work has gone into looking at the issue of institutional corruption, how institutions become systemically corrupted over a period of time. I've repeatedly raised this issue of institutional corruption. Another word for it is crony capitalism, which I referred to in my earlier contribution this morning. Crony capitalism is quite simply a term we use when governments are in bed with big business. And we all know this nexus between political donations and the large political parties is the root cause of the reason we are in a climate emergency. The reason that this government has done nothing in the nine years that it's been in power, nothing at all to tackle climate change. And we're having, a, we're having a, an amendment before us today on a bill about cleaning up the mess of the fossil fuel industry. But each year, our government hands out new acreage to these exact same companies so they can repeat this. 80,000 square kilometres of our oceans handed over to more fossil fuel exploration, more potential production, more burning, the exact same product that is killing our oceans. And I make no apologies for coming into this place and representing nature and future generations of Australia. We have witnessed the loss of half the corals on the Barrier Reef because of the burning of fossil fuels by the exact same companies that are going out and exploring for fossil fuels. The exact same companies that I believe are trying to deliberately use this process to reduce their future liabilities to them and their shareholders. What we need to be doing at this point in history is transitioning to clean energy. We need a plan to totally ban all new offshore oil and gas exploration. To listen to what the International Energy Agency said just this year. This year is the year to end all offshore oil and gas exploration. That's coming from the world's premier energy agency. Why is it in this country we're doing exactly the opposite? 
This debate we're having today on this amendment is crucial to this point. We don't want to be making it any easier for the fossil fuel industry at this point in history in a climate emergency to be burning and exploring for more fossil fuels, Acting Deputy President. Um, the more we let them off their liabilities, the more we allow the taxpayer to step in and carry the externalities that they so obviously create. I'll just finish by saying it's the government's job to solve for externalities, to put a price on pollution, to do the other things that are required to solve environmental problems. Every environmental problem we look at, including climate change being the biggest problem, is first and foremost a political problem. And it's a political problem because of the nexus between big corporate donations and big political parties. And if you come into this place and you're annoyed and you're angry because you're part of that, well, I'm sorry, have a good look at yourself. Senator Patrick. Yeah, I have a question for the minister, and uh, it uh, does relate to the levy being proposed, but it has a, a profound impact on uh, how people might think about uh, what Senator Hanson is trying to do. I understand that you will seek to put a levy on industry in relation to uh, making sure we can deal with these sorts of stranded assets, but that um, levy is likely to be considered as a cost for the company and therefore offset against their PRRT requirements. Uh, can you confirm that this levy will be borne by the company uh, in such a way that it doesn't offset uh, their uh, PRRT uh, and hence, in effect, the taxpayer ends up paying anyway? Minister. Um, thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, as you would expect, Senator Patrick, I do not have with me, um, as the representing minister, uh, the briefing pack in relation to measures that are contained in a bill which has not even been finished being drafted yet. So um, I, I would have to say um, the information that I've provided you is all that I am able to provide you today, um, as the other piece of legislation you're referring to is still in the drafting stage. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Minister. I, I'm sure you will understand the problem here, and uh, maybe you can make a commitment on behalf of the government. If you impose a levy upon industry and they treat that as a cost of business, which they can offset against corporate tax and their PRRT, ultimately it means that the taxpayer pays anyway for the, uh, uh, for, for the stranded assets that you're trying to deal with. Uh, can you give an undertaking that you will examine that question when, uh, or that concern when you are looking at the uh, the bill that's uh, uh, that you're proposing uh, to remedy the situation? Minister, um, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. The, the response I can give you um, is one that's been publicly stated uh, by both the Treasurer and the Minister responsible for. Um, uh, resources, um, Minister Pitt, that the Australian taxpayers will not be footing the bill. Senator Patrick. Uh, look, I thank the Minister for that answer. I, I will uh, hold you to account on that when we come back around for that bill, uh, because there are many, many ways in which, from an accounting perspective, a cost uh, can effectively be transferred back to loss of payment uh, back to the taxpayer. But I'll leave it there. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Any further speakers? If not, uh, before the Chair, amendment uh, moved by the Pauline Hanson One Nation, uh, bracket one to eight, sheet 1377. Uh, move those together that the amendments be agreed to. Those of that view say aye. Those opposed? Aye. No. The noes have it. The noes have it. We're moving on. Senator Patrick. Uh, Senator Seward. Acting Deputy Pres, could I please have the Green support for this amendment noted? So noted. Move to Senator Patrick. You have the call. Uh, I would also like uh, my support of 
uh, Senator Hanson's uh, amendment noted as well. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Okay, um, uh, Chair, I might just need some assistance here. I, I seek a leave to move uh, Amendment 1 and 2 on uh, the relevant sheet, which I don't have uh, before sheet me at the 1349. Moment. Thank you very much for being uh, helpful in, in relation to that. Look, uh, Chair, for many uh, reasons, the Australian oil and gas sector uh, needs work. It needs, uh, in some aspects, it needs a tweak, in some, it needs an overhaul, uh, in some areas, it needs a complete reset. Um, we have a situation in Australia where we are not getting the maximum value, in fact, any real value out of our uh, uh, resources, resources that belong to the taxpayer, resources that uh, uh, have been used in other countries such as Norway and Qatar to return significantly more to the, uh, to the residents of those companies, uh, countries, to the citizens of those countries. Um, we have a situation here in Australia where there's a whole range of different taxes uh, and uh, uh, impositions placed on companies. So we see you know, G uh, GST, uh, fringe benefits tax, payroll tax, corporate tax. We know from tax transparency data that the oil and gas industry pay almost no corporate tax. Uh, uh, ExxonMobil is a good example uh, on $42 billion of revenue over uh, four or five years, paid zero corporate tax. They don't bother about paying for the securities uh, of the Northwest Shelf they don't, uh, or, or the Bass Strait. They don't uh, worry about paying for the education of the workers that, uh, that work on their um, sites. They don't worry about paying for the medical uh, facilities that might um, exist in a hospital nearby their, their site. They don't pay for the, the roads that lead to the doors of their uh, premises. Uh, they simply don't contribute uh, to, uh, back to the Australian taxpayer by way of corporate tax. Uh, we know that uh, the ATO, and, and I give uh, uh, Commissioner Jordan a, a big shout out here. Um, uh, I criticise him uh, when I think he's done something wrong, but I have to, of course, uh, congratulate him when he has done something right. Uh, the ATO uh, successfully pursued Chevron through the courts, where it proved that the company's internal lending arrangements associated with a $3.7 billion loan were inconsistent with the principles of arm's length transactions. And the company, uh, uh, has had to pay a $340 million uh, tax settlement. This just tells you how these companies operate. Uh, they don't have in their charter national interests. Most of them are multinationals. They, have no, they don't care about Australia at all. They care about their profit. And the Australian government is responsible for setting up a regime in which Australians receive a fair share of, uh, of tax. Um, the other uh, uh, sort of return that we might expect to get from offshore companies uh, is, of course, the petroleum resource rent tax. Um, again, we've seen that uh, uh, in, in submissions to an economics committee uh, reference on maximising oil and gas uh, for Australians, that in 1819, we, uh, we had $62 billion of resource exported for a PRRT return of just $1 billion. The company benefits $62 billion and uh, the taxpayer gets a return for their resources of $1 billion. Now, that is just grossly unfair, and indeed, no one in government seems to have an eye to look to say, how do we maximise the benefit? I asked the question in an economics committee uh, last, uh, last week, who's responsible for that? Well, we know that NOPTA looks after titles. We know that NOPSEMA looks after environmental and safety aspects. Uh, uh, we know Geoscience Australia looks after surveys. The department looks after administration. Who looks after making sure the Australian taxpayer benefits from 
its own gas and or their own gas and oil resources. Who does that? And the answer is basically no one. Um, now, if I talk about that billion, uh, that $62 billion and, and try to work out where that's coming from, you can't. You can't work it out because uh, all of the information that you need to do so is held confidential. Which are the fields that, uh, that produce the oil? Which projects, which entities produce the LNG? Um, what resources were extracted? How much of that resource was extracted? How much is left? Now, this type, this type of information is actually reported to government. It's reported to the uh, National Offshore Petroleum Titles uh, Authority, NOPTA, in, uh, in, a in the form of a monthly production report. Now, currently, these production reports are deemed permanently confidential. Now, it makes no sense to me that this data would be made confidential. You have to remember this information is about our resources, about the Australian taxpayer's resource. You know, companies claim that it's commercially confidential. But you know what? When you come along and you say, I want to extract your, your oil and gas resources, there's a price to that. And one of those prices is transparency. It's not commercial information. And indeed, the department has done a study on this. I, in answer to a question on notice, question on notice, B1117 uh, from Senate Estimates, the department uh, very openly advised that ACIL Allen was uh, engaged by the department to review the offshore petroleum and greenhouse gas storage uh, uh, regulations, um, or resource management administrative uh, regulations or RMA regulations, and they found, and I'll quote, Monthly production reports submitted under Regulation 7.19 are a case in point. These reports have been classified as permanently confidential under Regulation 8.02, presumably because they contain information that is a trade secret uh, or corporate information, the disclosure of which would be expected to adversely affect the title holder's business, commercial or financial affairs. While production reports may contain some financial commercial, uh, com commercial information, which could be redacted, the re release of the bulk of the information contained in the production reports is clearly in the public interest. So, Minister, I'm going to ask you about these reports. I'm going to ask you if, you, you know, if you're not supporting my amendment. Your own department has given advice that this information ought to be made available and public. The information includes things such as well identification and numbers, summary of all work that's been performed on the well during the month, liquid and gaseous petroleum produced, used or injected, gaseous petroleum flared or vented, liquid and gaseous petroleum delivered from the area. Now, my amendment will make uh, this monthly production data available, giving the public, academics, universities, with the ability to see the actual data associated with uh, ex the extraction and recovery. We need to, to, uh, to make more information avail available publicly, something that ACIL Allen also seems to be indicating in their report. Now, I'll, rep I'll quote again from the report, and this is significant. There, there do not appear to be any social, sound economic or ethical reasons for the government to support permanent confidentiality for most of the information, and indeed, uh, it is not apparent why this information should not be released promptly. Now, that report by ACL will make interesting reading, and I've asked for it to be tabled uh, with the Economics uh, Committee. Now, my amendment seeks to deal with this. My amendment simply says, put this information out, make it available in the public domain so that we can all see exactly what is going on. So, it, you know, beggar's belief, and I, I'm eager to hear whether the minister, uh, whether the government is going to support this, this has been recommended to it. When, you know, I, the, I would encourage the Senate, this is just a transparency uh, amendment about our information, about our resources. And it's beyond comprehension that, uh, that uh, this sort of information 
which ACIL has told the department in a funded study ought to be made available, uh, shouldn't be made available, and this amendment seeks to do that. Minister. Um, uh, thank you very much, and thank you very much, um, Senator Patrick, uh, for his, um, his contribution. Um, first of all, a couple of things, um, just to correct the record. Um, you made the statement in your contribution that the department had made a recommendation for the information to be released publicly. That's not correct. Uh, it was in an, a review that was undertaken um, by ASIL Allen. Uh, also would add to that that the government is intending as part of the review around the regulations will further consider um, what data um, can be released. As, uh, as you would be aware, Senator Patrick, um, we always as government try and strike the right balance between providing confidential information uh, appropriately while um, also making sure that we protect the confidentiality of that information. Uh, but uh, so this amendment seeks to move and expand material currently included in the regulations in and the Act. Um, so what I would say is, uh, Senator Patrick, we are always mindful um, about making sure that we release, collect and release data um, in a way that is able to provide as much advice and transparency as is possible uh, more broadly in relation to such things um, as our, our resources um, sector. But we also are very mindful about protecting confidential information appropriately to make sure that we maximise the ability for these resources to be able to be achieved for the Australian public. Senator Watt. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. Just to put Labor's position on the record, uh, these amendments have been presented with no indication of consultation with industry. Labor has consulted with industry who have argued that technical advice should have been provided alongside this proposal to inform the amendment given its complexity. This reform is too important to rush through amendments which could have unintended consequences for the safety of these projects and the environment, and on that basis we will be opposing the amendment. Senator Patrick. Thank you. I will just respond to both sides. Uh, firstly, to the Labor Party, to Senator Watt. Um, uh, my office did make uh, uh, available uh, the Wood Review, the UK review that showed how they were seeking to maximise the benefit of the return to, uh, uh, to UK citizens. Uh, and one of those uh, um, measures recommended by uh, uh, the Wood Review was, in fact, transparency. And of course, uh, this, um, uh, th this amendment, uh, and I, this was also circulated uh, to you, uh, is the result or, or um, relies on advice from ACIL Allen, uh, as mentioned by the minister, who says that this information ought not to be made uh, or not to be held confidential. Now, uh, one would think that you would lean on the side of public interest, not on the side of the oil and gas companies who say to you, we, we don't want any information made available to us. To the minister, I apologise if uh, you thought that I, uh, I uh, or if I in fact did reference the department, I did mean to say that the department commissioned a review and it is uh, ACIL Allen that in fact has made the statement. So uh, I accept if I, if I, uh, that was incorrect, but the changed fact that the recommendation on a paid review is that this information be made public. And yet again, we see a government two or three years behind the crossbench, uh, two or three years, as they were yesterday, failing to move on things like modern slavery, failing to support a bill that, that ends uh, or that would stop goods coming to Australia that, uh, uh, that you know, are generated from people who are uh, basically uh, under bondage and goods that come to Australia and get sold at a much, much cheaper price than Australian-made products because, you know what, the Australian companies have to pay uh, wages. So, again, the excuse used, used yesterday was we have to think about this, we have to ponder this, we have to kind of talk this out with everyone. Why don't you get on and actually do something? This is a measure that is in the public interest. Don't side with the, the oil and gas industry every single time. 
This amendment just seeks to get access to data, to production information, information about our resource. It belongs to the Australian public. I asked the head of, uh, the, uh, head of NOPTA, Mr Waters, on Friday why this information ought to be held confidential. He, of course, has seen the report by the department. I asked him, said, why is it? And you know what he said to me? And I, I'll, I'll try not to, to uh, quote him incorrectly, but it was along the lines of, well, Senator, uh, NOPTA inherited that requirement. We, uh, we, all we've done is just let it run on. So even NOPTA doesn't understand why this information ought to be held confidential. It's only uh, uh, being kept confidential because, well, no one's really asked them to, to, to look at it. This information would help. It would help Australians understand uh, about uh, the, the use of or the extraction of their resource. It would help uh, entities or, or organisations that are looking at uh, the tax conduct of some of these companies. We heard uh, from a number of witnesses on Friday uh, about transfer pricing or the, the one uh, that the liquefaction of gas is, uh, uh, is priced, making sure that the minimum amount of profit is, is made at, on the, the uh, wellhead price so that the minimum amount of, uh, of PRT is, is paid. It's a scam, and it's a scam that is allowed to take place because of a lack of transparency. And the government ought to really rethink this because I think most Australians are getting pretty upset with the Australian government. Every single time you let international companies into our uh, uh, jurisdiction to extract taxpayers' oil and gas and get no return. And you don't seem to care about it. All this is is a transparency measure, and it is beyond me as to why uh, you won't support this. Um, people will be watching this. People will be looking and saying, uh, why is the federal government not doing this? It's just going to have to go into one of the many failures that are associated with this government. And uh, you know, I quite frankly, I'm disgusted that the government won't, uh, won't yield and won't uh, promote transparency. Deputy President. Minister. Mm. Uh, look, thank you, Mackin, De Acting Deputy President. Can, can we be really clear here, Senator Patrick? Um, nobody is saying that the maximum level of transparency and provision of data is not a good thing. What we are saying, though, is that um, in order for us to be able to be assured and to do, undertake the appropriate consultation and to make sure that, that the, um, the, the amendments or the, the changes um, that we would be seeking to make around the provision of data um, are appropriate and, and robust in their nature in both making sure that we provide the maximum amount of information but protecting the confidential commerciality of activities, the amendment that you have drafted is not well enough drafted to be included in the Act. We have given you an undertaking that is part of the review process for um, the regulations that we will continue to work in relation to uh, providing that data. But um, these, these changes need to be undertaken through a proper consultative process. And I'm sure, Senator Patrick, you would agree that it is absolutely appropriate that if you are going to deliver changes that are going to deliver real improvements in data um, transparency, they have to be undertaken through a robust process so we do not have unintended consequences as a result of putting something through that has not been drafted to the level that would satisfy both the government and clearly the opposition. Uh, and, uh, and we also need to bring the industry along to make sure we understand the implications on them as well. Senator Wish President Wish Wilson. I think the minister just kind of belled the cat there at the end. This is, this, it, it's about satisfying the industry. It's about satisfying the industry. It's, it's a pretty fundamental concept that you can't manage what you don't monitor. Um, transparency should be in our genes. What, what is the issue with getting in companies to provide the kind of information that Senator Patrick is talking about? Um, I have a lot of faith in Senator Patrick's ability to draft an amendment. I know he's spent a lot of time and he's worked very hard on this. And can I also say um, that a number of stakeholders have worked very hard 
with the crossbench, with the Greens, indeed with all political parties, to raise awareness on these issues. Uh, and I would like to acknowledge the work of some of those stakeholders, um, such as Jess Lurch and Tim Bashara at the Wilderness Society, uh, Nathaniel Pell, uh, previously at Greenpeace, now with Surf Rider, uh, Australian Conservation Foundation. This is a significant matter of public interest um, because these environment groups know that there is a potential liability, not just to Woodside and other fossil fuel companies' balance sheets, but also to the environment. And I think it's an interesting quirk that we've had a debate today on retrospective legislation, when what is it, if it's not retrospective, that the big fossil fuel companies now want to change their liabilities that they signed up to when they put these production assets in the ocean in the first place? You know, 20, 30 years down the track, now they want to leave them there, they want to change the game. And uh, based on what we've heard in this debate, no doubt we're going to hear a lot more about legislation and what the industry wants in terms of reducing their liabilities. So why not support an amendment that provides more information so that the public are better informed? The only thing I can think of, Deputy President, the only thing I can think of as to why the Labor Party and the Liberal Party would oppose this is A, the fossil fuel industry oppose it, and the only reason they would oppose this is because it helps us better understand their future liabilities. And that's clearly not something they want to talk about or they want in the public domain, given the liabilities that they will face in the future to clean up this mess in the ocean. The Greens will be supporting Senator Patrick's amendment. Thank you. Senator Patrick. Yeah, just a, a question for the Minister. Uh, what's your undertaking to the Chamber in respect of view that you and that you uh, mentioned before when uh, is it likely that the government will uh, at least take some transparency measures uh, and uh, change alter the regulations and or legislation to permit Australians to see what uh, is happening with the oil and gas Minister. Uh, I'm not in a position to be able to give you a timing on that undertaking, Senator Patrick, but I will give you an undertaking to take it offline with you outside of the chamber. Senator Patrick. Yeah, thank you. Again, I just express a concern. You know, similar arguments rolled out yesterday. In fact, I thought you might have been reading the, the, uh, the, the second reading speech uh, from my bill yesterday from the government side, which is just, well, you know, we're just going to continue looking at things. Uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Chair. Any further speakers? If not, uh, the question is, uh, the amendments moved by Senator Patrick, 1 and 2, sheet 1349, be agreed to. Those of that view say aye. Th those against say no. Aye. The noes have it. The noes have it. Senator Seward. Acting Deputy President, could I have the Green support for this amendment noted in the Hansard, please? Senator Patrick. And of course, uh, I would support my own amendment. Yes, thank you. That uh, will be noted. So the question now is that the bills stand as printed. Those of that view say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. Oh, sorry. Uh, the question is that those bills be reported. Those of that view say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The committee has considered the offshore petroleum and greenhouse gas storage amendment titles administration and other measures bill 2021 and related bills and agreed to them without amendment. Minister. Move that the report of the committee be adopted. Uh, the motion is that the bills be uh, adopted. All of that opinion say aye. All those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. Minister. 
I move that the bill now be read a third time. The uh, bills have been moved to be read the third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment Titles Administration and Other Measures Bill 2021, Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Regulatory Levies Amendment Bill 2021. Government Business Order of the Day, number two, Treasury Laws Amendment 2021 Measures, number two, Bill 2021. Resumption Madam Acting Deputy. Reading debate. Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I would just like to uh, seek leave to uh, have Hansard note that uh, Senator Hanson and I supported uh, Senator Hanson's amendment and also Senator Patrick's amendment in the last debate. I've had my hand up for quite a while, but it hasn't been uh, seen. Uh, we'll need leave by the Senate. Leave granted. Um, it's been granted. Uh, your um, position has been noted. Thank, Thank you. you. Senator Roberts. Now we move to S Senator McAllister. Senator Watts. Oh no, I should do yeah. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak to the Treasury Laws Amendment 2021 Measures No. 2 Bill. Uh, this bill undertakes largely technical amendments via two schedules. The first concerns the regulation of charities. The second concerns the taxation treatment of offshore banking units. Although Labor supports these changes, Labor will be taking the opportunity presented by this bill to address some other serious problems created by the Morrison government with respect to the two policy areas covered by this bill, charities and tax. Dealing with charities firstly, Schedule, bill, Schedule 1 of the bill amends the Income Tax Assessment Act 1997 to require non-government entities seeking endorsement as a deductible gift recipient, or DGR, to be a charity registered with the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission or be operated by a registered charity. The amendments include a 12-month transition period, which will give non-charity DGRs time to meet the requirements for charity registration without losing DGR status. Some DGRs will be able to apply for a longer transition period of up to three years. Labor notes that this change will improve the consistency of regulation, governance and oversights, oversight of DGRs, which the government says is meant to help support continued confidence in the sector and public support for DGR entities. It's ironic that it was the government that claimed the measures here are meant to help support continued confidence in the sector, when in, other, when in another way they're cracking down on the sector in one of the most draconian of manners. It's not in this bill, but in regulations. What the government has proposed is to extend the ability of the Charities Commissioner to deregister a charity for a summary offence or because the Charities Commissioner anticipates that the organisation will commit a summary offence. This crackdown is just emblematic of how this government engaged with the charitable sector. Charities and volunteer organisations are doing crucial work to help vulnerable families, people and communities get through these lockdowns. They are helping mop up the consequences of the Prime Minister's mistakes in Sydney, in Dubbo, here in Canberra and many other places across the country. And it's not just social justice cat charities. When half of this country isn't under lockdown, charities are cleaning up our waterways, working to tackle climate change or improving access to essential health care. But instead of the government engaging in a partnership that recognises the important work that can be done working with environmental charities on climate change, with social justice charities on poverty alleviation, with health charities on tackling COVID, they, de they decide to wage a war on charities. The latest salvo in the government's proposed regulations has the effect of reducing the scope of charitable activism. And it goes to the fact that the government doesn't want these entities discussing issues of law reform or broader social issues. That is, these charities should be seen but not heard. Opposition to these changes is broad. Law firm Arnold Block Liebler, who says the changes are fundamentally inconsistent with our democratic system of government, has opposed the changes. Uh, in addition, the Law Council president says the changes would leave registered charities, including faith-based charities, at grave risk of political interference. A full-page advertisement in the Australian Financial Review, which said, don't stop Ch Australia's charities from speaking out, co-signed by St Vincent de Paul, 
Catholic Social Services Australia, Anglicare, Uniting Care and others. The CEO of the Community Council for Australia saying that the suggestion that the ACNC commissioner could act against a charity because they believe they may do something wrong, even when there is no evidence that they have done something wrong, seems it, to be at, seems it best to be against every principle of justice, fairness and procedural transparency, all of which should be fundamental values for any regulator. These Senator are just— Senator Watt, <clears throat> it being 1.30, I shall now proceed to two-minute statements. And we're going remotely. First off to Senator Zaccarini. Senator Thank you very Zaccarini, much. you have the call. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to uh, acknowledge the recent passing of Howard Hodgins, who died peacefully on 31 July, age 96. Howard uh, was a well-known identity of Melbourne's East, particularly amongst members of the Victorian Labor Party. A true believer in the truest sense, Howard was a man who thoroughly understood the value of community and dedicated his entire life to those around him. Now, this is illustrated by his service in the Royal Air Force as a radio technician throughout World War II, as a local councillor, as an architect working on the Melbourne City Loop Rail project, as president of the Friends of Wattle Park, as a dedicated member of the Clayton Chorists, an active honorary life member of Humanist Victoria, and by his insatiable appetite for corresponding with community leaders and others on matters of concern to his neighbours. Now, any person, even loosely connected to the Labor Party Melbourne's East, would have had a hard time forgetting Howard, almost always accompanied by his dedicated wife, Mari. There was scarcely a meeting, campaign or fundraiser where Howard could not be found his steadfast devotion to the movement serves as an inspiration for all of us. Howard is survived by his wife and three sons, Christopher, Nicholas and Julian, including grandchildren and a great-grandchild. And I pray for them and also wish to convey my deep thanks for allowing us to share with them in the life of Howard. I have no doubt that Howard is busily writing letters, finishing crossword puzzles and making the occasional dad joke in a better place. Thank you. Senator Van, you have the call. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to the people of Victoria, to speak to them, to give them hope, hope after 200 days of lockdown they're fast running out of. The businesses that are there that are missing out on proper support, like has been given in New South Wales, for the people of Victoria who are locked in their homes for over 200 days. That is over 200 days due to a lack of proper public health policy by the Andrews government. Even today, we're seeing numbers of test testing in New South Wales of 138,000, whereas in Victoria it's still only 48,000. I wonder what the numbers, case numbers would be like if Victoria could test as well as New South Wales could, as well as if they could contact trace as well as New South Wales could. Those on the other side, all we hear about is, and we heard Senator Watt just a moment ago, saying, you know, blaming the, um, the Prime Minister for what's happening in Dubbo. I've not heard one senator on the other side say one word about Victoria and the place that it finds itself. People are losing hope. The national plan that has been agreed by all premiers is there to give them that hope. Yet premiers like Premier Andrews, Premier McGowan, talk about not honouring that plan, even though it's a plan that they agreed to themselves, that they put their name to. If they're not going to honour their word, they need to come out and say to the Victorian people and people more generally in Australia that their word is not their bond, that they're not worthy of their word, that they won't follow that. They need to give Victorians hope. Dan Andrews promised that we'll have the grand final. Promise us that we'll have the Melbourne Cup. Give people hope. Thank you, uh, Senator Van. I call Senator Wish Wilson remotely. Senator Wish Wilson, I can not hear you. Um, acting Deputy President, I, I could speak now instead um, of Senator Wish Wilson. I think we might continue with the list if that's, that's all right, Senator. Um, we might go to Senator Carr. 
And Very Senator much. Wish Wilson, would you like to disconnect and try again? Usually that resolves the problem. Senator Carr. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The Australian Research Council has an absurd new rule prohibiting the citing of preprints in grant applications. A preprint is a research paper that has been submitted to an academic journal but has not yet been peer-reviewed for publication. Preprints are stored on servers to make the latest research accessible to researchers around the world. But for some obscure reason, the Australian Research Council has decided that citing a preprint is enough to make an application ineligible. More than 20 applications for this year's Discovery Early Career Researcher Awards have been excluded. The ARC did not inform applicants directly. It claims that, an appeal that it is, uh, or its claims that an appeal is possible is sophistry because many are on the second application for their project and can't apply again. This rule change is a fiasco. It shows that the ARC is out of touch with international best practice, both dom domestic and domestically, given that the Australian Research Council accepts preprints. As the president of the Academy of Science, Professor John Shine has said in a letter to Minister Tudge, the rule change will have a major impact on Australia's research potential. It could be easily argued, Professor Shine wrote, that a researcher not referencing material found in preprints is not using the full range of contemporary knowledge in a discipline. This is an integrity issue. If a grant application cannot cite all the information they have used, they risk being accused of plagiarism for treating the researchers others as their own. The ARC needs to explain itself and fix this mess quickly. Thank you, Senator Carr. I call Senator Wish Wilson. Can you hear me OK? Yes, thank Deputy you, President. Senator. Yes, proceed. OK, thank you. Um, can you still hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Sorry about that. I'm having my machine just flashed on and off. Could you start my, could you start my time again, please? Um, Yes, we will. Senator Wish Wilson. This is one of the concessions to technology. Okay, here we go. Senator Wish Wilson. As, as we see the unfolding uh, humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan and Kabul, the inevitable end of a 20 year conflict and the occupation of a foreign country, it's an opportune time to be reminded about the truth teller of this war. Australian Walkley Award winning journalist Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, the only source of true, factual and verifiable information. There is no doubt that as Australians ask the hard questions, how did we find ourselves in such a crisis? How did things collapse so quickly? There are no answers. There is no information forthcoming, nor has there ever been, reflecting on the last 10 years of hard work that the Greens have done in the Senate, asking questions. Why are we there? When are we leaving? What does a withdrawal look like? All we've had for decades now are lies and deliberate deceptions. WikiLeaks has provided the information, the cover-ups, the war crimes, the deceptions. Yet Julian Assange languishes in a UK jail, awaiting extradition to the country who got us into this mess in the first place, the United States of America. I urge President Joe Biden at this important time in history to walk away from your extradition of Julian Assange, the truth teller in this war of Afghanistan, and make sure that we support whistleblowers and we support press freedoms because they have never been more important than now. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Call Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Later this year, we will pass an amazing milestone. An Australian designed and made satellite will be launched into space using an Australian designed and made rocket and launch facility. We now have a domestic end to end space capability, creating jobs and injecting new wealth into our economy. Government has not achieved this. Private enterprise has, proving once again that governments do not create wealth. Free, personal enterprise creates wealth. 
For many years, we led the world in innovation, inventing the refrigerator in 1856, electric drill in 1889, military tanks 1912, pacemakers 1928, ultrasounds 1961, and Wi-Fi 1992. But that's where the list ends, 30 years ago. Australia once led the world in patents. Now China registers four times the patents Australia does, per capita. Partly, this is the fault of the big banks, whose tight hold on the capital sector funding for business development is throttling investment, suffocating beneath our bank's greedy obsession with real estate. The government, through its future growth fund, has taken upon itself the role of picking winners and losers among startups making private sector growth beholden to government bureaucrats. Lockdowns have decimated small business and forced medium and large business to shelve research and development plans. Australia is going backwards and is losing the ability for citizens to support themselves through their own hard work and enterprise. Reliance on government handouts appears to be a design feature of Prime Minister Morrison's socialist version of Australia. Instead, one nation will shrink the government to fit the constitution, we will get government out of the way of free enterprise, we will let the Australian spirit out of jail to again invent and create to carry this nation forward, even to space. We have one flag, we are one community, we are one nation. The right to raise ourselves up through hard work and enterprise is a freedom that must not be compromised. It must remain. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I have been increasingly disturbed over the Early Childhood Pathway Program in the NDIS and its reluctance, if not outright blatant opposition, to supporting best practice therapy. We know what that is. There's no confusion globally what that looks like. Early, good quality, intensive intervention. And in fact, we know for every dollar that we spend on it, we exponentially save in the future. In fact, there's some studies that say for every dollar we spend, when kids are little, we save $13 throughout their life. But now, in some woke agenda that listening only to so-called autistic voices is the way to go. Many of these self-declared experts have multiple degrees, jobs, relationships. People that would have been considered Asperger's under the former DSM. But what about those with severe autism, classical autism, those who self-harm, have extreme sensory issues, who are non-verbal, those that cannot be an autistic voice because they cannot speak? There are already far too few centres in Australia who offer genuine, intensive early intervention in a clinic setting that allows parents to work. But don't be fooled. These kids don't go home into some normal family situation. The parental involvement continues, toileting programs, food resistance programs, behaviour replacement to, to remove self-harm, communication, whether it's through assistive technology or speech. These programs continue at home. Stop insulting parents by suggesting that clinic support means there's no in-home support or family involvement. Only someone who hasn't raised a classically autistic child would even dare to suggest that. So a shout out to AEIOU, to Little Learners and to all the other centres and organisations that work so well with our families to give all our kids the best opportunity at life. Thank you, Senator Hughes. I'll call Senator Griff remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The wheels of government, like justice, turn slowly and never more so than when the privileges of special interest groups are threatened. We can see this with the government's copyright reforms. In 2015, the Abbott government directed the Productivity Commission to review Australia's intellectual property arrangements. The commission found the policies were deficient and made a series of recommendations that will catalyse innovation and growth in a stagnant economy. It took the Turnbull government a year to respond and they supported many of those recommendations. But now, four years later, we are still waiting for implementation from the now Morrison government. It is unbelievable that changes to make Australia more dynamic and innovative have been stalled for so long. One minor but worthy recommendation was to end parallel import restrictions on books. While Australian consumers can freely import books from sellers overseas, Australian bookstores do not have the same freedom. They must purchase from a monopoly publisher who can hike prices as high as they like. These restrictions hurt Australian retailers and consumers who support their local bookstore. The Productivity Commission recommended these restrictions be abolished, 
and the government supported the recommendation, but absolutely nothing has been done in four years. Other worthy recommendations have also been ignored, such as ensuring free access to publicly funded research, legislating a fair use exception, and limiting liability for orphan works. Each of these changes would benefit Australians. But again, the government has given in to special interest groups at the expense of the public interest. It is well and truly time for government to do better by Australia. Thank you, Senator Griff. I call Sen Senator Murray L. Smith. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today, I call on the government, and particularly the Health Minister, Greg Hunt, and the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, to immediately step up and fund Yadu Health Aboriginal Corporation in Sejuna. Yadu Health is a First Nations led Aboriginal community health clinic providing health services to residents in Sejuna and also in the surrounding town areas of Coonabar and Skedetsko. Yadu Health is in an absolutely catastrophic state of affairs. Mould, asbestos, Warner damage, the roof is literally caving in on this important service. Their own CEO has described the situation at Yadu like being hit with a triple whammy of mould, asbestos, and now COVID. A quarter of the building has been condemned because of the levels of mould and asbestos present. It is absolutely unacceptable. Yadu has been trying for years to get funding to rebuild this clinic. Their hardworking staff and volunteers have persevered despite these conditions, but they are fed up and I don't blame them. Time has long passed. We need to fix Yadu. We need to rebuild Yadu. And if the government is serious about closing the gap, then here's a way they can help to do that in Sejuna. In the Prime Minister's recent Closing the Gap statement, he announced $254 million for health infrastructure for this very purpose. So the money is there. It's time to use it. Use it to rebuild Yadu. Every single Australian deserves a high quality standard of health care. Well, they don't have it in Yadu and they need it. And the only way they'll get it is if you rebuild this clinic. Step up, fund Yadu, show Sejuna, show this area that you care. Thank you, Senator Smith. I call Senator Lambie remotely. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Acting President. Can you hear me? We can, Senator Lambie. Proceed. Thank you. Yes, I'd re just quickly that Yardu Health Centre, I'd suggest since that's a gold-plated area of the Consulate's debit card, you probably get down there and stick by what you promised and get down there and get it done. Anyway, the government wants to make it harder for small parties to get into this place. They're slamming the door in the face of normal people who want to say and how things work up here. Heaven forbid someone with life experience makes it up to Parliament, because apparently we shouldn't be there. Apparently it's better to hand seats to party hacks, political staffers, and wealthy donors, instead of anyone who might shake things up there. The government's latest brain fart is to change the electoral rules so it's harder for smaller parties to run an election. And new parties are going to have to find 1,500 members before they can get their name on the ballot paper instead of just 500. After I got Section 44 and booted out of Parliament, I had to go and get those 500 names. I had to regather myself. And I can assure you, without staff, without paying anyone and out there campaigning and without a job and getting 500 signatures was very difficult for an independent. And I was really miles ahead of what many others will be when they're on the starter blocks. Those new parties will just have no hope. The other things the Liberals want to do is to have total control over the name of small parties. They want to be able to veto new party names. They want to be able to say to small parties, you might think the word Liberal describes who you are. You might think it tells your neighbours in your community that what you're running for. But we own that word now. We, they want to set impossible rules for the rest of us, and it isn't right. It isn't good for democracy. I feel for the one in three Australian voters who would like a choice other than Liberal Labor, because they're doing everything they can to take that choice away from you, and they're doing it quick, I can assure you. So if you do not want to get stuck with two-party preferred, for goodness sake, vote for those independents and micros. Thank you, Senator Lambie. I call Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I... Senator Smith, your microphone doesn't appear to be on yet. Senator Smith. 
Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise this afternoon in the Australian Senate to take a moment to acknowledge an exemplary exemplary community leader, and her name is Mrs Joan Hillman, who has recently concluded her four-year term as the president of the Jewish Community Council of Western Australia. Joan has led her community with distinction, and I'm proud to recognise some of the highlights of her time as president this afternoon. Joan has personally committed countless hours organising and communicating across the Jewish community in Western Australia, as well as working closely with others to address concerns such as anti-Semitic violence and also providing a strong community-led response to some of the many challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic in Western Australia. Under Joan's leadership, the Jewish Community Council has facilitated various forms of community dialogue, such as an interfaith panel on countering racism and gender discrimination, collaboration with other groups such as the WA Hellenic Council, and creating a wonderful and very powerful mosaic of community group cooperation across Western Australia. Importantly, I was honoured to join Joan last year to represent the Jewish community in laying wreaths at the Jewish War Memorial in Perth ahead of Anzac Day, as well as joining joining many others in, in commemorating the victims of the Holocaust at a virtual service during the pandemic. Of course, I'm delighted to join with my other West Australian Senate colleagues in acknowledging the coalition government's $6 million contribution to the redevelopment of the Jewish Community Centre in Western Australia and the construction of an important Holocaust Museum. On behalf of everyone in this parliament, I applaud the wonderful leadership that Joan Hillman has provided not just to the West Australian Jewish community but to many community groups across Western Australia. Congratulations to you, Joan. Thank you, Senator Smith. I call Senator Patrick remotely. Thank you, um, Madam uh, Deputy President, uh, um, Acting Deputy President, sorry. Um, Freedom of information, uh, sorry, freedom of navigation is a customary international law that ships flying a flag or of any sovereign state shall not suffer interference uh, from other states except in exemptions allowed by international law. Now, connected to this law are freedom of information operations, which are carried out by navies, including the Royal Australian Navy, to exercise the right and uh, often. Uh, to assert in circumstances that freedom of navigation where it is resisted by a sovereign state. Now, one might wonder uh, how that might relate to the Senate, so uh, hear me out. I said in my first speech, I quoted uh, Woodrow Wilson, President Woodrow Wilson, in saying, it is the proper duty of a representative body to look diligently into every affair of government and to talk much about what it sees. It is meant to be the eyes and ears and the voice and to embody the wisdom and the will of the constituents. Unless the Congress have and use every means of acquiring, uh, acquainting itself with the acts and dispositions of the Minister of Agents of Government, the country must be helpless to learn how it is being served. This has relevance to recent events in this uh, Senate where we've been unable to get access to information or documents, whether it be a Quan answer, whether it be a, uh, an OPD, whether it be uh, information requested by a committee. Uh, we must recognise, as navies uh, do, that occasionally, from time to time, we have to enforce our rights. We have to exercise the right of freedom of navigation, uh, if you can draw the parallel. And if we fail to do so, like what happens with, uh, uh, in the international domain, we will simply lose the right to transit through what would otherwise have been international waters. Thank you, Senator Patrick. I call Senator McCarthy remotely. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I want to wish all our Paralympians the best of luck ahead of the Paralympic Games starting tonight. Australia is behind you all the way and so proud of your achievements. In particular, congratulations to our Territory athletes including Tom O'Neill Thorne, who will compete in the men's wheelchair basketball team, the Aussie Rollers. And I know my son, CJ, who's trained with the Australian team, is sending all his love to all his teammates over there too. The opening ceremony begins at 9 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time tonight, and I know I'll be tuning in to watch it. I also want to congratulate all the athletes who competed in the Tokyo Olympic Games, including our Territorians, how terrific to be able to watch the Olympics from here 
when so much of our country was in lockdown. Uh, I'd like to mention NT brothers Jeremy and Leon Hayward, who both made it to the Olympics for hockey, yet competing against each other. Jeremy played for Australia's Kookaburras, while 31-year-old Leon played in goals for the Black Sticks from New Zealand. And of course, congratulations to Brooke Perris from Darwin and who is the niece, of course, to Nova Perris, who once stood as senator in this place. Brooke competed for the women's hockey team, the Hockey Roos, and did us so proud. The NT was proud to welcome the athletes to the Howard Springs Quarantine Centre after the Olympics. And I know that we wish the Paralympians well, but I also would like to say, Madam Acting Deputy President, as Australia gears up for our Olympics in Brisbane, I call on the Brisbane Premier and also those who are going to prepare for the Olympics to make sure that this time we can have both the Paralympics and the Olympics all together in Brisbane in 2032. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. I call Senator Rice remotely. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. Australia has now evacuated hundreds of people from Afghanistan. I was in touch with 11 of them over the weekend as they were in the crushing chaos outside Kabul airport. A group of human rights and democracy activists, people who have worked with foreign governments and NGOs, a four-year-old, a four-month-old, a 23-year-old woman training to be a pilot. They are now on a flight, on their way to begin new lives in Australia leaving behind the heartbreak of their country having fallen to the brutal Taliban regime. Australia has committed to take 3,000 refugees like them, but we must do more. We need to take at least 20,000 asylum seekers and give permanent residency to the 4,500 people on temporary protection visas here in Australia. We must, because we helped create the problem. Australia joined the US in invading Afghanistan in a war that bred more terrorism, that made the world less safe. We failed to build a lasting peace. A decade ago, my former colleague Scott Ludlam underscored this failure in this place, quoting the former US ambassador Carl Eikenberry, saying, one of our major challenges in Afghanistan is how to fight corruption. Right now, we're dealing with an extraordinarily corrupt government. And Scott, Scott quoted Hugh White saying, it is understood that perhaps within months of a withdrawal, it may well be that the corrupt government, which is being propped up at the moment, would not last a couple of months. Scott finished his speech by asking, do we need to be there for another decade? Well, Scott, it was another decade almost exactly, with the government falling even before the last US troops were withdrawn. There's no doubt that Afghanistan in 2001 was in a dire situation. We had a problem, but the solution was not a US invasion. Our imperialist war failed. We have a responsibility to pick up the pieces and taking 20,000 asylum seekers. Time has expired. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Mr. President. Around Australia, there are a lot of people who are struggling with the pandemic. The anxiety of not knowing whether there will be a spike in cases that could threaten your health. The stress of economic disruption with the potential to make your job or business non-viable. The frustration of missing school, sports and the chance to build friendships. The hit to pride that comes from taking a welfare payment when you've lived all your life proudly paying your way. The isolation, the mental health impact that comes with it. Beyond Blue has reported a 30 per cent increase in calls compared to before the pandemic, with Lifeline recording the busiest three days in its 57-year history this month. A colleague of mine described it as a feeling of quiet desperation. I hear you. But there is a way out, a light at the end of the tunnel, and it's the national plan for living with COVID. Because we can't eradicate it. In all of history, only one has been, and it took some 200 years. But we can live safely with it, and the national plan is our path to get there. Every Australian who can, whose, whose health and conscience permits, needs to get vaccinated. It's voluntary, and that's why we need your help. When you do it, you protect yourself. You'll either be immune from the virus, or if you get it, it'll be less severe. But importantly, you'll protect the people you love, the children and older people in your lives, and the vulnerable in our community. In the plan, there's an agreement struck between the Commonwealth and the states that as we hit vaccination targets of 70 and 80 per cent, our freedoms will return because it will be safer to do so. The states must keep their commitment. It's where we end the cycle of lockdowns and border closures. 
So everyone who can needs to roll up their sleeve. We've made sure there are vaccines available in abundance. Every minute, 800 Australians are vaccinated, a million doses every three days. We are almost there. I want to encourage Australians to step Order, up and Senator play their Stoker. part. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. Well, today is an important three-year anniversary. It's the three-year anniversary of this Prime Minister's ascension to the top office of this country. And it's a three-year anniversary of bungles, failures and rorts. It is a three-year anniversary of a Prime Minister who never takes responsibility, who was christened Scotty for marketing for a reason, and because he's always too Order. slow to act, he is a disgrace Order. and he should go Senator without Watt. another Time day in the has office. Expired. We move to questions without notice. And I understand I'm going to Senator Wong remotely. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Afghans who worked with the ADF are reporting that their applications for safe haven have been rejected because they did not apply within six months of ending employment. How many Afghans who stood side by side with Australian troops have had their applications for safe haven rejected because they did not apply within six months of ending employment. Given that the Taliban won't check the date of employment, will this policy be revised? And will those who didn't apply within the six months have their applications reconsidered? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Wong for her questions. Uh, I've seen certain uh, certain media reports or suggestions, uh, but in relation to some of the matters that Senator Wong raises, I'm not uh, convinced that these are all accurate reflections of circumstance. Australian officials have worked very hard uh, to process applications through the Department of Defence, through the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, to ensure uh, that those who have been locally engaged staff uh, supporting Australia's engagement in Afghanistan over a long period of time uh, are given uh, the acknowledgement uh, and the pathway to securing a visa. On the ground in Afghanistan right now and over recent days, uh, our officials have been working hard to equally ensure that visas are issued in emergency situations and to quickly uh, expedite arrangements to guarantee that those who need that safe passage who have got through uh, to uh, the airport in Kabul are able to be airlifted with a visa to be supported in their repatriation to Australia. And that's what's enabled us, Mr President, to, uh, to now uh, have seen over 1,600 people uh, evacuated from Afghanistan uh, through Australia's efforts and working with the UK and others just since the 18th of August. This builds on the hundreds uh, of repatriations that we have supported uh, over recent months uh, and indeed the many more that we have supported since, uh, as a country, we put in place special visa arrangements and plans to be able to assist those uh, to leave Afghanistan safely. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Those the Australian government has instructed to travel to the Hamid Karzai International Airport have faced a perilous journey, some having to wade through a sewer only to be then refused entry, despite having relevant documentation. The United States, Canada, Germany and New Zealand are working beyond the airport to evacuate citizens and Afghans. Is Australia going to do the same? And if not, why not? Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Australia has been working closely with partner countries such as those Senator Wong has mentioned uh, to be able to try to access and provide assistance uh, beyond the airport perimeter uh, to individuals where that is possible. But nobody should underestimate the difficulty in relation to the perimeter of the airport and the challenging circumstances that not just Australian troops and personnel and individuals face, uh, but also, of course, all of those seeking to ensure uh, an orderly process that enables flights to be able to move uh, at such speed in and out of the international airport at Kabul. That does require security into the airport. It does require checks and processes. Australian officials are not in charge of every one of those checks and processes as to who gets entry into the airport, uh, but we continue to work closely with those partner countries to try to ensure that anybody, Australian citizen, Australian visa holder, Australian permanent resident, or those with a connection to any of the aforementioned Order, are able to get access and to get Senator, support to learn. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. 
Thank you. Is there a deadline for the evacuation of Australians and Australian visa holders from Afghanistan? Has Mr Morrison spoken as yet to President Biden about arrangements to ensure the evacuation of these Australians and those Afghans who helped us before any such deadline? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the deadline is to action everything with the utmost of urgency right now. And that's why we're seeing multiple flights run in and out of Kabul, airlifting people out each and every day at present. Uh, and I pay thanks once again uh, to the Defence Force personnel, the Foreign Affairs, the Home Affairs personnel, uh, all of whom are in difficult, challenging and indeed dangerous circumstances, uh, helping to expedite and undertake that very important work. Uh, as the Prime Minister has said, uh, if the deadline for departures that uh, the United States has spoken of is pushed out, uh, then he has made it clear uh, to the United States that we support that. Our government has made it clear uh, and indeed we will continue to support all operations as long as they are safe and feasible and to be able to help people leave Kabul, leave Afghanistan, especially those uh, who have worked alongside us uh, and will continue to do all we can in terms of giving that assistance that's seen more than 1,600 leave Order. in the last Senator few days Birmingham. alone. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister update the Senate on Australia's vaccination rollout to combat the COVID-19 pandemic? The Minister representing the Minister for Health. Order. Order. Can we at least, before we start being disorderly, can we at least allow the Minister to get to his feet? Senator Watt. Senator, and again, I'm going to ask Senators for the courtesy of all those Senators participating remotely. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you to Senator Chandler for the question. Mr President, Australia's COVID-19 vaccine rollout continues to expand. To date, more than 17.4 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines have been administered in Australia. We had a record Senator Sunday Polly. with more than 139,000 vaccines administered and 335,000 vaccines Order. administered over the weekend, Mr Order. President. Yesterday, Mr President, was a record Monday. Order. Senator, Senator Colbeck, than... please stop, stop the clock. The interjection started two seconds into his answer. Now, while there is a place for interaction across the chamber, some courtesy so that those remotely can actually hear would be appreciated. I'm having trouble hearing the minister, and it's very hard to tell who's interjecting unless they have a very recognisable voice. Senator Watt. <laughs> Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Yesterday was a record Monday, with more than 289,000 doses administered. That is good news for Australians and good news for the country, Mr President. About the only ones barracking against this rollout are on the other side of the chamber, Mr President. In the last seven days, more than 1.8 million doses have been administered into the arms of Australians. And in the last 30 days, Mr President, 6.3 million doses. The vaccine rollout is ramping up as we always said it would, Mr President. In our home state of Tasmania, Order. Senator Chandler, more than 414,000 doses have been given to those who have stepped forward to protect themselves, protect friends, protect their families and protect their country, Mr President. Every vaccine helps protect each one of us, but every vaccine helps protect us all. We have now had a national, we, we now have national vaccination rates of more than 54 per cent for first doses, Mr President, with a, amongst the eligible population at over 30 per cent with second doses, Mr Order. President. Perhaps most significantly amongst our most vulnerable Australians, in, which, which is why we are seeing a difference in New South Wales this year compared to Victoria last year, over 50s, over 75 per cent first dose and over 70s, Order, over 85 per cent. Time for the answers expired. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, could you inform the Senate how people are accessing the vaccine across the nation? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Can I thank, can I thank all those involved in the rollout of vaccines across Australia? 
particularly the frontline health care workers, Order. for their commitment and hard work in getting this most important job done. We have enlisted GPs, Commonwealth vaccination clinics, Aboriginal community health centres and pharmacies to deliver the vaccines into the arms of people right across the country. Mr. President. Over 8,100 points of presence around the country to get a jab. This week, 2,595 pharmacy sites were active and vaccinating nationally. By the end of this week, Mr. President, it will be 2,850 pharmacies across the country will have received doses and able to vaccinate next week, Mr. President. And more importantly, more than 900 of those are in New South Wales, including in the Greater Sydney hotspot areas. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. That is great news, Minister. What advice is there for Australians who are yet to roll up their sleeve? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Order. The sooner, more than, the sooner Australians turn up at one of the more than 8,100 sites across the country, the sooner Order. we will be able to return to a normal life with rest, less restrictions and less lockdowns. Mr. President. As the Prime Minister has said, the national plan that we have developed and agreed with the states is our pathway to living with the virus. That is our goal, Mr. President to live with the virus, not to live in fear of it, Mr President. It's a plan based on the best possible Order. scientific evidence, Order, undermined Senator only Pauline. by those opposite, Mr President, undermined only by those opposite. Once we achieve 70 to 80 per cent vaccination, we'll see less transmission of COVID-19, fewer people with severe illness and less people in hospital and deaths. And we should all get Order, on. Order, Senator Colbeck. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Southwest and Western Sydney woke up yesterday to harsher restrictions and a Western Sydney Order. curfew as a result of a COVID-19 outbreak that started in Bondi. Why are Southwest and Western Sydney residents, who are trying to do the right thing by their community, being forced to take multiple buses and trains in the middle of a lockdown to get to a vaccination hub, and being forced to wait up to five hours outside at those vaccination hubs to get vaccinated. Senator Ban, what a disgrace. I remind senators on my right that during the question, I need to hear the question. Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you. Mr. President, can I say to all of those people in South West Sydney, who are turning out Order. to get vaccinated. Thank you for doing so. They know, Mr. President, those residents of South West Sydney know, like we know, that vaccination is one of the things that provides a pathway for all of us to deal with this pandemic, Mr. President. Mr. President, there are 777 primary care and Commonwealth sites administering vaccines across South West Sydney, Mr President. 777. 590 general practices, including 266 who are offering the Pfizer vaccine. Seven gen ge general practice respiratory clinics, 14 Aboriginal community health centres and 176 community pharmacies who are offering AstraZeneca, Mr President. 777 sites across South West Sydney. Order. Can I say to those Australians from South West Sydney, Thank you for turning out. Thank you for having the patience to wait for your jab. You are doing not only yourselves a service but your community service because we know and you know that is those people of South West Sydney. They know that one of the pathways in dealing with this, with this virus is to get vaccinated. It will protect you, it will protect your community and it's once we start reaching the thresholds that have been set down by the national plan, it is the way that we start returning to a more normal life, Mr President. So thank you to all of those people in South West Sydney. In fact, thank you to all of those people around the country who are turning out to get vaccinated. And particularly, Mr President, thank you to those health workers who are working in those vaccination clinics, the GPs, the pharmacists, those working in the 
the Archos, those working in the um, uh, prime, uh, Commonwealth Health sites and in the state clinics. All of those, Mr. President, Order, are working Senator to assist Colbeck, time people to get the vaccinated. answer has expired. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Why are pregnant women and children with disabilities in the federal electorate of MacArthur still having trouble booking vaccine appointments, as they're reporting to their local MP? 18 months into the pandemic and six months into the vaccination rollout. Order. On my right, Senator Colbeck. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thanks, Senator Keneally, for the question. Mr. President, clearly there is strong demand for vaccine across the country, uh, and that is only a good thing. Can I uh, say to all Australians? Order. Can I say to all Australians? Order. Mr. President, it's clear that there's only one group of people in this country who, have, who are campaigning against the vaccine rollout, and who are undermining, Order. And who are undermining confidence in the vaccine rollout, Order. Mr. President. And it's them over there, Mr. President. It's that lot over there, Mr. President. We continue to increase the supply, Mr. President, and as I've already indicated today, we in continue to increase the number of outlets that are available for people to get a vaccine. And as more vaccine becomes available, we continue to increase the volume. And it's only the Labor Party who are out there trying to undermine confidence in the vaccine rollout. It's only the Labor Party who are out there trying to Order. undermine confidence in vaccines. Order. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Representing the constituents of people of what southwestern Western Sydney. 18 months into the pandemic, they're struggling to secure vaccine appointments. They're living in lockdown conditions worse than anything Australia has ever experienced. Why has the Morrison Joyce government left Senator the people Band. of South West and Western Sydney behind? Yeah. Senator Van, I've called you to order during questions on a couple of occasions now. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. I completely and utterly reject the premise of the question, Mr. President. Order. Only last week, Mr. President, we put an extra 500,000 doses of Pfizer vaccine that we'd managed to bring in from overseas into New South Wales to assist with the current circumstance, Mr. President. We continue to work on vaccine supply and, and to increase the, the availability of vaccine, Mr. President and the number of outlets, as I've already outlined a number of times in the chamber today. While the Labor Party fight us, Mr. President, we fight Order. the virus, Mr. President. While the Labor Party fight us, we will continue to fight the virus and we will continue to work in the interests of Australians to give them access to vaccine. We appreciate the fact that they are lining up for we, we, we appreciate the fact that they are lining up for, a, for a, an appointment. We appreciate that they are turning out to get vaccinated. They know, like we do, that vaccination is a pathway Order, to Senator freedom. Senator Colbeck. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. There are a growing number of children, teenagers and young people sick with COVID. Do you acknowledge that including children in the vaccination targets will save lives? When will your government include kids under 16 in the national vaccination targets, and when will there be enough supply for those young people? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thanks, Senator Seward, for the question. Mr. President, can I say I, I reject the assertion that there's any sense uh, on the behalf of the government that all parts of the Australian population aren't important in the vaccination rollout. Uh, the, pla the national plan for vaccination that was agreed by National Cabinet, uh, with modelling done by the Doherty Institute, was based on uh, a certain population cohort, uh, Mr. President, and based on at, the, at that point in time the, the, the information available to Doherty and to Australia with respect to approved vaccines, Mr. President. Mr. President. And I think it's also important that we, at this point, consider the impact of the virus on Australians and people within different cohorts, which reinforces, which reinforces our process, Mr. President. So the, the, we've received approval for the administration of vaccines to, uh, 
12 to 15 year olds. Uh, and, and we have commenced the process of rolling the vaccine process out to the most vulnerable of those. We have started that. We have said, Mr. President, that when the advice from ATAGI comes to us, when the advice from the health professionals that are advising the government and guiding the vaccine rollout comes to us, then we will make the vaccine available to the rest of those cohorts, Mr. President. And plans for that are already being developed. And they are important, Mr. President. Mr. President. And, and, and if you look at the, the wording from the, the information from Doherty, they stand by their modelling. They stand by their modelling and the targets that have been established. And when you consider that there's 1.2 million children in Order, the cohort Senator that you're Colbeck, talking about, Order, Senator Colbeck. Time for the answers expired. Senator, see what a supplementary question. There are now, sorry, there are now a number of models on vaccination targets. Why are you only relying on the Doherty modelling? Isn't it, is it because it's politically convenient? Why did you limit the advice and the modelling from Doherty to over 16-year-olds? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, can I say um, at the outset, I think that's an outrageous thing for Senator Seward to say. The, the Doherty modelling um, is based on work across a number, number of peak institutions in this country. Uh, and, and Mr. President, uh, I'll take your interjection, Senator. And if you, and if you, and if you look at, for example, the ANU, if you look at the ANU uh, modelling, for example, and look at the assumptions, which are seriously flawed, I have to say. Seriously flawed. No, I will tell you what's flawed about them. They assume that we go directly from A to D and, and, and skip sections uh, B and C in the national plan. That's the flaw, Mr. President. So be careful about the modelling you're quoting, and don't be a part of the Labor Party's process of undermining the modelling and the plan that we have for national um, uh, vaccination process. The children are important, Order, Mr. President. Senator Colbeck, children time are for the answer has expired. Senator Seawood, a final supplementary question. When will a when will the government stop enabling vaccine apartheid and finally support a TRIPS waiver? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, that, that is an absolutely outrageous slur. And quite frankly, Senator Seawood, through you, Mr President, you should be ashamed of yourself. At no point, at no point has the government tried to downplay the importance of any part of this Australian community. We have at all times sought to provide protection and support for all Australians, including children, Mr. President. And it's an outrageous order. Slur. Senator, Senator Seward, on your point of order is on. The point of order is on the fact that the minister didn't, is it on direct? didn't Senator, listen. Senator Seward, Sen no, Senator Seward, you asked a question that had highly. I asked about the trips. This waiver. is not. Yeah, Senator Seward, you yes, also. Yes, I did. I order. asked. Order on my right. Points of order have to relate to the standing orders. I'm going to at least ask people to treat the chamber with the courtesy of saying that it's to do with direct relevance. It's not a chance to restate the question. Senator Seward, you also used a highly charged term in that question, and I have ruled previously that where highly politically charged terminology is used, that ministers are entitled to respond, and that was a particularly loaded um, piece of terminology. So the minister is allowed to respond. I can't instruct him how to answer a question. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. The government has at all times been concerned to ensure that all Australians are supported and protected through the management of the pandemic, Mr. President. Mr. President, and so in setting the thresholds under the national plan, the Doherty modelling takes into account the two-week time frame for people to get full immunisation and the later time for the vaccination of children, Mr. President. So, Mr. President, the Greens and Labor can come in here and run all the slurs they like against us, but we will continue to work in the interest of the Australian people to help them to get vaccinated and also Order. to support the Senator opening Colbeck, of the Australian time economy. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Griff, remotely. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. But my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Defence, Senator Payne. Last week, the New South Wales government announced that 800 Australian soldiers would be deployed to help state police enforce movement restrictions. 
and the Queensland Government announced 100 soldiers would be deployed to help state police enforce border restrictions. Can the Minister tell us what reasonable and necessary force will be permitted for these personnel to carry out their duties, such as the power to make arrests or to use force against Australians? The Minister representing the Minister for Defence, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Griff for his question. Uh, I can advise the Senator that uh, the scope of ADF support to states and territories is constitutionally limited, uh, as I'm sure the Senator is aware, particularly for tasks with an element of law enforcement. ADF personnel are not authorised as law enforcement officers, nor are personnel able to enforce health orders. These remain the responsibility of relevant state or territory agencies. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Minister, what happens if something goes wrong on one of these patrols or door knocks and a member of the public gets violent or makes threats? In these circumstances, what powers do the ADF personnel have? Uh, and are they only able to follow directions of police officers or can they make their, uh, take actions on their own initiative? Senator Payne. Uh, Senator Griff, I, uh, or through you, Mr. President, uh, to Senator Griff, uh, I would reiterate uh, what I said uh, in response to your first question, Senator, which is that the ADF are not authorised as law enforcement officers. The, law, the uh, authorisation for those uh, powers remains with the police of the relevant state or territory, uh, and these matters are determined. Uh, and planned and operationalised between the ADF and the relevant police service, whether it is in uh, the examples you have used, Senator, New South Wales or in Queensland. Uh, and in fact, given the amount of time uh, since the beginning of Operation COVID Assist uh, in 2020, uh, where we have seen over 20,500 ADF personnel deployed nationally under Operation COVID-19 Assist. Uh, there has been uh, a very significant uh, period uh, for agencies to work together on exactly these matters. Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. Yes, thank you, Minister, for that explanation. Every Australian police force has hotlines and online reporting portals for members of the public to report um, you know, police uh, misconduct. How will Australians be able to report any misconduct of ADF personnel supporting law enforcement and who will investigate these reports? Senator Payne. Um, Senator Griff, uh, through you, Mr President, Senator Griff, uh, through, en through any normal channels in which one would, uh, would report such a, such a concern. Uh, but to be very clear, um, the scope is constitutionally limited and constitutionally limited, particularly with regard to tasks with an element of law enforcement. There is no authorisation for the ADF to act as law enforcement officers, uh, nor, uh, as I said previously, to enforce health orders. Uh, this remains the responsibility of those state and territory agencies. Uh, can I say in conclusion, Mr President, uh, to all of those uh, women and men in law enforcement agencies around Australia and to all of the women and men who have been deployed uh, with the ADF through Operation COVID Assist that we recognise that these have been uh, very demanding, very challenging times in Australia and we acknowledge their service and their contribution. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Following a visit to the Dubbo Aboriginal Medical Service in April this year, I wrote to the Minister for Health, alerting him to the chronic understaffing of GPs at the Dubbo Aboriginal Medical Service and the excessive delays that would have on the vaccine rollout to the Dubbo Indigenous community. Why did the Minister for Health do nothing to address the issues raised and potentially avert the current outbreak in Dubbo's Indigenous community? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator, for her question. Um, throughout the course of the pandemic, the, in, ensuring that um, Indigenous Australians had access to vaccine has been one of the important elements of the way that we've managed the program, Mr. President. They were in the early stages of having availability of vaccine. Um, like Senator O'Neill, the government is also concerned uh, around the vaccination rates in some parts of, of Australia and with the uh, arising of so, uh, the outbreak, particularly in the region of Dubbo, 
Uh, there's been a number of specific measures that have been undertaken, Mr. President, to support Australians, particularly in that area, to get vaccinated. There's been five teams, Mr. President, of ADF uh, vaccination uh, force go out there to work their way through the community to make sure that there was availability of vaccination for people in those communities. We're working our way methodically through those communities, Mr. President, to ensure that we can get vaccination rates up to support and protect those communities, Mr. President. And we will continue to Order, do that. Order, Senator President. Colbeck, have you concluded your answer? Or, sorry, I'm just saying, has Senator Colbeck concluded his answer, or I'll take the point of order? Senator Colbeck? Thank you. Oh, point of order. Sorry, Senator O'Neill. It is indeed a point of order with regard to relevance. I, I think. Um, I appreciate that the minister is speaking about the general scheme that has been advanced in the region, but my question is specifically for the AMS in Dubbo. It was a very specific question. There was a letter that was sent. Okay. This requires a specific answer. Order. I think I, the no, people of I, Dubbo I, I deserve take, that. Well, Senator O'Neill, please, I again ask people to make their point without commentary. Um, I take your point. It was a specific question, but as the minister was talking about programs that related to that region, there is an opportunity to debate the merit of answers after question time, but he is being directly relevant, even if not answering in the form that the asker would prefer. So I call the minister to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, and, and we continue to support uh, Indigenous communities around Australia with respect to vaccination. Uh, as of the 23rd of August, uh, 193,348 people who identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander had at least one dose of of vaccine, approximately 33 per cent of the eligible uh, population. Uh, over 103,000, Mr President, uh, have received a second dose. Uh, the largest gaps uh, in coverage are seen in the 40 to 59-year-old age group. Approximately 75 per cent of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are aged 12 years and over and are eligible for COVID vaccines, Mr President. Um, we will continue to work cooperatively with New Order. South Wales Senator Colbert, and the time for The answer has expired. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Can the minister confirm that as at the 17th of August, the Morrison-Joyce government had vaccinated just 8 per cent of First Nation Australians in Western New South Wales? Why are the First Nation Australians being left unprotected by the Morrison-Joyce government? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. I can't confirm the number quoted by the Senator. I don't have that granular level of detail here with me, with um, my information, Order. Mr. President. Order. Uh, Mr. President, as I've indicated, uh, in response to the outbreak in Western New South Wales, the government has taken some very specific actions to ensure Order. that. Vaccination capacity was increased in those regions as it needed to be, and as we've done across other parts of the country, Mr. President. We supported Victoria in their surge when they had an outbreak. We've supported New South Wales more broadly when they've had an outbreak, Mr. President. Uh, so there's a specific incident management team to coordinate the Commonwealth response, it includes representatives from the National Indigenous Australians Agency, uh, and they include, uh, of course, ac vaccine ac allocation. Uh, support from the Archers, support from the Royal Flying Doctor Service, the Australian De uh, Defence Force vaccination Order, schemes, and of course PPE. Time for the answer has expired. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Perhaps the minister might be able to take that on notice and confirm that 8 per cent number. The Morrison Joyce government promised the First Nations Australians that they were a priority in the vaccine rollout and would be fully vaccinated by winter. We're now eight days away from spring. COVID-19 is ripping through First Nations communities. Why should Australians believe Mr Morrison will deliver on his new promises when he's failed to deliver on his old promises, leaving First Nations Australians unprotected and at risk? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, thanks, Senator O'Neill, for the question. And I reject the premise of the question, completely reject the premise of the question. And in fact, uh, Senator O'Neill quite dishonestly didn't declare that Minister Hunt had actually responded to order. her on the 27th order. of July Senator on a point to of answer order. the question. Senator O'Neill on a point of order. I think, I think the honourable gentleman should withdraw that comment. Um, I, 
I'm happy to correct myself later on, but I don't believe those, that terminology has been ruled unparliamentary in the past. Um, and the clerk, I think, is agreeing with me. If I'm wrong, I'll come back and say so. Um, Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. As, as, as so often happens in this chamber, the opposition come in here to misrepresent quotes that have been made by members of parliament and don't fully declare the full circumstances that sit behind the order. questions. Senator Keneally on a point of order. My point of order is relevance. Uh, the, the, Senator O'Neill did not say that Minister Hunt didn't respond. She said, and I quote, that the minister did nothing to address Sen the Senator, issues Senator raised. Keneally, Senator Keneally, I, I Senator stand Keneally, by please, Senator O'Neill's call for that Senator comment Keneally, to be withdrawn. Senator Keneally, I'm going to insist that while the leaders are given a lot more room to move, they do abide by the chair when I call them to order. That wasn't even a remote attempt at a point of order, Senator Keneally. That was debating a matter of fact. There's a time for that after question time. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. So I reject the premise of Senator O'Neill's question. We have continued and we will continue to support all communities in Australia, as the response from Minister Hunt to Senator O'Neill clearly indicates, with a, a whole range of incentives and programs that are designed Order. to support Indigenous communities, uh, workforce incentives, rural bulk Order. building incentives, uh, distribution priority system to identify uh, distribution of GPs, Mr. President, a range of things in place to support Australians and particularly, Mr. President, Indigenous communities. Order. Order. Senator McMahon. Order. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Veterans Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the Minister advise the Senate on what measures are available to support serving members of the Australian Defence Force experiencing emotional distress and anxiety? including in my hometown of Catherine and Darwin in the Northern Territory. The Minister representing the Minister for Veterans Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And, uh, I particularly thank Senator McMahon for this very important question because we are all very conscious that the devastating developments in Afghanistan are distressing for many of our serving defence personnel and for veterans, including particularly in the Northern Territory with its very large defence community. We thank, we acknowledge the 39,000 Australian men and women who served in Afghanistan and the many more Australians who have served in both campaigns and peacekeeping efforts around the world, including the Battle of Long Tan, uh, the 55th anniversary of which we marked last week. To all those who have worn an Australian military uniform, to all of their families, we are grateful for their sacrifices and for the safety and security that you have award afforded your fellow Australians. In turn, we have a duty as a nation to be there for them by ensuring their physical and mental health needs are met. And the government is committed to ensuring Australian Defence Force personnel have access to the right support at the right time. Defence has in place mental health services that operate around the clock. These include the confidential telephone support services for both ADF members and families, the Defence Employee Assistant Pro Assistance Program, which provides free professional counselling and support through Defence members' chains of command through the chaplaincy service. Defence provides comprehensive mental health support services to deployed forces uh, before and during and after deployments. Mr President, to all of those who served in Afghanistan, the government is unequivocal in saying that you did the job your nation asked of you. You did it overwhelmingly with great distinction and nothing will change that. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Um, can the minister advise what other measures are available to support ex-service men and women? Senator Payne. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. And the government does operate a range of services for veterans, such as the Open Arms 24/7 counselling service and 1800 Veteran. And of course, our veterans community has generated an extraordinary depth of support over many years and more recently through groups like Legacy and the RSL, like Soldier On, like Wounded Heroes. Uh, and young veterans, to name a few. And I'm pleased to say that uh, many of our veteran women are playing increasingly important roles as well. Delisa Papamau, who served as an ADF medic in Afghanistan in 2012 and in Papua New Guinea in 2014, has founded Modern Soldier, an online veterans network that created a series of groundbreaking videos 
on post-traumatic stress disorder and now helps veteran-owned businesses to sell their products. The Women's Veterans Network Australia connects ex-serving women and fosters a sense of belonging and reduces isolation. I commend all of the women and men working to help Australia's veterans. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How is the Liberal and Nationals government working with ex-service organisations to ensure tailored support is available for all veterans who require it? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And again, I thank Senator McMahon because I know that uh, Senator McMahon has a particular interest in this issue in the Territory. Uh, the government recognises that military service creates special bonds between those who serve together, and these last for the rest of so many veterans' lives. Nothing can substitute for these bonds, so the very important thing that government can do is to nurture and support connections that the veterans have forged themselves. The Australian government is investing $40 million in a network of veteran wellbeing centres around Australia, one of which is in Darwin. I congratulate Senator McMahon on her support for the veteran community in the Northern Territory, and I hope to have the opportunity to visit the Darwin Veteran Wellbeing Centre in the future that's being led by Mates for Mates in collaboration with a number of local organisations, which will provide a one-stop shop of support services to veterans and their families. Senator Lambie, remotely. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Finance and Special Minister of State, Senator Birmingham. The Electoral, the electoral Legislation Amendment Party Registration Integrity Bill 2021 would give political parties the right to block new parties coming through if they have the same key words as existing parties in their names. When the Liberal Party was formed in October 1944, there was already an existing political party called the Liberal Democratic Party. If the rules you want to put in place were around when, you, when your party started, there wouldn't actually be any Liberal senators in the building today. Does that seem fair to you, or do you think that would be good for democracy, to let incumbents block their opponents? The Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator Lambie for her question. Uh, we have uh, a robust democracy in Australia in which competition is, uh, is freely and fairly uh, encouraged, but needs to be freely and fairly encouraged in ways uh, that uh, ensure voters make informed choices, uh, have all of the information to make informed choices, uh, and that they are supported and empowered in their choices. And now, sometimes, Mr President, uh, people will decide to go and start other political parties. Senator Lambie, indeed, is an example of that. But Senator Lambie has always made sure she stood very clearly, very identifiably in relation to her political parties, whether that was uh, as a Liberal Party member at one stage, whether it was uh, as a candidate and a senator uh, for Clive Palmer's party, uh, or whether indeed it is now very identifiably as the Jackie Lambie network. That's as it should be, Mr President clear, obvious to the voters. Uh, the practice that has been increasing in recent times of uh, some sort of political astroturfing uh, by some individuals uh, is unhelpful to voters, has been shown in terms of voting trends across some states to create confusion, especially when it comes to Senate voting tickets. Uh, so uh, yes, it is reasonable for political parties uh, to be able to have their name protected just like any other trademark has its name and brand protected uh, under legal practices. That's a common sense approach, and that's all that the government seeks to do, not to prohibit or to prevent anybody else from having the opportunity to contest an election vigorously, but also fairly, uh, and that's the intent of these laws. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. If this bill passes, small parties with small budgets have to get rid of any materials that they've already produced with their current names or logos and pay to replace them all. They have to pay to replace their websites. They have to build a whole new uh, brand in less than six months. Will you be making any compensation to those parties who incurred approved political expenditure under the old rules, who will now have the exp that expenditure rendered redundant once Labor rolls over like a puppy dog and packs and backs your bill? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. And Mr. President, I'd make the point again. This is about simply ensuring that voters have clarity in their voting intentions in the choices before them. I note across the current Senate chamber we have, as I said before, Senator Lambie and the Jackie Lambie network, 
We have Pauline Hanson's One Nation Party. We have Senator Griff uh, representing Centre Alliance, uh, Senator Patrick uh, as an independent, the Greens, the Labor Party, the Liberals, the Nationals. Each are clearly distinguishable from the other when their names are presented on the ballot paper. That's all we seek to achieve and to ensure occurs in the future, uh, and we hope and trust uh, that all will see the common sense in that regard, and that there's simply fair approaches being put in place for our next election. Senator Lamb, your final supplementary question. Uh, sorry, oh, sorry, I was using a point of order there. Okay, no worries. Uh, um, Senator Lambie, just I should say the rules for remote participation don't allow points of order to be raised remotely. So my apologies. Okay, for the confusion. sorry. But your last question, sorry. Senator Lambie. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. The bill triples the membership requirements for parties effective immediately, and the minister, the minister says this is to test that political parties have genuine community support. So the obvious question here is. Isn't that what elections are for? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, indeed, elections don't prevent anybody uh, from nominating and from uh, standing. Uh, they can stand as an independent. That is an option open uh, to all Australians. Uh, but what we seek to ensure is that where people constitute a political party, uh, it has a genuine underpinning to it, and that a party is not just an independent, a party is about ensuring uh, that it has uh, a base, a body of support, a set of beliefs commonly adhered to by its members. That again is the logical common sense test that Australians apply uh, when they are thinking about what political parties are. Uh, and that is simply, uh, again, all that these uh, modest reforms seek to do uh, to ensure that we have that test in place in ways that meet the expectations of the Australian people, expecting political parties to be fed into political parties and expecting the names of those parties to be clearly distinguished from one another, reflecting their individual identities. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr President. My question this afternoon is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. How many children with a disability in Australia have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19? Senator, the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. On the 2nd of August this year, Mr. President, the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation reviewed the data on safety and efficacy of the Pfizer vaccine and recommended that the following groups of children among those aged 12 to 15 years be prioritised for vaccination using Pfizer. Children with a specified medical condition that increase their risk of severe COVID-19, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children aged 12 to 15 years, all children aged 12 to 15 years in remote communities as a part of a broader outreach vaccination program that provide vaccinations for all ages uh, greater than 12 years. The government is also ensuring that all children accessing or eligible to access the National Disability Scheme will have access to the Pfizer vaccine from Wednesday, the 25th of August, if they have not already had their vaccine. Mr. President. Uh, so, as the medical advice and as the vaccines have become registered for use in children, we have followed that advice um, and made the vaccine available from Monday, the 9th of August. Mr. President, the, the Pfizer vaccine has been opened for those with those underlying medical conditions. Uh, and as I've indicated earlier, once a target provides to us. Order, Senator Colbeck. Uh, Senator Watt on a point of order. Senator Watt. Um, to, on relevance, the, the question simply asked for a number. If the minister doesn't have the number, he should uh, agree to bring it back and take it on notice. Well, I can't instruct the minister how to answer or address a question. Um, I will say that the minister has been speaking for 90 seconds, and it was a question that was very specific in nature. So I'll ask the minister to turn to the question. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. As I indicated to the chamber, on a target's advice from the Monday, the 9th of August, so only earlier this month, was the Pfizer vaccine made available to children in that age cohort. So, Mr. President, the question as to those that have been fully vaccinated, Mr. President, I actually don't have the data on. Uh, but given the, but given, Mr. President, 
and we need to consider the, the process for commencement. Order, Whether Senator the data Colbeck, actually exists time for the answer has time. expired. Senator Pratt, a supplementary question. How many students and staff for children with disabilities have been fully vaccinated at schools for children with disability? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, again, um, <laughs> the, the vaccination of students with any vaccine in this country has only commenced since the 9th of August this year. Uh, that data is not yet available for people who are fully vaccinated, Mr. President, because, Mr. President, three weeks hasn't passed for a full cycle of vaccination yet. So, Mr. President, it's very, very cute for the Labor Party to come in here and ask that sort of question. But when based, but when based on the medical advice, we've commenced and made available the vaccine as soon as it was approved for use and supported by the medical authorities, Mr. President. We will be able to provide the, the data once it's collected, once the full vaccine cycles have been completed, Mr. President. And with respect to staff, I'm very happy to provide that information to the chamber as, we, as I can make it available. Senator Pratt, a final supplementary question. Why has the Morrison government failed to track the number of children with disabilities and staff at their schools who are being vaccinated? when people with learning disabilities have been seen to be eight times more likely to die from COVID than the general population. Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr President, again, the Labor Party come in here and uh, make an allegation that simply isn't true. Uh, there is a whole range of data that's being uh, provided, supported uh, and tracked. Uh, and as, as I've indicated to the chamber, the vaccination of children the vaccination of children has only been available since the 9th of August this year, Mr. President. 9th of August this year, not a full vaccination cycle of three weeks yet has passed. So, for the Labor Party to come in here and ask Order. and infer that the data is not available Order. is quite frankly dishonest, Mr. President, because they know it can't have been made available yet because it can't be collected yet because the time frames for collecting it haven't occurred yet, Mr. President. Every single, every single member of the Australian community is important to this government, and it's Order. only the Labor Senator Party Colbert, campaigning against the, the government while we support has expired. Senator Small. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Minister Cash. With this week being the 11th National Skills Week, can the minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government's skill reform agenda has strengthened our vocational education system? The minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Mr President. And I thank Senator Small for the question. Uh, and in answering the question, I do acknowledge that Senator Small, as an employer, uh, and as an employer in the hospitality industry back in Western Australia. Uh, Senator Small is one of those people who has had the opportunity to provide young people with the opportunity to undertake a traineeship in his workplace and to actually provide them with that stepping stone and those skills that they need to get into the hospitality industry. And Mr President, as Senator Small stated this, year, this week, uh, it is the 11th National Skills Week. Uh, and as we know, National Skills Week is dedicated to raising the profile and the status of vocational education and training within Australia, but also looking at dispelling myths and showcasing the, in particular, attractive career opportunities that someone with a vocational education and training skill set is able to get. Mr President, we need to acknowledge that vocational education and training it has well and truly been the foundation of Australia's strong and vibrant economy. And when you look at so many who have been through vocational education and training in Australia, it has produced industry leaders, it offers great diversity, it offers new and exciting career paths, it supports our resources and primary industries. It builds our cities, it supports tourism, it supports monuments, it supports our heritage, and as Senator Small knows, it well and truly supports our hospitality industry uh, within Australia. 
And each week, we have the opportunity as a country to really get together and highlight all of these opportunities. Uh, I know the Morrison government is proud uh, to recognise National Skills Week in 2021. In terms of our commitment to Australians in the vocational education and training sector, we have invested a record $6.4 billion in skills in this financial year alone. $6.4 billion has been invested by the Morrison Order. government. Senator Small, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. Minister. How are the Morrison government's wage subsidies supporting Australian businesses to take on an apprentice or trainee and help meet the skills needs of Australia's workforce now and into the future? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, so many employers across Australia know that the Morrison government is backing them to take on a new apprentice or trainee into their business. And of course, last year we announced the Boosting Apprenticeship Commitments Wage Subsidy. And what that has now done, Mr. President, across Australia is it has actually seen apprenticeship and traineeship numbers increase by colleagues 200,000. We have put in a place a policy that has given 200,000 new commencements across Australia. This is 200,000 Australians who are now in an apprenticeship or a traineeship as a result of the Morrison government's boosting apprenticeship and commencement wage subsidy. And Mr President, that really does say something for the fact that employers out there they are utilising the policies that the Morrison government puts in place to bring new apprentices and new trainees into their business. Senator Small, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. How is the Morrison government's economic recovery plan helping Australians train for the skills that we need now and as we chart our way back from the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as we know, the coalition government, the Morrison government, we've been working with the states and territories uh, in particular to provide additional training places in areas of skills demand. And that is the key to the success of the Job Trainer Program, $500 million from the Morrison government and $500 million matched by the states and territories. But the key to the additional training places that we actually released onto the market were that they are within areas where there are skills demand. So we are training people across Australia, working with the states and territories through what is now a $2 billion job trainer fund to ensure that Australians, when they access job trainer, are training up in areas of actual labour market demand. That's because we understand we need to put in place those policies which will skill up Australians and give them the skills they need to get into a job. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Mr Morrison has failed to deliver on his promise to vaccinate all people working and living in residential aged care by Easter, vaccinate all Australians with a disability and disability care workers by Easter, vaccinate four million Australians by the end of March, fully vaccinate all over 70s by the onset of winter, and vaccinate all Australians by October. Why should Australians believe Mr Morrison will deliver on his new promises when he has consistently failed to deliver on his old promises, leaving Australians languishing in lockdown? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, once again, Senator Watt and his questions has become commonplace from the Labor Party and airbrush the bits of history that they're not interested in. Uh, they simply ignore the realities of the 3.4 million doses that didn't arrive on schedule at the start of the year. They airbrush the challenges in relation to changes in the health advice that related to the AstraZeneca vaccine. They pretend those things didn't occur and just suit on uh, pursuing the politically motivated agenda. Well, that's the choice of the Labor Party, Mr. President. Uh, but what we have acknowledged is there have been challenges. We've taken responsibility for fixing those challenges, and we are pleased, Mr. President, to see the rate of the vaccine rollout now charging ahead across Australia. In the last week alone, 1.8 million doses administered uh, around Australia. That is the population of South Australia, provided with a vaccine dose all in one week, running at a rate of administration of vaccines now higher than was ever achieved in the United States at their peak 
higher than was ever achieved in the United Kingdom at their peak. Order. And that's before we see the increase in supply that will come through further in the coming months. We've secured additional supply already, and there's more coming. It will see with that extra supply, even more distribution outlets brought online. The ability for us to open up at that point to the entire adult population, providing all Australians with the opportunity to follow the magnificent lead of our older and senior Australians who have turned out as the first cohorts made eligible in record numbers. Taking the effort, taking the time to get vaccinated and now some 85 per cent plus in first dose for the most senior Australians, setting a very strong example that I trust, based on the growth rates we're seeing across every other age cohort, will be followed by Australians to help us reach the crucial targets of 70 and 80 per cent and hopefully further uh, in the time to come. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Mr Morrison is promising Australians that the lockdowns he is responsible for will end when 70 per cent of Australians over the age of 16 are vaccinated. Will Mr Morrison admit that Australia would be there already if he had not failed his two jobs on vaccine and quarantine? How can Australians trust that the same man who got them into this mess can get them out of it. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, there we have Labor again taking the political approach. There we have Senator Watt repeating this pathetic line from Labor like there are only two jobs to worry about. Well, of course, there are many more serious jobs in addition to COVID that we must Order. do simultaneously, have been pursuing simultaneously, whether that be the updated closing the gap agenda, whether that be dealing with the sensitive issues in Afghanistan whether that be pursuit of many other policies in relation to economic growth, to climate change or otherwise. But in terms of the agenda to opening up, we are absolutely committed to seeing the Doherty modelling applied because it provides a scientific basis to give confidence, certainty to Australians while keeping Australians as safe as possible. We can Order. see Australia charging towards those targets in the Doherty modelling and because Australians are turning out as the dosages become more available and that is delivering the opportunity for us to look to a future with far more confidence and optimism than those on the other side apparently seem to have. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. In the Black Summer bushfires, Mr Morrison told Australians, I don't hold a hose, mate. And when COVID hit Australia, Mr Morrison blamed everyone else for his failure to deliver safe national quarantine and the vaccine rollout. After three years as Prime Minister, when will Mr Morrison start acting like one? Senator Birmingham. Well, what a pathetic excuse for a question there from Senator Watt. Indeed, as a government, and we are proud to have Mr Morrison leading us, leading us through the most uncertain of global times. We're proud of the fact that as a country, the cooperation shown by all Australians right across this nation has ensured that despite our current difficulties, we do have world-leading outcomes when it has come to the management of COVID-19. The policies and approaches put in place in Australia have saved lives, tens of thousands of lives compared with the rest of the world. The economic responses put in place in Australia have saved businesses and saved jobs, hundreds of thousands of jobs, relative to the challenges that have been faced in the rest of the world. These are uncertain times. The Delta variant has thrown additional challenges at us. But we are confident Australia will come through it. And we won't let those opposite talk this nation down, talk it into some sort of economic abyss, because what we will see once again, I am certain, is that with the economic support Order. effectively Senator delivered, Birmingham, Australia time will for come the back strong. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And I ask that further questions be now placed on notice. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much. Um, I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Birmingham to the question asked by Senator Watt. My home state of New South Wales now is entering its ninth week of lockdown with record case numbers and a population suffering from nine weeks of social isolation from friends, families and everyday activities. There was one person, one person who could have stopped this had he been effective and had he kept his promises to the Australian people. But Mr Morrison instead 
has failed on all of those promises. His promise to vaccinate all people working and living in residential aged care by Easter. What Australians actually got? More than 40 per cent of aged care staff still haven't had their first shot, despite making vaccines mandatory in the aged care sector by 17 September. The government's failed rollout means that these aged care workers and the aged care sector will see them sacked, a large section of the workforce, or push back their deadline again to complete and utter failure. Mr Morrison's second promise to vaccinate all Australians with a disability and disability care workers by Easter. What Australians actually got from Mr Morrison? 26.2 per cent of 267,526 national disability insurance scheme participants aged 16 or older have been double dosed, and 44 per cent partially vaccinated as of August 19. That is another appalling failure to vaccinate our most at-risk citizens. Mr Morrison's third promise, to vaccinate 4 million Australians by the end of March. But what Australians actually got? 850,000 doses. Not full vaccines, doses. By April 6, just over 10 per cent of where we should have been in April. Mr Morrison's fourth promise to fully vaccinate all over 70s by the onset of winter. What seniors actually got? Fewer than 40 per cent of over 70s were fully vaccinated by the end of the second month of winter. And Mr Morrison's fifth promise to the Australian people to vaccinate all Australians by October. What Australia actually got was one of the slowest rollouts in the developed world. Chron chronic, crushing lockdowns, and as of yesterday, only 24 per cent of our population is fully vaccinated. Now, these failures, these broken promises from Mr Morrison, have implications that have radically changed the lives of those in my home state. We will look back on this period of time, life before COVID and life after and the endurance of the ongoing failure of this government during this profoundly challenging period for our country where promises were made and Mr Morrison and his government failed to deliver. Whether that's for the residents of South West Sydney who are locked in their homes with soldiers patrolling their streets, whether it's the aged care worker desperate, desperate to get a vaccine and an appointment trying to get there in time so that they don't infect the beloved um, members of that community that they're serving, or whether it's the First Nations communities whose communal lives and culture is profoundly interrupted by the terrifying spread of virus, especially those communities in Dubbo, for whom I advocated directly to the Minister for Health in April, who failed to respond, and we see the context in which this wild spread of that disease is happening right now. I warned the government. I warned the government. Labor has continued to warn the government, particularly about rural health failures that would harm the lives of First Nation communities across this country, but particularly in the seat of parts in western New South Wales. Mr Morrison's fingerprints are all over this enormous mess, from the botched negotiations with Pfizer due to his meanness, offered 40 million doses in June 2020, and he said, no, thank you. We are paying the price for that decision. The lack of foresight, throwing all of our eggs into one vaccine basket, and the inability to effectively coordinate the rollout. This Prime Minister has hobbled the Australian economy, prolonged this terrible health crisis with his failure to attend to detail and to take necessary care. His sole interest, his political future, not the nation he pretends to lead, have left Australians in an enduring economic emotional health crisis, the likes of which thank we have you, never Senator seen. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Your time has expired. Senator Bragg. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. Well, I rise to address the topic at hand this afternoon in the Senate, which is on the question of vaccines and the question of the management of this pandemic. Uh, now, um, it has been said uh, that the opposition uh, really has played uh, their, their role that we would expect 
during this past 18 months. They have been in opposition, interested in politics, not interested in trying to help the Australian nation uh, deal with an enormous economic and health shock. And so people want to talk about what really matters. Uh, when, the, when the books are written, people will look at this period and they will say that there was a relatively low level of infection, uh, there were fewer deaths than any other comparable nation, the vaccine rollout was slower than it may have needed to be, uh, but it picked up pace uh, pretty quickly. Now, the pace of the vaccination rollout right now in my home state of New South Wales, and you want to talk about New South Wales, is pretty much the fastest in the world. It's the fastest that anyone's ever seen. Um, and we are now at the stage today, having hit six million doses in my home state, uh, which is almost 60 per cent of people having had one a dose, we're 15 points ahead uh, of some of the other states in Australia. So New South Wales uh, will be the first to real freedom. I mean, other states can live behind their COVID curtain and try and pretend that they want to be in some sort of a hermit kingdom. Uh, but New South Wales, because of uh, the very fast rollout, uh, which is a combination of uh, Commonwealth and state government cooperation, will be the first to real freedom. The people in my state uh, will be the first people in this country to genuinely live with COVID. And that is what we have to do. We have to live with this. Now, now, now I must come to this issue that was raised during question time, where it was asserted that there was huge waits, huge waiting lists for, for people to get vaccines in South West Sydney. Well, helpfully, during the course of the last hour, I've been able to check, check a few facts. And I have spoken to some pharmacists that I know in South West Sydney. Uh, and you can walk into a pharmacy in Bexley or Kingsgrove and you can get a, you can get a shot straight away. So, I mean, Labor will want to pick up on the politics because they're not interested in health outcomes, they're interested in politics. And that is, and that is their role, so we can't begrudge them that. But, but the point is, um, we are on the way to achieving our planned targets. We're going to get to 70 per cent. We're going to get to 80 per cent. It is going to happen. You can already see with the older Australians um, in some cases having received um, over 80 per cent already of their first dose, this is going to happen. And in a couple of months, we're going to be there and um, our economic figures will still be very strong based on all the relevant data we have up to the moment. And people will look at this period and say, it was a huge economic shock, it was a huge health scare, but you know what, it was run, it was run pretty well because few people died, there were a low level uh, of infection, and the vaccine rollout was very fast uh, in the end. A and so I think it's important when we, when we look at some of the more sensitive issues here around minorities uh, and people want to talk about the, the, the Indigenous communities. Uh, of course people are concerned about the Indigenous communities and in far-flung far and remote communities, and there are some of those in New South Wales as there are in Western Australia, it has been very important to keep the virus out of these communities. And overall, um, that has largely happened. Yes, there has been some infection in towns like Burke and Brewarrina and Canamble, towns that I visited in my role as a senator. And yes, it is clear that the facilities in those towns, uh, they're not flash facilities. And these are the last places we want to see the virus. Uh, but we do need now, um, having had the virus in some of these communities, to work closely with the, the elders, uh, as is happening, to ensure that those vaccines go into the arms of those Indigenous people. Now, you know, we do need to, um, I think, reflect on some of the, the past failures here on Indigenous policy in Australia, where there has been far too much paternalism and far too much um, doing to rather than, than doing with. And, that is, and that, is, that is what has happened across Australia uh, during this pandemic. The, the COVID rollout, the, sorry, the vaccination rollout um, has been done in consultation in deep consultation with the Indigenous community. So we need to get those vaccines into the arms in Western and Central Western New South Wales. Uh, that is happening uh, and that is now urgent. And so I think ultimately we will look back on this period as being a period of, of great, great um, concern. Um, there has been a big price paid by small business people and by the kids at schools. But ultimately, we are on track and this will be over in a couple of months and we can open up. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Your time has expired. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the question from Senator Watt to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham, on the Morrison government's failure to hit their own self-imposed vaccine targets, 
and to vaccinate key vulnerable groups in the community. This is a government, Deputy President, that is now in its eighth, eighth year. One only needs to look at some members of Cabinet to realise that sometimes the length of government is directly relevant to who in the B team gets into Cabinet. No more so is this true than of the Minister responsible for the dignity and peace of mind of hundreds of thousands of people with disabilities, Senator Reynolds. People with a disability and their loved ones depend on a capable, empathetic and engaged minister. Instead, they've been saddled with the self-absorbed Senator of Western Australia, who has failed in her current position and who is oh, clearly sorry, still Senator Small. Small. Pity. Um, Senator Kitching, please, um, there's a point of order. Senator Small. Uh, Madam Deputy President, that is a clear reflection on the minister in a personal capacity, and I consider a breach of 1933. Uh, no, thank you, Senator Small. It's not a reflection. Thank you. Uh, I, mean, I, realise, I realise, Deputy President, that of course Senator Small is also a senator for Western Australia, and I don't wish to besmirch him because he isn't uh, as self-absorbed as Senator Reynolds is. Um, anyway, she's currently failed in her in her position. She's uh, still Senator in self pity. Senator Kitching, just a moment, please, Senator Small. So if the previous thing wasn't a reflection, surely calling her self-absorbed certainly is. Uh, I don't believe it is, Senator Small. Thank you. Senator Kitching. She's still clearly wallowing in self-pity, having been pried from her previous role as Defence Minister. In fact, you can probably still see the fingernail claw marks in the wall of the secure room from where they had to drag her out. And let me break it to you, Senator Reynolds, you're not getting that role back anytime soon. To add insult to injury, this is the second incompetent, inept and lazy minister that Australians with disabilities and their families and loved ones have had foisted upon them by the Prime Minister. They've gone from the member for Fadden to the Senator for Western Australia, Senator Reynolds. While her predecessor's sole qualification was that he is the Prime Minister's flatmate, I laughed disbelievingly this morning when I heard this pathetic and negligent minister boasts about what she believes are her achievements and strengths on Radio National this morning. The minister said, and I quote, Well, Fran, when I became minister nearly five months ago, it was very clear to me that there was a number of challenges in rolling out the vaccination program. I mean, one would think that she had some ability to see some problems um, to people with serious and permanent disability, particularly those in shared residential accommodation, over 6,000 small homes around the nation, and that's for a variety of reasons. Everything from consent to making sure that we provide the right environment, the right supports to the individuals. And then Minister Reynolds went on to say, and this is why I really couldn't believe she said this, as an army logistician myself, I did what a good logistician did. How much are the tickets, one has to ask. I got an even better logistician to come in and set up a task force for disability vaccinations. This panicked buffoon actually said logistician. And I'll come back to that. She then went into an indecipherable bureaucratic rant in which she said, and I quote, now, as you've said in relation to all NDIS participants who are eligible, we've also had a 300% increase since I've started with this new approach in June. So we've still got a long way to go, but we've been picking that up fast. And I also finally just share with you that disability workers, we've had an extraordinary response. In fact, since you and I last spoke about the worker vaccination in June, we've had a 200% increase. So dreadful were these numbers, Deputy President, that she kept referring to a percentage increase and not the percentage of those actually vaccinated. So if we want to look at the actual figures, it's 28 per cent months. That is it. Remember this minister talking about how she cares for people with disability? What an honour it was to be in this portfolio, she said. Fine words, zero action, zero action. Her responses on the ABC this morning and her dislike of discussing numbers would suggest that she's not even the logistician that she prides herself on being. And as she should remember, as she's already experienced, pride cometh before a fall. This train wreck of an interview shows she's not even a good obfuscator, an attribute much valued by this government. However, this isn't the only area in which the minister's reign of error is being felt. I received an answer to a question on notice today number 3926, whereby the minister revealed that complaints received by both Centrelink and Medicare, both under her watch, have steadily increased in recent months. We hear a lot about the Prime Minister shirking responsibility and not doing his job. 
but I'd like to add one more job to the list of things Mr Morrison will no doubt fail to do, and that is to sack this disgraceful dud before even more people die on his government's watch. So this is a message for the Prime Minister, one he'd heed if he was doing his job. He would not have this minister who's been in for 148 days subjecting cruelly people to a disability to her bungling, but he would get a better minister if that's what he really cared about. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator Kitching, and I would ask you to withdraw those last comments you made about the minister. Um, I withdraw. Thank you, Senator Small. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And we know that the leader of the opposition in the other place, uh, the member for Grainler, likes a buck each way, but it's come to today instead for the member for Maribyrnong and the former leader of the opposition, Mr Bill Shorten, to finally recognise that Labor can't have it each way when it comes to the Team Australia moment that is getting our nation vaccinated against COVID-19. Today, the member for Maribyrnong has uh, endorsed the government's position on adopting the National Cabinet endorsed Doherty Institute modelling, and that is that Australia must vaccinate and then, in a compact with the Australian people, must allow them to live with COVID-19. Not a, a, there is only one uh, contagious disease that has been eliminated from the face of the earth in the last 200 years. So it is fanciful to suggest that anything other than a suppression and vaccination strategy, and that is the strategy of the Morrison government and indeed the National Cabinet, gets Australians back to what they'd want. It gets them back living their lives. It gets them out from under the blanket, Mr. Oh, sorry, Mrs. Uh, Deputy President, and allows them to spend the time doing the sorts of things that we know they want to, and that's to get a job, to raise their kids, to give them opportunities that might, they might not have had themselves. That is the Australia that the Morrison government wants to see, and that is what our track record speaks to. Not only will we be the first nation in the world to close our international border, we then set about protecting lives and livelihoods, uh, including, of course, uh, the devastating economic impacts of COVID-19 in the early days and the record levels of economic stimulus that we provided on the back of that, some $290 billion of direct economic stimulus that allowed three million Australians to be supported with JobKeeper and some million uh, to regain employment as the economy came roaring back. However, we are not done because we know that the vaccination program and the vaccination rollout is the key to a post-COVID normal for this country. And that's why in just seven days we've seen more than the population of South Australia vaccinated in the last week alone. Now, whilst those opposites seek to undermine uh, our vaccination effort, that is per capita a higher rate of vaccination than that that has ever been achieved by the United States or the United Kingdom on a per capita basis. They seek to undermine Australia's vaccination program, uh, which featured ordinary approvals of vaccines rather than emergency approvals of vaccines in the US and the UK. We know that the reason that the US and the UK did put their vaccines through emergency approval was because bodies were piling up in the streets. Instead, here in Australia, not only did we preserve the national economy with Australia's unemployment rate falling below 5 per cent in the latest monthly figures. But we did so with a death rate, uh, some uh, uh, lowest in the OECD, comparable with that of only New Zealand, uh, and one that would have otherwise meant some 30,000 additional deaths here in Australia, even if we'd only suffered the average death rate in the OECD. And yet do we hear a good word from those opposite about our vaccination program, about our economic support, about our national leadership through this once-in-a-century pandemic. No, we don't. Other than from the member from Maribyrnong, who has finally realised that the time has come not to be painted into a corner here, isolated from the rest of the nation, as we seek to get the job done, get vaccinated and get back to living our best lives. Instead, this Labor Party has shown why in the eight long years that they have sat opposite, they learn nothing about their failures in government, where their 
uh, ill thought out uh, proposal for some $300 bonuses for vaccination was reminiscent of cash for clunkers, school halls, pink backs, and other government rorts with your taxpayer money. Not only do they not learn from those failures in government, but they have learned nothing in the eight years of opposition sitting over there where they should have been listening to the Australian people who overwhelmingly speak with their sleeves, Madam Deputy President, and they are rolling their sleeves up in record numbers. When it comes to those uh, over 70, some 85 per cent already protected, uh, 75 per cent of the over 50s protected. When it comes to Australia's most vulnerable, we know that 67 per cent of those in shared disability accommodation have received one dose and already 51.9 per cent two doses. That is the fact, Madam Thank Deputy you, President. Thank you, Senator Small. Your time has expired. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Uh, well, look, Australians are typically known for being a rather easygoing lot. You know, we're not the ones to expect a great deal. We're relaxed, and I think it'd be fair to say we're reasonably forgiving types. And given these generally low expectations from Australians for most things, it is really quite something to see the level of disappointment currently in the community, especially against those opposite and their ability, or rather the lack of ability, inability, one might even say, to get on with the job and delivering on the things that matter to working families. Now, at the beginning of this year, we knew that the government had two jobs. First, it was to deliver the vaccine rollout, and the second was to deliver a national quarantine system. You know, and those opposite would like to talk about how great they are at this moment. But you know, nine months later on, what we are seeing is the government playing catch up, to be frank. And given that the whole year we've had uh, and the one previously, one would have thought that the government would throw absolutely everything at these tasks. One would have thought that the government would understand just how important it was for them, just to get it right. And getting those jabs in arms and having Australians overseas back home with their loved ones. And yet here we are, with still some of the lowest vaccination rates in the developed world. About how quickly we're going, we will have some of the lowest vaccination rates in the developed world and still no effective quarantine system for returning Australians. As much as those opposite would like to ignore it, the Prime Minister and his government made some very promises to the Australian people. We remember those promises, and so do those in our community. The Coalition promised that stranded Australians would be home by Christmas. Last Christmas, that is. The Coalition promised that in the race to get vaccinated, that Australians were at the front of the queue, that they would be the first ones, first in the line, to get those jabs that they needed to get our nation and our economy back on track. But what we know now is that both of these promises have been broken. Christmas came and it went, and still tens of thousands of Australians remain stranded overseas, separated from family and friends. <coughs> Mothers and fathers, sons and daughters, husbands and wives torn apart because of this government's failure. Now, eight months on from the commitment, still here we are, with loved ones torn away from their homeland because of this government's failure to deliver a national quarantine system. And here we still are over 12 months on with Australians waiting and waiting for the jabs that they desperately need. And it is good to see finally the gun plane catch up, but we're having to also rely on vaccines from overseas countries because we just took it too slow, too slow to get our orders in with various vaccination companies. Now we have half of, sorry, we have half a nation that is currently under lockdown. Our two biggest cities in Australia, and even our national capital. Residents of Sydney and Melbourne are living under curfew conditions, all because of the coalition's failure. If Australians had access to the jabs they needed, we wouldn't be in this mess. That's just the fact of it. If Australia was actually at the front of the queue, like that was promised, we wouldn't be in this situation. It has been absolutely clear that the only thing this government deals in is false hope. It certainly isn't in outcomes. It's certainly not a result of orientated groups of individuals. And my question to the federal government is simply this. How much longer 
do we all need to wait here until you stop buck passing to the states and address the Commonwealth's failures, the Commonwealth's responsibilities under the Constitution? How much longer will working families be facing the uncertainty of rolling lockdowns before you'll get the jabs you promised rolling out in their neighbourhoods? How much longer will this take? These are questions not asked by me, but these are questions that come to my office every single day from people. People who can't get work, people who are desperate to get up there and make it and earn a living. These are questions just far too important to ignore. They're too important for you to continue to buck pass on. I urge the government to step up to the plate, make good on your broken promises and do the job that you were elected to do. Thank you, Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator O'Neill to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Seward. I move to take note of the answers from Senator Colbeck to my questions on uh, vaccinations, mm -hmm. um, which he didn't answer. He didn't answer the question about uh, are children going to be uh, included in targets. And now this is a, a very, very important issue. Because if children under the age of 16 are not included in our targets, it means that 80 per cent is really 65 per cent of the population. So that has ramifications in and of itself about the impact of COVID in the community, both in terms of the infection rate, in terms of people that catch it, and unfortunately in terms of deaths from COVID. But of course, importantly, we need to stop our children getting sick. It's absolutely essential that we move strongly to make sure that children under the age, teenagers under the age of 16, are included in our vaccination targets. Because we've seen from the latest outbreaks that children are getting the Delta variant is absolutely essential. I'm going to share my time with Senator Faruqi because she wants to talk about the, whips, the TRIPS waiver. I asked. My last question was about the TRIPS waiver. The minister obviously did not understand the question because he went on and had a rant at me about the, my comment. It was not about Australia. It was about the TRIPS waiver so that other countries get access to vaccines. In other words, waiving intellectual property rights so that other countries, those lower GDP countries who don't have adequate access to vaccines, can get, vac uh, can get access to vaccines. That was that, what that question was about. Um, it was not about Australia. My other two were, but that one was about vaccines around the rest of the world. And the, this government, our government, the Australian government, has not supported the TRIPS waiver. It's one of those countries that is standing in the way of, uh, of making sure that TRIPS waiver is in place. I would like to now hand over the rest of my time to Senator Faruqi. Thank you. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Deputy President. The Morrison government has not only botched up vaccinations for people living in, in this country, they are also actively jeopardising the health and lives of millions of people in this global south. The Liberal National Government has ignored the pleas of more than 100 countries for our support to temporarily lift intellectual property restrictions so poorer countries can manufacture vital vaccines, medicines, masks and ventilators. This waiver is currently being considered at the World Trade Organization with the TRIPS Council meeting again on September 14. But as Senator Seward said, I don't think the minister, Minister Colbeck, Colbeck even knows what a TRIPS waiver is, and that is pathetic <laughs> and shameful. Till now, Australia has sided with the big pharmaceutical corporations to keep their profits intact, rather than increasing access to a life-saving treatment for people who have already been screwed over by the global north, colonialism and neocolonialism. Now is the time to pay off some of the debt that we owe these countries and their people by making sure that they can produce vaccines at the scale and urgency that is needed Yet this government has not only stonewalled pleas to support the TRIPS waiver, but as the Saturday paper recently reported, they are using pharmaceutical industry talking points to help other holdouts, such as Germany, prolong negotiations at the World Trade Organizations. This government is so shamelessly supporting corporate profit ahead of the lives of people. 
And while refusing to support the TRIPS waiver on the one hand, on the other hand, Scott Morrison has dipped into the COVAX supply, taking out 500,000 Pfizer doses because he failed to do his job. COVAX, a donation-based model for access to vaccines to poorer countries, is already struggling to meet its funding goal and is not enough to meet the required demand. So today I'm calling on the Australian government again. If you have a skerrick of decency, any sense of morality and responsibility left in you to value people's lives, provide your full-throated support to the TRIPS waiver now. There is not a second to wait. Wait. It is unconscionable to deny any country vaccine access to protect the billions of dollars of profits of pharmaceutical giants. The question is, motion moved by Senator C. Would be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Seward, I think you were going to give notice of an intention to withdraw a motion. No. Okay. Any other notices of motion? If not, I shall proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Thank you very quick afternoon. I understand there are no notifications of postponements or extensions to the clerk, so I'll now proceed to the discovery of formal business, and I'll move to government business matter number one. Senator Rustin. Oh, Senator Cash. Thank you. I ask that government business notice motion number one relating to the consideration of a disallowance motion be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Cash. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Seward. Could you please record? Or could Hansard please record the Greens opposing this motion? Thank you, Senator Seward. So recorded. I'll now move to general business matter number 1221 in the name of Senator Faruqi. Senator Seward, you're going to move that on Senator Faruqi's behalf? Yes, I am. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1222 be taken as. No, sorry, I'm doing the wrong one. Yep. I beg your pardon, sorry. Um, before asking that the motion be taken as formal, I inform the Chamber that Senator Carr will also sponsor the motion. General notice of motion number 1221 uh, be taken as a formal motion. Any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. All Australian Research Council funding is awarded on the basis of competitive grants process and rigorous peer review assessment. All applications are subject to grant guidance and guidelines which, since September 2020, precluded the listing of preprints in an application for funding. This preclusion was detailed in the application form, instructions to applicants and information sessions conducted by the Australian Research Council with universities. Applicants are able to appeal a decision in accordance with the grant guidelines. Question is the motion moved by number one two two one be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Seward, number one triple two. I'll do the right one this time. Um, I ask. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number one two 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 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Senator Rustin. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. The Greens' continuous motions for the production of documents related to the Beetaloo Accelerated Drilling Program are nothing more than a fishing expedition tying up the time of ministers, their departments and the Senate for no discernible result. The question is the motion number 1222 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Rustin. The government's opposition to that motion noted. So recorded. Thank you. That concludes the discovery of formal business. Senators, I inform the Senate. Oh, sorry. Senator Rustin. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I give notice that on the next sitting day I shall move that the provisions of paragraph 5 to 8 of Standing Order 111 not apply to the following bills, allowing them to be considered during the period of sittings Electoral Legislation Amendment Counting, Scrutiny and Operational Efficiencies Bill 2021, Electoral Legislation Amendment Electoral Offences and Preventing Multiple Voting Bill 2021, and Electoral Legislation Amendment Party Registration Integrity Bill 2021. I also table the statement of reasons justifying the need for these bills to be considered during these sittings and seek leave to have the statements incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Notice is given. I'll now move to the MPI, if there's nothing else. I inform the Senate that at 8.30am today, eight proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Keneally proposing a matter of public importance was chosen. It is shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? It is. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers for today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. And I call Senator Polly. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to make a contribution on this MPI that after the Morrison jo Joyce government has failed to deliver on its promise to vaccinate four million Australians by the end of March 2021 vaccinate all of the first priority group by Easter 2021 and vaccinate 6 million Australians by the 10th of May 2021. Last weekend, Australia experienced its highest daily COVID case number since the pandemic began 18 months ago. I don't have to remind anyone in this chamber, as I don't have to remind anyone outside this chamber, of the serious nature of this pandemic and the impact of a hapless, unorganised, disorganised, chaotic government who failed to secure the health and safety of its citizens. And that rests solely with one man. That's the Prime Minister of this country, Scott Morrison. He failed to meet his own dates that he put in place to reassure Australians that he was on the job. I don't know how many times we've been in this chamber and reminded the Prime Minister that he has had two jobs during this pandemic, two crucial jobs. One was to roll out the vaccine in a timely way to protect the health of the Australian people, to protect the economy and to provide adequate quarantine. And he has failed on both of those tasks. But the consequence of his failure has seen too many Australians lose their lives. Too many vulnerable older, older Australians who have died needlessly because of the failure of this man. Now, when you're Prime Minister of a country, it is expected that you will show leadership. This is the same man who said there isn't a race. There's no race to uh, roll out the vaccine. There's no race. There is a race. And the race was always about ensuring Australians' health, ensuring that the Australian economy was protected, ensuring that Australians could feel sec secure in their jobs and secure in knowing that their Prime Minister was on the job and he has failed on all accounts. What we see now is that there are over 16 million Australians in lockdown around this country. Families being locked down. Children being locked down at home and parents are having to resort to going back to homeschooling. That has an impact on that family. It has an impact on the community. If we go through and we look at the, the frontline workers in this country, the truckies, the people who work in retail, our health workers, our school teachers, our aged care workers, our disability carers, these are the people that should have been a priority to keeping our economy moving and helping to ensure the health and safety of this country and of the people. But we still have not seen all aged care workers 
vaccinated in this country. We still have not seen all disability carers fully vaccinated. We still have not seen even a plan to address the home care, aged care workers that go into our older Australians, our most vulnerable Australians, in their own homes for those workers to be fully vaccinated. We have stories coming in, calls, people upset, concerned about their loved ones because they can't access the vaccine or the vaccine that they would want. This is the government who failed to secure enough vaccines to ensure their community, their residents, were kept safe. Now, we know uh, that the Prime Minister never likes to accept responsibility for his own failings. We see that time and time again with what is uh, a pretty sad reflection on his ministry when you see his uh, Senator Colbert come into this chamber and want to talk about the amount of vaccines that have been rolled out over the last couple of weeks, as if that's something to be proud of. All that is is an acknowledgement that they have failed to meet their own timelines that they set themselves. Now, those people on that side of the chamber may think that, well, you know, that's okay, we can get away with this. People are now uh, lining up for five hours to get their vaccination. So all's good, nothing to see here. Well, this is the Prime Minister, after three years of this Prime Minister, who on every occasion wants to blame somebody else, accept no responsibility. What he's going to be remembered for is being the Prime Minister who was only good at slogans and trying to spin his way out of trouble. That's what Mr Morrison is going to be remembered for, the Prime Minister who always went missing in a crisis, just as he did through the 2019-20 uh, bushfires. What we saw in those circumstances was, I don't hold a hose. And then I don't give jabs. That is not good enough. This is a war against this pandemic. This is when a prime minister is supposed to stand up and be counted, and he's failing to do that. In my home state of Tasmania, we fortunately aren't in lockdown. But what we are seeing is the effect of New South Wales, Victoria, and at times Queensland. WA, South Australia, going into lockdowns, that has an impact on our community. That has an impact on our economy. It has an impact on our small businesses. But no, I never hear any one of the Liberal senators from Tasmania come in here and talk up for the small businesses, to speak up for the school teachers who can't get a vaccine. We don't see them coming in defending their government about the, their pathetic uh, attempts to secure the safety of Australians. What we don't see is a Prime Minister and his government taking responsibility. Now, we've had other senators making a contribution through the course of this week, talking about our First Nation people who have such a low vaccination rate. These are also some of the most vulnerable people in our community. Western Sydney, the western parts in Orange, Bathurst, Dubbo, that there's a spike in outbreaks there. And teachers who are working with special needs children who should be a priority have been told that they will have to wait till next year to get a vaccine when they rang around doctors, surgeries, pharmacies because they don't want to have to have the AZ vaccine. They want to have Pfizer. So this government will be reminded every single day that we sit about their failings, and they must be held accountable for their failings, because our economy and the Australian citizens deserve nothing less. Now, this, this shifting of blame trying to say that we support and we want people to stay in lockdown is ridiculous. We want to see the Australian people going back to their old way of life. Of course that's what we want. But we wanted that 
to have happened because people have been vaccinated according to the Prime Minister's own timelines. To March in, in this year, to Easter at this year, to the six million Australians that were going to be vaccinated by the 10th of May in 2021. Then it was we were all going to be vaccinated by October. Those deadlines were not met, and I have no faith that this government will be able to meet even, even their own latest deadline of October or the end of this year. Other countries around the world are already looking at boosters for their residents, but we are so far behind. How many more people are going to have to die? And when the Prime Minister says that we are going to have to learn to live with this pandemic, then it will be on his head. How are we then going to live with the amount of people that are going to die if we open up the borders before all Australians are vaccinated? How are we going to be dealing with those deaths? Because that is the situation if he forces states to pull down their borders before the majority of Australians are vaccinated in this country. Enough Order. is enough, Senator Prime Polly, Minister. Time has Get on and do your. Senator Polly, Senator Henderson, remotely. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. President. Uh, it is my pleasure to, to rise and speak on this MPI which regrettably, Mr President, reflects the Labor Party's determination to focus on petty politicking, on personal political attacks and not on the national interest. And I say to Senator Polly and to all Labor senators opposite, Australians are sick of this negativity, of dragging down the achievements of Australians, of our nation, of our health workers, of our cleaners, of our families struggling with homeschooling, of our businesses, Australians are sick of it. So I say, what about starting to put the national interest first? Because this politicking is a disgrace. And Senator Polly, I say to Senator Polly, I am outraged. I am outraged by your statement attributing blame to the Prime Minister personally for COVID deaths. That is an absolute disgrace. You should withdraw that appalling statement. And the facts are, the Coat Inquiry found, the evidence is, the facts are, that the vast majority of COVID deaths in this country, 801 deaths, were caused by the failure of hotel quarantine in Victoria last year. That is the facts. And talking of slogans, Senator Polly, let's have a look at Labor slogans. Labor keeps on claiming that we failed with quarantine. The bottom line is, and the facts are, that the Labor Premier is determined to take responsibility for quarantine. In fact, that was led by Premier Andrews last April when he put forward the hotel quarantine plan to National Cabinet, which was accepted. So please start telling the truth. The fact of the matter is the Commonwealth is playing its part, but quarantine has been taken on as a responsibility by the states. And one of the most successful quarantine facilities is in Howard Springs in the Northern Territory, with supported by an investment of more than half a billion dollars, which is taking the bulk of repatriation flights into this country. Uh, in Victoria, the Morrison government has also agreed to share the cost of, uh, cost of quarantine with the state for a new quarantine facility uh, in Melbourne. So let's stick to the facts and stop this revolting politicking. So the first thing that I want to say in my contribution, positively, frankly, and let's focus on the positives, is to all Australians who are eligible, please get vaccinated. What a shame we didn't hear that from Senator Polly. Today we have wonderful news that Australians aged between 16 and 39 will be able to book their Pfizer vaccination from seven o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, and we are seeing a dramatic escalation in vaccination rates. So some of the figures that we've heard from Labor are, are just a misrepresentation of the facts. The facts is that over 17 million vaccine doses have now been administered 
and we are now hitting over 1.8 million doses administered every single week. A total of 4.5 vaccinations were given in July, which is more than double that achieved in May when 2.1 million doses were administered. And yes, there have been some challenges, uh, principally with supply, but these have largely been overcome and I wish Labor would tell Australians that. Give Australians hope, I say to Labor senators, give Australians hope that there is a way out of this. Uh, our government has secured nearly uh, close to 300 million doses of various vaccinations. And let's not forget that based on our hard work, based on the decisions that we made very early in the piece in relation to the management of the pandemic, including closing the border with China, which occurred in January of last year, uh, we have saved together, working together, 30,000 lives. Uh, we have been very proud to support over 3 million Australians through programs like JobKeeper, getting 1 million Australians back to work. There is a lot this government has got right. And now, of course, Lieutenant General Fruin and his team are working with the Health Minister and the Department of Health doing a, a great job in accelerating the rollout of the vaccinations. So, as the Prime Minister has said, to keep Australia focused on going forward, uh, we need to make sure that we stick to our national plan, and that is that once we achieve 70 to 80 per cent vaccination rates, uh, we will see less transmission of COVID-19, fewer people with severe illness, and therefore fewer hospitalisations and deaths. And as the Doherty Institute has said, COVID-19 won't go away, but it will be easier to control in the future. And that is the hope that Australians need. And as I say again, please, to Labor senators, please to the Leader of the Opposition, please start talking about hope. Please start talking about what we can do to, together as a nation. Please start talking about the importance of the national plan, because the bottom line is we can't live in lockdown forever. And I have been very critical of Daniel Andrews and state Labor at times when they have plunged <laughs> us into lockdown, particularly in parts of Victoria where there are no cases. I am deeply critical of the fact that there are children currently at boarding school in New South Wales who cannot get a permit to cross the border to come back to Victoria to their families, which in my view is a breach of the Victorian Charter of Human Rights. This is outrageous. There are elderly people sitting in caravan parks in Albury and across the border they cannot get a permit to return to Victoria. So we have got to manage these lockdowns better. They must be a last resort. And when we hit those 70 and 80% vaccination rates, we need to see Australia opening up. As the Prime Minister has made clear, as the Treasurer has made clear, we cannot live in lockdown forever. We need to open up our economy, get kids back to school, people back to work, and we need to give Australians hope. The Prime Minister has reiterated that the Groundhog Day of rolling lockdowns, gripping the, the nation, must not last a day more than necessary. The premiers and the first ministers must stick to the national plan. And it is deeply concerning that some premiers are already indicating that they will walk away or walk back from this national plan. And even Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews will not rule out further lockdowns, even though we reach the 70 or 80 per cent vaccination rate. The Herald Sun reported today that Premier Andrews said that once Victoria reaches a vaccination rate of 80 per cent of those aged over 16, there would not be a statewide lockdown unless otherwise advised. So I say to Premier Andrews, what sort of hope is that? What sort of plan is that? This is deeply troubling. This saps confidence from every single Victorian, particularly the businesses which have been hit so hard in the events sector, in hospitality, in arts, in tourism. These are businesses which have suffered so much. And when Melbourne goes into lockdown, it causes such huge issues right across regional Victoria, because the regional Victorian economy, to a large degree, depends on the Melbourne economy. So I say that Victorians have had enough, and that's why I call on Victorian Federal Labor MPs, including Mr Miles, Ms Coker, Ms King, 
and Ms Chesters to come out in support of the national plan. And I say to Labor, please stop your negativity. Please start acting in the national interest. The national plan we have developed and agreed on is our pathway to living with this virus. That is our goal, to live with this virus and to do the best we can as a nation working together. It's a plan based on the best possible scientific, scientific, medical and economic advice. And I would argue available, best advice available to any government in the world. Let's not forget that 12 months ago, we didn't even know whether we would have a vaccine. The fact that we have a vaccine that has been rapidly rolled out to all Australians is an incredible scientific achievement. Uh, this is largely going to keep us safe from this terrible virus, which has caused such havoc in Australia and around the world. But we are getting through this and we are managing. So again, to Labor, to those opposite, please let's focus on our success. Please let's focus on what we are achieving. Please let's focus on the scientific breakthroughs that we have seen here in Australia and around the world. Your time has please expired, Senator Seward. Please celebrate what we are doing. Thank you, Acting De Deputy President. I rise to make a contribution to this debate. Now, apparently we're being political if we dare raise concerns about the so-called national plan, when that plan, plan? That plan plan? is actually 80 per cent, supposedly 80 per cent of the population that conveniently does not include children of the eligible population. It doesn't include children under the age of 16. Now, that is a lot of, a lot of human beings that are not included in the targets. And when I asked the government today about are children going to be included in the targets, they conveniently, they conveniently didn't answer that question. Oh yeah, we're going, to, we're going to a target and we're going to get vaccines out to children at some time in the future, but they did not say and commit that they would include it in the plan. So let's be very clear. Children continue to be at risk because 80 per cent without those under 16 included means that we are dealing with around 65 per cent of the population. And that's pretty scary, folks. So don't accuse us of being political when we raise very genuine concerns. We too look at the science. We too are looking at the modelling. And the Doherty Institute's modelling is slightly out of step now with the current situation, which I think the government acknowledges. But there's also other modelling, the ANU modelling that came out today the pre-publishing report that came out today. There's the Grattan Institute modelling that clearly shows that young people, children, kids need to be included in the targets. When are they going to be included? It is our job in this place to question government, to hold government to account and raise up these issues, the same as we have done with many others. JobKeeper, increasing the coronavirus supplement. The government we all acknowledge the right thing there. We thank raise you. those issues. Thank you, Senator. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. This year started out with so much promise because of the lightning speed scientific endeavour that has delivered us the promise of protection through vaccination and the success of public health intervention measures meant that Australians could look forward to a, a vastly superior 2021 to, to the previous year. It is true the failings of the Morrison government to get Australia near the head of the queue on vaccine procurement was evident even in 2020. However, thanks to the successful public health interventions led by state governments, it all seemed like we might have brought just a little more time to successfully deliver our rollout. And the commitment was there directly from the Prime Minister that Australians would be vaccinated and vaccinated soon. In fact, the Prime Minister pledged to Australians that some four million of us would be vaccinated by the end of March. That pledge included further commitments. He promised that every Australian in the first priority group who wanted to be vaccinated would be by Easter. There was hope. Our most vulnerable Australians would be protected and protected reasonably soon. The promise made by the Prime Minister stretched to the vaccination of six million Australians by the 10th of May. 
and why the vaccination rollout in Australia, even under this pledge, was well behind the rest of the OECD, it's, it still seemed as though we would reach high levels of vaccination coverage within months. We needed just two things to go right. We needed our government to deliver on just two jobs, two commitments, two responsibilities that fall directly at the feet of the Commonwealth government. We needed to keep COVID out through a successful quarantine system whilst we rolled out a successful vaccination program. Seems doable. We thought this government, this Prime Minister, would be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Well, it turns out they can't do either on their own. Because last week, tragically, this nation experienced its highest daily COVID case numbers since the start of this pandemic. And we are nowhere near where we were supposed to be on our vaccine rollout under the Prime Minister's original plan and promise. We all agree that vaccination is our ticket out of this pandemic. So why on earth did the Prime Minister fail to secure, secure deals to procure vaccines in a timely manner in 2020? Our other nations seem capable of doing it. He claimed we were at the front of the queue. And now, now we find we are near the back of the pack when it comes to all comparisons with co comparable nations. In fact, we are last in the developed world when it comes to having our population fully vaccinated. There are still people in the vulnerable priority categories yet to be fully vaccinated. It's quite extraordinary, really, and a far cry from the hopeful optimism we all felt in January, because the consequences of Mr Morrison's failure to do his job has a devastating impact on Australians. Millions of us are are in seemingly endless lockdown. Hundreds and hundreds of Australians are contracting COVID every day. Borders are closed. Business is struggling or collapsing. People are out of work and losing income. The stress and the strain is having a significant impact on the me mental health and well-being of Australians. And it didn't need to be this way. We didn't need to be here, but here we are because Mr. Scott Morrison couldn't do his job. Just two jobs. Job number one, a speedy, effective rollout of the vaccine. Failed. Job number two, manage quarantine. Failed. But for this Prime Minister, every job is someone else's fault. Every crisis is someone else's responsibility. We are in the race of our life. We always were. To get this done, to provide better protection and a hope for a better life. There was always a race, despite what the Prime Minister said. It's been a total dereliction of duty because, as you know, he doesn't even hold a hose. And now Australians have been plunged into uncertainty and disruption because of the quarantine system and the slow vaccine rollout. Australians are crying out for leadership. They just want the job done. They want some hope. They want the promise of January 2021 delivered and all we ever get is more spin. All the while, our health is at risk, our economy is held hostage, families are being kept apart, children are stressed and missing out on school. Australians do deserve better. And interestingly enough, if the first of Mr Morrison's uh, promises and commitments to Australia in early uh, 2021, 70 per cent target would have already Senator. been reached. Thank you, Senator. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, those opposite are clearly consistently listening to some form of echo chamber, land of Danistan cheer squad focus group with their constant negativity. I mean, like, do you want Australia to fail? Why are you constantly rooting for Australia to fail? And I would have thought Senator Keneally, as a senator, for New South Wales, that she might have been able to muster some state pride, if not national one. Australia is now vaccinating people at a higher rate than any other country in the world. And in fact, the only thing more impressive than that is the fact that New South Wales is actually leading that charge. So what that means is New South Wales is now vaccinating people at a faster rate than any other jurisdiction globally. Now, I, for one, as a fellow New South Wales senator like Senator Keneally, I'm extremely proud of the people 
in my home state who have gone out and got vaccinated. That when Gladys Berejiklian set a target of six million vaccinations this month, that New South Wales Welshmen heard the call and they've exceeded those six million vaccinations with still a week to go in August. Now, this is something we should be celebrating. But instead, here we go again with the political point scoring, the talking down of Australians, and what Australians are actually going out to do in record numbers. In fact, there have been over 17 million doses of vaccinations delivered to date. But really what's so remarkable about that is just three days ago, we were at 16 million vaccinations. So for those of you that suffer with the, you know, str uh, uh, you know, struggle with the maths here, that means in the past three days we've seen one million doses delivered. Now no one could have got their first and second jab within three days, which means there's been one million Australians received a vaccination over the past three days. So I would like to say thank you. Thank you to them for making themselves safer. Thank you for making your loved ones safer. And thank you for assisting all Australians get back to their lives without lockdowns. But perhaps that's where we find the problem. Perhaps you don't want to return to any form of normality. Perhaps you've developed some form of fetish for lockdowns, and I mean each to their own. But this predilection affects millions of Australians and hundreds of thousands of businesses. We need to break the lockdown cycle, and we know via the Doherty modelling we can start to do that at a 70 per cent vaccination rate. So just let me break it down for you. More than 85 per cent of over 70s have received their first dose, with 58 the second. More than 75 of over 50s have received their first dose, and almost 45 per cent their second. And more than 50 per cent of over 16s are protected with their first dose and 31 per cent their second. But what we also know is that both New South Wales and the ACT, they have over 60 per cent of all of those eligible having received their first dose. Now, unfortunately, Queensland and Western Australia are lagging well behind with their numbers in just the mid-40 percentile. And whilst those opposite, very fond of asking questions about being a race, well, here you go. Have your race. Get on to your state premiers and start encouraging them to get their citizens vaccinated. And I know those of you from outside of the premier state, that is New South Wales, maybe get on to those premiers and your CHOs and get them to understand this requirement. And perhaps while we're on it, Senator Keneally might like to ask the member for Maribyrnong, who's such a fan of the AZ, to give the current opposition leader a call. Firstly, he could teach him how to actually say the words AstraZeneca, and then perhaps he could start to get out there and practice by encouraging people to get the vaccine rather than desperately trying to slow it down with his fear-mongering. Those of us on this side actually understand the tolls these lockdowns are having. But perhaps the mental health toll that these lockdowns are taking is beyond you. That the rate of teenage suicide and self-harm is rising. That we have a generation of kids that, quite frankly, these lockdowns, they're breaking. We know that Lifeline is receiving record-breaking numbers of calls each and every day. This morning I heard Roderick Reese on Sky News. He was speaking with Peter Stefanovic. His business, Cairns Adventure Group, it's unlikely to survive if he can't at the very least get interstate travellers to visit Cairns. And I'm sure Senator Green will be on the phone to Premier Palaszczuk pleading with her to ensure that fellow Australians are able to travel into state at Christmas to not only see their families but to be able to support these businesses who are absolutely at breaking point. But when you hear these premiers go against what the National Cabinet devised, who agreed the plan and then walk outside to political point score and further jeopardise 
the well-being and the livelihoods of so many within their own states? I mean, do they even begin to comprehend the damage that they are doing to not only the business owners, because I know those opposite aren't too fussed with small business owners, but the workers employed in those small businesses? The uncertainty that this prevarication causes for those workers when they don't know if the small business they work for will be able to survive. So I, I remain an optimist. I am hopeful that very soon your focus groups will tell you that the day of lockdowns being a vote winner is over. I am forever hopeful that you will start to support Australians. Not, you don't support all Australians and their families, their jobs and their businesses. Because if, if you don't, those opposites start to understand these devastating consequences of refusing to accept that we need to start to live with this virus in the same way we live with the flu, same way we live with the flu, that the mental health consequences will far outweigh the damages that COVID could ever do. And whilst those opposite continue their scare campaign and fear-mongering, I'd actually like to congratulate Victor Dominello, the New South Wales Minister for Customer Service and Minister for Digital, on the creation of the inclusion card. What he's doing here is he's allowing businesses to check people in rather than the other way around. So it's this sort of innovation that's going to assist in opening up New South Wales. I mean, if only all the, news, all the premiers had the same focus. And we know that there are people that struggle using a smartphone, aren't that tech savvy. And in fact, I still have a giggle when I think about one of the posts I saw last week uh, that someone put up that their mother wasn't quite sure to do with all the photos of the QR codes they'd taken because they'd hold their, their phone up and take a, a photo of it rather than checking in because the technology was just maybe a little sophisticated. Uh, but you know, it's also really good and an important movement forward for a lot of people with a disability that would struggle with the same sort of technology checking in. And I would like to acknowledge that from tomorrow, 25th of August, all NDIS participants over 12 years of age will be eligible to get vaccinated. Every NDIS participant over the age of 12 will be eligible. Now, for those wondering why it's not under 12, it's because no vaccine is approved for anyone under 12. So when we all start chiming in about how many children are going to be vaccinated, no vaccine globally is approved anywhere around the world for children under 12. So my son, gorgeous Fred O'Frog, he's 12, and I, for one, will be getting him vaccinated as soon as possible. Because I understand, unlike some of these anti-vaxxers out there, that vaccines don't cause autism. What they do, though, is ensure people with autism don't suffer this serious illness. I'm also pretty sure vaccines uh, contribute to decent spelling and use of uh, correct grammar, but that's a whole other matter for us to discuss at another day. But so what I would like to say to those opposite, and really it's a very, very simple message, I think even those opposite may be able to understand it, please stop the politicking. Please start to back Australians. And to Senator Keneally, be proud of your state. Let's get back to life. Let's get back to travel and help support the mental health of all Australians. Uh, Senator Patrick. On the scientific breakthroughs that we have seen here in Madam Australia. Deputy President, some 45 million Australians have not been vaccinated. Senator vaccine. Patrick, can you start again? There was some um, noise that, and I couldn't hear you. Could you start your, your contribution again, please? Thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President. So, well, 1.5 million Australians have not yet received any COVID-19 vac vaccination. Not Pfizer, not AstraZeneca. Three in four Australians are not yet fully vaccinated. The Prime Minister massively bungled the vaccine procurement, and his government is now engaged in a mad scramble uh, to increase and accelerate, accelerate vaccine shipments from overseas. He will eventually achieve uh, satisfactory levels of vaccination, but it will be many months later than what it should have been. And indeed, 
uh, there will have been great social and economic costs associated with the delay. What is so also particularly worrying is the extent to which the Prime Minister's so-called plan for reopening Australia is being uh, wrapped and accelerated by his political objectives. The declared target of full vaccination of the 80 per cent of eligible adult population excludes one in five adults. That's 4.6 million adults and all children below the age of 16. That's 4.8 million kids. At the 80 per cent level, millions of Australians, including uh, children and teenagers, will not be fully vaccinated and will still be vulnerable to the virus, including potential long term de uh, debilitating effects. There's much argument about the Doherty Institute modelling. However, um, it's hard to avoid the conclusion that the Prime Minister is willfully disregarding the scale of the New South Wales Delta strain outbreak and the spread of the virus amongst children. These factors uh, surely deserve much deeper investigation, more than just one institute, and that analysis should be made public. Uh, in the, in the, it's a case of a looming election policy skewing the Prime Minister's view on this Australians are right to be to question his judgment Senator, in relation Senator to Senator Patrick to your time right has expired Senator Lyons Thank you acting deputy president Well if you listen to the noise coming from the government um, you know you, they're trying to hold everyone else to account except themselves and sure we I think we've heard I can't quite remember Mr Morrison finally admit that um, He's lagging behind in the vaccine rollouts, but let's put the facts on the table. So the Morrison government, the Morrison Joyce government, has failed to deliver to deliver on its promises to vaccine four million Australians by the end of March, 2021. Now, okay, he might have actually acknowledged he failed he, he failed to meet that target, but then he was going to vaccinate all the priority groups and and care workers by Easter. 2021, we know that aged care workers are not fully vaccinated. And that stops clearly at the feet of Mr Morrison and uh, Senator Colbeck. Uh, there was that promise to vaccinate 6 million Australians by the 10th of May 2021. And of course, we've got the um, mandated vaccines now for aged care workers. Uh, to be done by the 17th of September. I can't see that happening myself. And of course, we were going to make sure that everyone over 70 was vaccinated uh, by winter of 2021, and we're just a few days away now from spring. And of course, that big promise to vaccinate all Australians by October 2021. Now, these aren't um, magical numbers made up by the opposition. These are numbers put out there by Mr Morrison. Is it any wonder that we've got vaccine hesitancy in this country when we've got a Prime Minister who can't even meet his own targets? Now, the, the group that I'm now really concerned about, and I heard actually uh, Minister Reynolds on radio this morning talking about the NDIS, and if you'd listened to her, you would think people with disability are lining up all over the shop and able to get vaccines. And that's clearly not the case. Uh, after Minister Reynolds had finished her uh, seemingly apparent trying to hoodwink the Australian community, we had a, a, a mother call up about her child who's got a disability, who's within the age range to get the vaccine, to say despite her going everywhere to try and get a vaccine, the earliest she could get one was October. You know what Minister Reynolds's response to her was? Keep trying. Keep trying. This is the government who's responsible for the vaccine rollout. And we know there's been vaccine rationing all over this country. And what's happening right now in Western New South Wales amongst First Nations communities is quite frankly shameful. And sure, the Premier of New South Wales and Mr Morrison can get up there about their six million. But the reality is those figures need to be broken down because it won't be 30 odd per cent received their first jab in Western New South Wales. It'll be nothing like that. And it's shameful that the Minister for Aged Care uh, and Representing Health said in here today they're doing their best. They should have been on the front foot with First Nations communities, not the back foot. 
And I'd like a map of Australia to show us the appalling rates um, amongst First Nations people for vaccine, and I want to know just exactly what the government is doing about it. Now, in the ACT currently, significant numbers of people are coming down with the Delta strain, and they're under 40, and significant numbers of them are children between the ages of from 12 years on, and we've seen primary schools and high schools have to be shut down. In New South Wales, it's the same. And if we are not now proactively looking at getting vaccines for that age group, for the 12 and up, uh, then again, Mr Morrison, will fail the Australian people. The need is there. We've got disastrous uh, vaccine rollout across this country amongst vulnerable uh, groups and now clearly amongst children. And sure, we're now starting to vaccinate uh, children who've got some sort of disability or illness, but quite frankly, that's not good enough. That is not good enough. Other countries are vaccinating children from the ages of 12. And where on earth is Moderna? Where is it? You know, we've been promised it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Well, I'm sorry, you have failed at vaccine rollout. You should be ashamed of yourselves and finally admit it. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, it is certainly clear that Labor got the memo this week about their key speaking points. With everything else going on, Labor are ensuring they keep it negative. Shock, fear and loathing. Bad vaccination rates, bad PM, blah, blah, blah. Yesterday, it was to quote the PM ab nauseum. Oh, he said it's not a race. How bad is our Prime Minister? Well, they've been harping on about that for quite a while now. They've also been harping on about how the Prime Minister had just two jobs, they say. Well, I'm sure the Prime Minister would love to only have two jobs, but the reality is not so simple as the Australian public are well aware. It is not as simple as Labor delivering their tired sound grabs, and yet they accuse the Prime Minister of being addicted to slogans. It is true that early on in the piece the Prime Minister did say it's not a race because he wanted to keep our public calm. He could have said to the Australian public, don't panic. We have the vaccine. We have a plan. Stay calm. He used different words. Did we get everything right from day one of the rollout? No. And the Prime Minister has admitted that. Did the changing a targi advice throw a spatter, spanner in the works of the best laid plans? Absolutely. But we are not the only country that had to pivot and deal with changing advice regarding different vaccines. And I'm not quite sure what Labor are proposing when they harp on about the fact that we didn't have enough vaccinations early enough. We were also a country with the lowest, one of the lowest rates of infection in the world. Did they want us, as a wealthy Western nation, to push other countries aside and say, give us your vaccine? Atrocious. But while the public were told it's not a race, that does not mean our agencies, our healthcare workers, the vaccination hubs and others have not been racing. Indeed, from a slow start, it is now clear that they're racing like far lap. Per capita, as Senator Holly Hughes said earlier, people in New South Wales are now getting vaccinated faster than the peak of vaccina vaccinations in the US and the UK. Dr Nick Coatesworth tweeted on the weekend that UK was the world model in vaccinations, and now New South Wales is exceeding that. And we're rolling out our ancillary troops. GP clinics across the country have now administered over 9 million doses. Community pharmacies are delivering AstraZeneca. 
The Royal Flying Doctor Service, in answer to Senator Lyon's worry about uh, remote communities and Indigenous communities, the Royal Flying Doctor Service have delivered 22,000 jabs into the arms of our most remote communities through 90 site visits, as well as delivering nearly 14,000 additional doses to remote health services. Even our Defence Force is engaged. In my state, the ADF delivered 1,500 vaccines at a pop-up clinic in Dubbo just last Saturday, one day. We are now delivering well over a million doses a week. In fact, the most recent data shows it took just three days to deliver the last million doses. So we are off and racing, but we don't want to panic the nation. And while this motion is right in that we didn't meet the six million target by the end of May, we are now getting almost that figure out per month. And at current rates, we are on track to have 80 per cent of the over 16 populated population vaccinated by the end of November. But it requires a level of personal responsibility. People need to come forward. So I say to Labor, stop fear-mongering. Stop looking in the rearview mirror. Stop harping on about past targets missed and look at what we are achieving. Look to the horizons. And I say to the 30 per cent of eligible people who are now fully vaccinated, thank you. And I say to those coming to get vaccinated, thank you. We're moving forward. Uh, Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. It is difficult to see the rising COVID numbers in New South Wales. And it is also heartbreaking to watch the New South Wales Liberal government shaming people in certain communities in their theater of compliance because they have failed to control the spread of COVID. And ultimately, Scott Morrison has failed to roll out a vaccination program early enough, and it is having a huge impact. The multicultural communities being over-policed and singled out by the New South Wales government are also now carrying a disproportionate burden of this outbreak. Southwest and Western Sydney are full of essential low-paid workers who carry out the bulk of the needed critical work. They are first responders, grocery store workers, train and bus drivers, delivery drivers, child care workers, nurses, aged care workers, and so much more. Getting their jobs done means that they are shouldering this pandemic while all the time risking exposure to the virus. But rather than thanking the people of Southwest and Western Sydney for doing the work we all so desperately rely on, they get told off, put under curfews, and a heavy-handed police crackdown. This might be a cheaper strategy than proper wage subsidies and income support, but it's also shameful and discriminatory. Overcrowded housing is at its worst in Sydney's West and Southwest, yet the government keeps telling people to stay home rather than providing safe housing for all. The Morrison government's botched up vaccine rollout, mixed messaging and blame shifting has created mass confusion. Despite efforts to divide and paint multicultural communities in a different light, a report by the New South Wales Council of Social Services found that attitudes towards vaccine and multicultural communities mirror those of the general population. I know that low paid brown and black workers might be the easiest of scapegoats for politicians, but shifting the blame onto people of color really needs to stop right now. Just stop. It is not just unhelpful, it stinks of racism and is doing immense harm to so many. Oh, thank you. Uh, Senator Sheldon. Senator Sheldon. Yeah, yeah thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. Well, I'm speaking here from Sydney in our ninth week of lockdown. And I listened to the government senator saying, look at what we've achieved. You've achieved nine weeks. Nine weeks where small business, working people, families are put in an extremely difficult situation as a result of the government's failure to sort out a national quarantine system and to organise an efficient and speedy vaccine rollout. As COVID-19 ravages New South Wales, the vaccine rollout is still months behind schedule. Victoria, the ACT and even New Zealand have been forced into lockdown by the outbreak which began in Bondi. It is unthinkable that 18 months into the pandemic, six months into the vaccine rollout, and nine weeks into lockdown, that many of the most urgent priority groups for vaccines are still being left behind. 
people still waiting outside in the pouring rain for hours at a time to get a vaccine. Just 26.9% of NDIS participants over 16 are fully vaccinated. That is less than the general population, despite them being in phase 1A or 1B in the urgent and high priority groups for vaccine access. Dan Kavanagh, a professor of disability health at the University of Melbourne, has called the rollout for disabled Australians, and I quote, negligent and a failure. So these aren't complaints. This is a call for the government to get its act together and get its act together today. And there, are pregnant, there is a, a pregnant woman who was finding that she can only book a vaccination appointment five months from now, recently reported in the, in the news. This is despite the recommendation from ATAGI in June that pregnant women be urgently vaccinated due to the severe risk of COVID to their health and that of their unborn babies. Then there is a disability and aged care workforce who Scott Morrison promised would be vaccinated by April. Well, it's nearly September and more than 40% of aged care and disability workers are yet to have even their first jab. The Health Services Union has reported that workers have been struggling to access, access vaccines. The HSU says that aged work care workers have had to cancel appointments in order to go to work so that they can put food on the table. That is the reality for a workforce which is 90% part-time or casual. No Australian should be in such a precarious position in their job that they are forced to miss out on critical medical appointments just to get by. When health workers are making so many sacrifices, when they are risking their health and well-being, caring for those who are vulnerable, the least we can do is make sure that they don't have to lose shifts or to pay to make their vaccine appointment. The fact is that small businesses and working Australians, particularly in Western and Southwestern Sydney, are doing it tough during this lockdown. And they call side the business and working Australians in Victoria and the ACT who are being impacted by the Bondi outbreak. And of course, many other parts of the country from not being able to receive um, tourism and uh, exchanges from, from state to state. But when people are doing it tough, they need short-term support and they need a longer-term vision for how we can get a better to a better place. I note a new report by the Community and Patient Preference Research today, which found vaccination take-up is almost five times more likely if a $300 payment is on offer. That's not whinging, that's about solutions. It's just government refusing to do it as a, as a result of uh, the opposition proposing it. Ludicrous. That's exactly what Labor has promised, proposed. And it's about time the Morrison government dropped its ideological opposition to providing financial incentives to vaccination. Mr Morrison certainly has no issues with giving billions in JobKeeper to Jerry Harvey and his pals. I'm sure Mr Morrison can cough up a far, far smaller amount to salvage our national vaccination program, which is still struggling to catch up from his instance, insistence that it isn't a race. Senator Roberts. Senator Roberts. I can't hear you, Senator Roberts. Senator Roberts, can you hear me? You'll, you'll need to... You have to log out and log back in, Malcolm. Yep. So, uh, Senator Roberts, you will need to log out and log back in. And in the meantime, we'll go to Senator Stilljohn. Senator Stilljohn. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. For disabled people and our families, the pandemic has been a time of unparalleled fear and anxiety. Many of us have been trapped inside our homes, scared to go outside since the very beginning of the pandemic. Through this time, we have worked as hard as we can. We have banded uh, together, we have collaborated, we've raised our voice to our state and federal governments. 
and argued, cajoled, convinced, persuaded, presented discussion papers and expertise, and sometimes even pleaded for a plan that would vaccinate us, that would give us what we need to be safe. And from the very beginning of the pandemic, the Morrison government has repeatedly failed to heed our advice, failed to engage with us effectively, and failed to provide us with the protection and the support that we need. At the very beginning of the pandemic, we discovered that there was not a single person in the health department whose job it was to make sure that the initial response supported and protected disabled people. Months into the pandemic, we discovered that there still was not a plan. Months later, there was still no plan. And now we discover that as far as we are into this great crisis, no more than seven than 26 percent of ndis participants have been vaccinated and there are still about half of folks living in residential settings that are yet to be fully fully vaccinated either this is absolutely unacceptable it puts disabled people's lives at risk and it must be urgently <coughs> addressed uh, effectively senator still john your time has expired it expired senator roberts Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Please go ahead. Thank you. The safety of everyday Australians should never be a race on a political scoreboard. Instead, it must be about health and accountability. Yet this government and most people in parliament hastily rammed COVID injections on people. Vaccines are not fully tested and only provisionally approved. Vaccines with serious side effects, even killing people. Vaccines with plummeting efficacy. The injections are already losing their effect. We've been told that we do not need 100% vaccination to protect. Why then do governments, parliaments and big businesses continue to persecute people rightly concerned about this injection? A constituent, Ben, asked a simple question many are asking. If your vaccine works, why does he need one? If it doesn't work, why should he get one? Secondly, Australians have a right to sit this race out. Instead, we're hearing democracy choking, the death of our right to say, no, this is not for me. Without a blush or hesitation, Qantas CEO Alan Joyce threatens the jobs of people who are concerned about COVID injections. Yet the same man signalled the need for IR reform now to protect workers supposedly from abuses of power. Respect people's rights. Restore informed consent, a basic human right. Is it any wonder millions of people now question everything state and federal parliaments say and have reached a breaking point? No, it's expected. The ongoing protest must be heard. Australians have legitimate concerns for health and safety, for jobs and livelihoods, for rights and freedoms. The unions and Queensland Labor, old Labor, used to defend the right to protest. They're a symptom now of the problem from taking away people's freedoms, jobs and livelihoods. In turn, state and federal governments must get back to basics and focus on the virus, not the symptoms. Whether we came here from before Captain Cook, where from Europe or from Afghanistan, we Australians have one flag. We are one community. We are one nation. Senator Roberts, your time has expired. The time for the discussion has expired. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents listed on the order of business on page three and four. So we'll quick, um, item one, Auditor General's report for 2021-22. Documents in response to orders for the production of documents, the Beetaloo Cooperative Drilling, Drilling Program. Senator Watt. Um, I understand, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, Senator McCarthy was wishing to speak on this as well. So if it's okay, I might cede to her first and go after her, if that's okay with you. Thank you. Able to um, move to take note of the um, document, Senator Watt. Um, certainly happy to move to take note of the Senate inquiry report. Right. Thanks, Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, today we have uh, tabled the interim report of the oil and gas exploration and production in the Beedaloo Basin. I certainly urge the Senate to read it. 
it uh, raises some serious concerns. Senator McCarthy, I have sorry, concerns. Senator Mc sorry, Senator McCarthy, we're still in documents. So what we're looking at is a, a letter to the President of the Senate from the Minister for Families and Social Services. So we'll get there shortly. Okay. Senator Watt? Sorry, um, I misunderstood you, Madam Macking oh. Deputy President. I don't seek to take note of this. It'll be the report itself. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> right. Um, so. Sorry, Senator Seward. Sorry, um, Acting Deputy President. Is this the document that was tabled yesterday? It was tabled In on the 23rd of August. Which is that yesterday. was yesterday. Yes, yes. I thought we would discuss that's in response to the OPD. I thought we were discussing that under ministerial statements. It, it can be done there, Senator Seward, and there's ten minutes per contribution. So if you wish to I understand Senator Waters will want to make a, uh, a contribution at that time. Thank you. So we'll just move forward. Um, responses to Senate resolutions. Number, so it's number three, uh, COVID-19 paramed um, paramedics resolution of the 21st of June 2021. International number four, International Day of the Seafarer. Documents pursuant to continuing orders. Number five, Australian Research, Research Council. Oh, Senator Seward. Um, I uh, move to take. Uh, note of that document, and I understand, in fact, that Senator Faruqi would like to make some uh, comments. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I speak to take note of document five in the Senate Order of Business, the Australian Research Council Grant Recommendations, July 2021. Firstly, I must congratulate those researchers who were successful in the current round of DECRA as listed in the document. It is not an easy time to be an early career re researcher in this country, and I hope that you are able to conduct your rigorous academic work that will be of enormous benefit to the community for years to come. But let's be honest about the process for this funding round and the recent Future Fellowships round. It was a flawed one. The rule change from ARC that rendered ineligible dozens of grant applications citing preprint publications has had such a terrible impact on so many researchers, particularly those in STEM. Researchers say the rule change was poorly communicated and does not seem to have any basis in research integrity. For many in the sciences, citing preprints for, uh, of other scholars is a basic an unavoidable part of their work. Some have noted that this rule disadvantages not just the sciences, but those working in fast moving fields of research. It is completely counterproductive to the pursuit of intellectual inquiry, especially in the ever changing research world of 2021. Since the news emerged of this matter late last week, hundreds of researchers have signed letters petitioning ARC to change its approach on preprint publications. As reported in Guardian Australia, the president of the Australian Academy of Science, Professor John Shine, wrote to Minister Tudge that, and I quote, it could easily be argued that a researcher not referencing material found in preprints is not using the full range of contemporary knowledge in a discipline. He also offered the ac Academy's services in developing a new approach a new approach is what is needed, and I hope ARC will listen. It should be mindful that the new rule could also impact applications currently under consideration, and ARC should ensure that those applications do not meet a similar fate. As a former academic and university researcher, I know all too well how difficult it is to apply for these extremely competitive grants when the stakes are so high and opportunities so few. What this saga has exposed is much more than about the use or role of preprint pre publications in academic grant applications. It's hit a nerve about the broken model of research funding in this country. Increasingly, thousands of bright, motivated, curious researchers across the country feel like their contributions are being completely disregarded 
and devalued by a narrow-minded, short-sighted, anti-intellectual government. Over the last 18 months, and even before that, it has absolutely pained me to see so many researchers and academics leave higher education, either because they were forced to, or they see no future in it. It is so depressing, and honestly, it's a disgrace. I will keep fighting for higher education staff and students who still believe we can have world-class, well-funded, fee-free university and TAFE in this country. There is so much at stake and very little time to turn this ship around. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you. Uh, Senator Seward, did you want to seek leave to continue your remarks on number five? Uh, yes, I do want to seek leave to continue my remarks. And if it's okay with the chamber, I'd like to go back to document um, two to seek leave to continue, take note of that and seek leave to continue my remarks okay. as well. So we'll deal with document five. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, so it is leave granted to continue remarks on number two, item number two. Leave is granted. We now proceed to item six, the Department of Home Affairs Protection Visas, number seven, entity contracts for 2020-21, eight, index lists of department, departmental and agency files. We will now proceed to the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Um, Senator Polly. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Chair of the Fine Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade References Committee, Senator Kitching, I present additional information received by the committee on its inquiry into the TPI payment. Thank you. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. I present the interim report of the Environment and Communications Reference Committee on oil and gas exploration and production in the Beedaloo Basin, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. Did you, were you going to speak to it? Yes, Senator? I am. You can continue. Thank you. Well, this uh, report is a very important one because it talks uh, directly to and has gathered information and evidence in relation to not just the Beedaloo Basin uh, and the uh, plans to uh, drill for oil and gas or gas uh, in that area uh, in the foreseeable future, but this interim report uh, went directly to the government's uh, plans to give millions, tens of millions of public dollars over to gas companies to start fracking in the Northern Territory. The Beedaloo Basin gas field that sits south of Catherine in the NT holds around 34 billion tonnes of heat-trapping gases, the equivalent of 68 years of Australia's already high pollution levels. The NT government said that opening up the basin's gas fields will increase Australia's annual emissions by 6 per cent, when we, have been going, <laughs> when we should be going the other way. We have many debates about having to reduce carbon pollution in this country and around the world. And rather than doing that, this opening up and this plan for the government to uh, open up fracking in the Beedaloo Basin is going to make it even harder for us to address climate change and to reduce pollution. Of course, we have until 2030 to halve the world's pollution. Otherwise, we run the risk of setting off chain reactions that will lead to runaway climate breakdown that will be way beyond the ability for humans to get under control. The IPCC report that we've uh, referenced in this place uh, many times over the last uh, few weeks uh, is, of course, a big warning sign that this is the last decade that we have to take serious action to reduce pollution and to get things back on track if we're to reduce and to uh, reduce the risk of temperature rise. Putting aside that this uh, fracking plan in the Northern Territory is a climate bomb, it is also, of course, a trademark dodgy process for this Liberal government. What we've seen uh, is the government put on the table a $50 million grant fund to gas companies to 
go hell for leather in uh, the Northern Territory. We've got spreadsheets marked with electorates. We've got mates looking after mates. We've got fundraising dinners, private jets flying across the Northern Territory, and we've got uh, nice, uh, cosy private dinners with ministers and gas company executives. Uh, this is more cash for Liberal Party mates. At a time, uh, of course, when we've been spending a lot of uh, debate in this chamber and the other place about other types of rorts that this government's involved in, up to their neck in car park rorts and, of course, the sports rorts program. Unfortunately, we hear today that this rort, this gas rort uh, by the Morrison government, is going to be simply waved through. Uh, by uh, the opposition as well. Now that is an extremely disappointing position for the Labor Party to have taken. What we know is that out of this $50 million of public money that the Morrison government wants to hand over to gas companies, $21 million has already been handed and earmarked for a company called uh, Empire Energy. That company uh, has been awarded the 21 million so far, and what the committee uh, in this report and what this report outlines, what we have uncovered, is that this company had the inside track. They were mates of the Liberal Party, mates of even uh, the, the minister, of course, Mr. Angus Taylor, uh, members of the Liberal Party, li lifetime members of the Liberal Party. And of course, what happens is that this company ends up getting uh, the lion's share, 21 million. The relationships between this company, Empire Energy, uh, and the Liberal Party uh, are so thick uh, you could you just you, you, you couldn't uh, you couldn't count the number of ways on one hand. In March this year, the company met with Mr. Taylor privately in his ministerial office. No department officials were there. Eight days later, the grant guidelines were publicly released, showing that the scheme wasn't even merits-based. And the evidence that we've got uh, through this inquiry thus far, and detailed in this report, is that the money was handed out in a first-come, first-served basis. No due diligence was done. The criteria wasn't even met. Uh, of course, though. The key criteria, if you're a mate of the Liberal parties, you can get access to the cheque. Well, so Minister Taylor uh, denies that the, they even talked about the grants, but you know, let's be honest, this is the same bloke who denies that he played with the, uh, the, the reports and the documents from the City of Sydney website. He denies the ownership of Cayman Island-based companies that received $80 million in water purchases from the federal government. I'll leave it to you, Madam Acting Deputy President, as, we, as to whether you believe uh, whether uh, Mr Taylor was involved in this or not and whether he is to be trusted. What we do know is that after this meeting, uh, oh, before this meeting, in October last year, Minister Taylor's personal fundraising vehicle, the Hume Forum, specifically invited this very same gas company, Empire Energy, to attend his fundraiser in Darwin. Empire, of course, graciously accepted the invitation. They paid $4,500 to attend that event. The next day, the company they chartered a private bet, a jet to the site where the well is to be drilled not only included uh, Mr Taylor, uh, but his staff were flown. His chief fundraiser, the head of the Hume Forum, was there as well, Mr Ryan Arnold, as well as members of the gas lobby, the APIA, and the executive director of the Menzies Centre. What on earth were they all do having to do flying out to the uh, well site over there? Well, they were all in attendance. And, uh, of course, what we know is a few short months later, this company ended up getting $21 million of public money. After a big day of jet setting, obviously they were pretty happy with themselves that night. They even went out for a private dinner. Well, who exactly owns Empire Energy, Madam Acting Deputy President? Well, the chair of Empire, Mr Paul Epsey, was described by a cabinet minister, Jane Hume, uh, in Parliament as a friend and a mentor and a doyen of the Liberal Party. He's the chair of the Liberal 
uh, think tank, the Menzies Centre, which explains, of course, uh, why the Australian columnist and Menzies executive director Nick Carter was on board this private jet uh, as well. Mr Espy has donated over $400,000 to the Liberals over the years. Do you see the theme here, Madam Acting Deputy President? Cozy, cozy. Friends, friends, friends. The major shareholder uh, of uh, this um, company is a Tasmanian billionaire, Dale Elphinstone, who has been involved in Liberal Party pre-selection, a regular supporter, and is, caught, is referred to as a lifelong member of the Liberal Party. But the next largest shareholder of this company, Madam Acting Deputy President, and this goes to the lack of due diligence that has done before giving this money, public money, $21 million of taxpayers' money to this gas company. The second highest shareholder uh, is an investment vehicle owned by a Mr Michael Tang, who is a Chinese national who has an outstanding warrant for arrest in Hong Kong for insider trading. Boy, so you've got on one hand mates of the Liberal Party, on the other hand a bunch of criminals and yet taxpayer money is being spent on this rubbish—$21 million of taxpayer money to be spent trying to frack for gas in the Northern Territory at a time when we should be reducing carbon pollution. Now, we could have a debate about whether we should be fracking in the Northern Territory, but what, and of course the Greens' position on that is crystal clear. But what is at stake here and what this report goes to is that despite lack of consultation of the traditional owners, and I know there will be other senators who want to refer directly to that, what I'm worried about is even the process, even the process of handing out this money has been dodgy from woe to go. But rather than standing up to it, I'm very, very disappointed to hear today that the Labor Party is going to let this one slide. Let this one slide, just so they can keep, you know, perhaps their mates in the gas uh, and the fossil fuel industry happy. But boy, oh boy, why on earth would the Labor Party want to let the Liberal government, the Morrison government, Mr. Taylor and his mates off the hook when clearly this stinks of just another Liberal Party rort, and it's also Senator going to cook the Hanson planet. Senator Young, your time has expired. Senator McCarthy, on this question. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I speak to the uh, interim report that has just been tabled in the Senate. $50 million of public monies uh, where we have so many questions, and this report has uncovered that, and you'll see that in the recommendations. Uh, and the recommendations centre around the concerns of transparency, accountability, openness, and the fact that uh, there are so many questions which still remain unanswered. The issue of $50 million, where $21 million has been provided to one company on a merit based. Uh, you know, it, it beggars belief, Madam Acting Deputy President, that millions and millions of dollars can go and be given in such a way. What we heard in this inquiry was important evidence from people who live in the Bengaloo region, people who matter, people who worry about their future, their livelihoods and their families. We heard from very many groups right across the Gulf of Carpentaria, the Bengaloo and Barclay, right up to Arnhem Land. These concerns are very real. Witnesses gave evidence where they have not had the opportunity to do so before. These witnesses matter. We had a witness who comes from the Borrelua region and the Beedaloo region who now is in Dubai, unable to get back to Australia. Her evidence spoke very strongly about the importance of being accepted as traditional owners. These were questions that we were able to also put to the Northern Land Council, which is responsible for being able to look and talk with traditional owners to not influence in any way their decisions, but to ensure that they are aware of what it is that they're agreeing to or not agreeing to. And these processes we have seen took place from back in 2011, Madam Acting Deputy President. 
2011. Even then, families were unaware of what it was that they were agreeing to. And these were the statements that were coming through from the older generation and now the younger generation of people who live in the region, in particular the First Nations people. The fact that $50 million could be so better spent elsewhere was also an important piece of evidence that kept coming through time after time with witness after witness. But perhaps the most important thing, or one of the most important things, is the role of the parliament and the role of the scrutiny of funds and the role of how money is given or gifted. That's the role of the Senate and this inquiry to examine why it is that on one hand, when you have massive failures in COVID vaccination of First Nations people, in closing the gap in terms of First Nations people and health, $50 million can be provided in an area to companies that do not have to meet any particular criteria other than first come, first served. So these are serious questions that this inquiry has to delve further into and will continue to do so as we continue through to March. And it's for these reasons that I have certainly encouraged uh, the Labor senators to consider that. That there is too many things here that need to be answered. There is too much doubt. And allowing $50 million to be given away of funding that comes from the public, monies that can go to other things, has to be seriously considered. Madam Acting Deputy President, I say to the witnesses who have given evidence so far, this inquiry will diligently continue on its path. And this interim report is a very vital piece of information for the parliament both in the Senate and in the House, to recognise how serious the concerns are in relation to this program in the Beetaloo. I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator Walsh. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I uh, also just would like to make a short contribution on this report. I am not and have not been a member of the committee uh, so I have not been involved in the inquiry, but I have followed these issues closely, particularly in my capacity as Shadow Minister for Northern Australia. Um, and I want to recognise all of the members of the committee for the work that they have done in this inquiry, in particular my colleague Senator McCarthy, uh, who, as you just saw, um, has maintained a very close focus on this issue for quite some time, uh, and I know that she has been a thorough uh, and effective advocate for the citizens of the Northern Territory on these issues, in particular traditional owners around the concerns that they have. So I do want to publicly recognise the work uh, that in particular Senator McCarthy has done on this inquiry and even beforehand. Now, uh, it's no secret that in Australian politics today the development of the gas industry is a contentious issue. Uh, there are many who support um, the development of the gas industry, particularly on the basis of the jobs that it can create, the export dollars that it can earn, and other economic benefits. And of course, there are others in the community who oppose uh, the development of the industry, particularly on the basis of concerns around climate change. Um, now, we often hear, and we just heard from Senator Hanson Young, uh, different people's versions of what Labor stands for on these issues. Uh, but I would always encourage people who would actually like to know what the Labor Party believes on a particular issue to consult our platform rather than listen to our political opponents and how they choose to characterise our position. And what Labor's platform says on the matter of the gas industry, among other things, is that we support new gas projects and associated infrastructure subject to independent approval processes to ensure legitimate community concerns are heard and addressed. Labor will ensure the industry assesses and manages environmental and other impacts, 
including on water reserves and coexistence with other agricultural activities, and engages constructively with landholders. Uh, and throughout our platform, there are also a number of references to the need for traditional owners and First Nations people generally to be consulted on uh, developments of any kind, including in the resources industry. Now, quite apart from the gas industry in general, um, the proposed development of the gas industry in the Beedaloo Basin in the Northern Territory is also a contentious issue uh, for the reasons that I've already outlined. Uh, but I do want to draw the Chamber's attention to the fact that uh, the Northern Territory government commissioned an extremely rigorous inquiry known as the Pepper Inquiry, uh, which explored the issues around the development of the Beedaloo Basin a couple of years ago. And that inquiry did put forward 135 recommendations ab uh, about uh, how the development of the Beedaloo Basin should occur. And the Northern Territory government and a range of other parties are in the process of implementing those uh, uh, recommendations now. So I think it's just important to understand some of that background to this inquiry. Now, as I say, I haven't personally been involved in this inquiry, uh, but I'm aware uh, from my discussions with colleagues, especially Senator McCarthy, that um, there are two particularly big concerns that have been raised uh, over the course of the inquiry. The first concerns uh, relate to uh, the level of consultation with traditional owners and First Nations uh, people generally in and around the Beedaloo Basin. Uh, and it does appear that through the evidence of this inquiry that there are some legitimate concerns about how adequate that consultation has been uh, with traditional owners and First Nations people generally by some of the gas companies who are seeking to explore and develop in the Beedaloo Basin. Um, and these are um, concerns that we should all take seriously. And again, uh, looking at Labor's platform, you would expect us to take them seriously, and we do take them seriously. In fact, uh, they are concerns that I have personally raised uh, with the gas industry in very recent times, uh, and I know that other colleagues of mine in the Labor Party have done the same thing. I don't know, for instance, whether the Greens Party have bothered to actually raise those concerns directly with the, the, the gas industry, uh, given that their modus operandi is usually to pull a stunt in here rather than actually seek constructive improvements. Um, now, it's because of those concerns uh, that, this, that the additional comments that have been made by Labor senators in this report um, acknowledge the efforts of the Northern Land Council to consult with a range of traditional owners and other interests over many years uh, around the Beedaloo Basin. Uh, and we urge the government to consider supporting the Northern Land Council to ensure even more rigorous consultation with affected traditional owners and native title interests. These are issues that deserve to be taken seriously, and we hope that the government will take those comments on board. The other, the other big concern that has been raised by a number of people in, over the course of this inquiry is the probity of particular grants that have been made under this program uh, to the value of $21 million in taxpayers' funds. Now, of course, when taxpayers' funds are being provided to private sector interests, whether it be in the gas industry or any other industry, we need to be confident uh, that those grants have been administered and approved uh, on a completely above-board basis. And I think we are right to be concerned uh, in particular about the distribution of these grants, given the evidence demonstrates quite extensive involvement of Minister Angus Taylor, his chief fundraiser uh, and other people with very strong connections to the Liberal Party. Because we need to remember, of course, that when we're talking about Minister Taylor, we're talking about someone who has form. This is Minister Taylor of the water rorts, of the grassland rorts. This is Minister Taylor of well done, Angus. Uh, uh, great job, Angus. Order, Senator, Watt, uh, Senator Brockman. Mr. President, very recently made a ruling that you are not allowed to use language saying that a minister has undertaken rorts. So I ask for that language to be withdrawn. Senator, what my advice from the clerk is, if you could please clarify uh, what you mean in using that language, that might be helpful 
for the chamber. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I understand why members of this government are sensitive when accusations of rorts are put to them, because it is something that is endemic within this government. What I'm talking about is the involvement of Minister Taylor in what have become known as water rorts and grassland rorts. And let's face it, this is a government that is full of rorts. It doesn't just stop with Minister Taylor. We've got the sports rorts, we've got car park rorts, and I'm sure we'll be discovering more before too long. Uh, and it's the fact that these rorts are so endemic in this government that Labor uh, has called for an anti-corruption commission, something the government has not agreed to. Uh, now, this inquiry has heard very concerning evidence uh, about private flights paid for by a grant recipient headed by a Liberal Party Life member, uh, and those flights were taken by Minister Taylor and his chief fundraiser. Uh, those trips coincided with fundraisers for the Liberal Party in the period leading up to the grants being administered. And equally concerning is what seems to be misleading evidence that's been given to the inquiry by a number of witnesses. Now, in particular, some of the things that Labor is concerned about is that Minister Taylor seems to have misled Parliament by maintaining that his office had not discovered, discussed the program with the recipient company prior to the opening of applications, when FOI documents on the industry part department's own website clearly show uh, the opposite. Um, secondly, it appears that in answer to, the question, to a question on notice, uh, the managing director of uh, Empire Energy says that a CLP fundraising dinner was not referenced in its invitation to Minister Taylor uh, when he visited the Northern Territory. There is other evidence, particularly in the Saturday paper, to the contrary. Thirdly, in answer to a question on notice, the managing director of Empire Energy uh, says the company did not discuss the design of the grant program with Minister Taylor or his office, but an FOI return includes an email from Empire Energy to Minister Taylor's office in January this year that refers to discussions about the grant program. Um, and fourthly, in response to a Senate order for the production of documents, Senator Rustin presented an answer which said there had been no correspondence between Minister Taylor and Empire Energy discussing the program when there is FOI evidence to suggest the contrary. So we have at least four occasions when ministers or other witnesses appear to have given misleading information to either the Senate or to this inquiry. And in response to these concerns, Labor will use the Senate inquiry to pursue this apparent misleading evidence from witnesses. What we will also do is move another motion for an order to produce documents this week in this chamber to seek all correspondence relating to Minister Taylor's visit to the Northern Territory. There is a stench around these grants. There is a stench around Minister Taylor's involvement in them, uh, and we deserve to see all correspondence regarding uh, Minister Taylor's visit to the Northern Territory. Finally, uh, because of the concerns that have been raised in this inquiry around the probity of these grants uh, and the potential um, uh, misbehaviour and misconduct of Minister Taylor in particular, Labor will ask the Auditor-General to conduct a performance audit of the grant program, noting the close political connection between Minister Taylor and Empire Energy and drawing the Auditor-General's attention to the presence of Mr. Minister Taylor's chief fundraiser on the site visit and the company's presence at a Liberal Party fundraiser the night before the site visit. These are serious questions involving taxpayers' funds that have been unearthed in this inquiry. They deserve to be taken seriously, and that's why Labor is taking firm action in the way that I've outlined. Thank you, Senator. What are you seeking leave to continue your remarks? I will seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Senator McMahon. Thank you, um, Madam Apping Deputy President. Uh, I would like to point out that the coalition senators involved in this inquiry cannot support the majority report. This report is characterised by overtly political and ideological uh, statements and selection of evidence. Uh, it has resulted in a quite biased report and biased conclusions, and we do not support it at all. In fact, we have a dissenting report which relies solely on um, scientific and factual evidence that was given by organisations such as the CSIRO and Jazeera. The evidence that was picked up and presented in the majority report relied on a lot of unreliable witnesses, uh, a lot of witnesses that didn't even seem to know why they were there or what they were saying. Um, so this is the reason we cannot support this report. Um, the Northern Land Council, in fact, um, one of the, the star witnesses was a lady who gave evidence from Dubai, mind you, gave evidence from Dubai, where she lives, claiming to be a traditional owner. Uh, the Northern Land Council, 
who is the body under the legislation that is charged with identifying and cons organising consultation with traditional owners, uh, gave evidence that this witness was in fact not a traditional owner of the area concerned. And, and the report is just um, uh, punctuated by uh, claims such as these all through it, where these witnesses that were supposed to be um, factual witnesses and giving evidence were actually activist groups, activist groups such as GetUp, who were coaching a lot of the witnesses that were appearing. And uh, a lot of the witnesses who supposedly appeared independently gave strikingly similar answers. Um, and they were the, the same answers that were given by organisations such as the Australia Institute and GetUp. Um, now my colleague Murray over there seems to be pathologically obsessed uh, by Minister order, Taylor. Order, Senator Se Romani, you Senator, Senator yes, Watt. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Watt <laughs> um, seems to be pathologically obsessed by Minister Taylor. Um, in fact, he spoke about Minister Taylor for quite some time and uh, Minister Taylor's trip to the Northern Territory and uh, the fact that uh, he, he cast dispersions about Minister Taylor's involvement. And um, I, I would just like to point out to Senator Watt that you've got the wrong minister because Minister Taylor is not responsible for this program. In fact, Minister Taylor has absolutely nothing to do with this program. This program is administered by Minister Pitt, two completely different ministers, um, two different parties, in fact. And uh, it is, in fact, Minister Pitt that has, has carriage and is the sole decision maker over this program. Now, Minister Pitt was not even there. In fact, he's never been to the Beedaloo. I'd love for him to come, and I open the invitation to him to come. But he's not even been there. So I don't know why Senator Watt is so obsessed by Minister Taylor and is trying to draw him in to what should be a factual report of uh, evidence given by credible witnesses. And, and in fact, he's just using the opportunity to somehow try and, uh, and draw a minister in who's not even involved in the instrument that this inquiry was about. So, um, Senator Watt, I, I, I don't know what your obsession is. I really don't. Um, but you have definitely got the wrong minister. So, you know, if you want to talk about any ministerial involvement in this program, then you need to talk about Minister Pitt, not Minister Taylor. And, you know, just in case you, you need any help, they do look quite different. They are from two different parties and um, they do look after different areas of ministerial responsibility. So I would suggest um, to Senator Watt and to the Labor Party that uh, if you're going to try and incriminate any ministers in um, any of this program, that you at least get the correct minister. So um, as I said, we have a, a dissenting report from the uh, coalition senators that we believe displays the factual evidence that was presented by credible witnesses and uh, would like to point out to the Senate um, to please take our report into consideration, um, please discredit some of the evidence given by Labor about implicating the wrong minister and that um, our recommendations out of this report are, are quite, quite easy. Um, there's two recommendations there. And um, the first one is that we recommend that the NT government complete its implementation of the Pepper review in a timely manner, which is something that came out as part of the evidence that many witnesses gave evidence that um, the issues they had was the fact that the NT government had not implemented the recommendations of the Pepper review as they were meant to. Um, the other recommendation it, that we have is um, that the Beeloo Cooperative Drilling Program Proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, Senator McMahon. Are you seeking leave to continue your remarks? Yeah. Thank you. Senator Brockman. I present the fifth and sixth reports of 
2021 of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works. Thank you, Senator Brockman. I'm in the hands of the Chamber. We progress now to the reports presented out of sitting on page four. If there are no further motions on that, I will move on to Senator Seawish. Um, I'm just checking if I need to seek leave to continue my remarks. Sorry. Um, yeah, could I um, take note of uh, document 10 and seek leave to continue um, my remarks? You may, Senator. Thank Stewart. you. Thank you. There are no other senators seeking the call on any of the reports presented out of sitting on page four. We will progress to ministerial statements. Are there any ministerial statements? Senator Stoker. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I table documents relating to orders for the production of documents concerning the summary for policymakers for the sixth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the Income Compliance Program. Thank you, Senator Stoker. Senator Seawitt. I wish to uh, take note of the document relating to the Income Compliance Program, the response to the resolution of the fourth uh, interim report of the Community Affairs Committee into the robo-debt uh, debar debacle, apparently called the Income uh, Compliance uh, Program. Um, I must say, unfortunately, I am not surprised at the government's response where the documents that the committee sought have not been tabled. Uh, this is the fourth interim report on this matter. The government has, uh, has made repeated claims of public interest immunity. I've got to say, while I'm not surprised, we got this basically same response, a bit of cut and pasting going on, um, by uh, same response, different minister. Um, but I find it shocking, shocking that this government continues to claim public interest immunity over this matter. Previously, it was because, oh, there's a class action going on and it may prejudice or may influence um, the class action. Well, I've got to say, even with that excuse, which the committee rejected, or it wasn't quite uh, so paraphrased as that, I'm paraphrasing, but even then, the community has a right to know. We are asking fairly simple questions, I thought. You know, did the government seek legal advice? Did they seek legal advice about a program that has impacted so many Australians? So many Australians. They actually want to know. They want to know. Did the government ask the simple question? Did they check? Is it actually legal to do what we want to do? Is it legal to send out hundreds and hundreds of thousands of letters to Australians, some still on income support and some not anymore? Sending out, because people move over five to seven years when there was no response, sicking debt collectors onto them in very distressing manners. And I've spoken to many of those people who, have actually, who did actually receive uh, pressure visits uh, by debt collectors. We also heard evidence in the previous inquiry into the robo-debt debacle. But here we have the government yet again claiming the same old, same old, when the committee clearly points out that the grounds on which they claim privilege, and that is that it's generally um, that legal advice is um, not subject to um, they don't release public interest uh, um, they don't release their uh, it's accepted they claim that legal privilege um, as a ground to refuse to provide information we rejected that we've rejected it time and time again as a committee as it states in Odgis, Australian Senate practices 
has never been accepted in the Senate nor in any comparable representative assembly that legal professional privilege provides grounds for a refusal of information in a parliamentary forum. The minister also claims that there's also claims that there's ongoing, although the case, the current class action is effectively resolved, and we heard about that in the hearing in the Senate uh, hearing we had, committee hearing that we had, in fact, on the 19th of um, August. Um, there are still some uh, matters around uh, disbursement of funds, um, but the government's talking about any future cases. The government's talking about any future claims that people, because not everybody um, who was damaged by this debacle was uh, part of the class action. The government's using the excuse that, oh, there may be others, so we're not going to release this legal advice. Let's come back, cut through all the legal um, issues, and I'll come to um, what uh, Mr Gritch uh, lawyer for Gordon Legal, who ran the class action on behalf of all those claimants, um, said to us in the Senate committee in a minute. But when you cut through all the legal mumbo-jumbo that a lot of people will see it as, those that were affected by robo-debt, when you cut through all that, it's quite simply the government won't provide the Senate committee, in fact, this place, this place, because it was a resolution of this place. They won't provide simple things like, did you seek advice? When did you seek advice? You know, like, why won't the government say? A lot of people would say it's very obvious why they won't say, because they don't want to be caught out. Because either they didn't look, they didn't even think to think whether it was actually legal under the Social Security Act. What, did they, they not think about it? Or did they and went ahead anyway? And then when they found they may be in deep trouble, did they then seek legal advice? When did they seek legal advice? What was the nature of that legal advice? Because there's quite clearly here evidence that the government through their very nature of not wanting to provide this advice, has got something too high. The same happens when we ask about, well, when you got the AAT findings, the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, when you got their findings, did you actually talk to the department about it? Did the department take any action about it? Did they inform the ministers? What action did they know? Because did they take? Because if they'd actually looked at what was happening in the AAT, they would have known there was a problem. These are the sorts of things that this government continues to try to cover up by continuing to claim public interest immunity. And, we should talk, and one of the excuses, because it is an excuse, that the minister uses is that um, the, the, this, the, public claims, the claims of public interest immunity were accepted by the court. Now, when we asked about that in the Senate hearings, Mr Gretsch from Gordon Legal said yes, there was, and there were some things uh, you can't um, tell us, and he said that, but yes, there was some claims, but there was a lot knocked out. One of the other documents we're trying to get, the Ombudsman got, and yet the government still won't release that, because that goes to also points to what the government did or didn't know when and what they did about it. Government won't release that. But the government can't hide around, uh, behind the claim that the court upheld public interest immunity. Mr Gregg told the committee, Mr Gregg, sorry, told the committee that yes, there were some documents not available, but a lot of the claims were knocked out. Now, we can't know what those documents were, but the government should tell us what they are. They should come clean and tell this, the people that were damaged and harmed by this illegal program that went on for years. The government should come clean and present those documents. I see it as an insult to this place. 
that the government continues to ignore resolutions of this chamber. It continues to ignore requests for this information by the Community Affairs Reference for Committee. And we will keep on asking these questions. We will keep on pursuing this because Australians have a right to know. All those people damaged by this illegal program have a right to know. So don't think by just churning out the same copy and paste letter that Australians or this chamber is going to accept those because you just don't want to tell, the government just doesn't want to tell the community what really happened. That's in fact why we need a Royal Commission. It's why we need a Royal Commission, so that we can get to the bottom of this issue, because there are so many unanswered questions. I'm really pleased that there's been debts, the, debt, the money that the government illegally claimed have been paid back, but so many people have been damaged. It doesn't provide the compensation for the years of deep distress for the, for the people that were affected and their families and for the people that found it all too hard. We know that this program did contribute to people, and I'll give a trigger warning here, to people taking their lives. And I'm not going to back away from saying that because we have members of the committee have spoken to, and I'm sure other members of this chamber have spoken to families who've lost loved ones. Australians demand Order, Senator more. Senator Seward, your time has expired. Senator O'Neill. Um, thank you very much, um, Acting Deputy President. And I uh, want to endorse the comments from my colleague here in the Senate, Senator Seward, with regard to the important evidence we received in the most recent hearing on the 19th. But to be clear, for anybody who's listening to this, um, buried in the thousands of words that will cover the conversations and the contributions here in the Senate, is one small section on page 3,936 that talks about, uh, in italics, income compliance program order for production of documents. When you read that, if you're not used to reading this sort of language, what that means is robo-debt government cover-up providing documents and failing to do so. That's what that really means. That's a translation in ordinary speak. This is a cover-up of a scheme known as robo-debt that was actually described by one of the witnesses the other day as a shakedown. Now, if you don't know what a shakedown is, the Urban Dictionary provides a pretty good uh, definition of the abuse of power, and that's exactly what we heard. So, to be clear, what we asked for this chamber to do was to receive documents from the Minister for Government Service by today that gave us responses to all the questions that we have put on notice through the committee and have had the support of the Senate in rejecting previous PII claims, everything relating to legal advice of the robo-debt, which has been subject to claims of public interest immunity during the Community Affairs Reference Committee inquiry into Centrelink. We also asked for a copy of the executive minute to the Social Services Minister from back in 12 February 2015. And we asked for a letter confirming that the above responses relating to the legal advice uh, to the executive minute would be provided. We even said, look, we'd do that in camera, which means we'd go behind you know, closed doors and, and get the truth on the record there and then sort of see what was going. None of that, none of that is acceptable. And instead of coming in with a great big load of truth and documents, we got a three-page letter, which is as Senator Seward said, basically a cut and paste of the previous four letters that they've sent to us, contemptuous of the Senate and its rejection of this PII claim on multiple occasions. The government just keeps going, well, we'll wear the Senate down. We just tell them that well, get stuffed, really. That's kind of the, the attitude. You can take your questions and walk out the door because we are just going to show up boldly and boldly and say, no, we're not going to show you. We're not going to give you anything. We are, despite the fact that the government was found to have illegally raised debts against its own citizens, that has been found in a court. Despite that, this government says, move on, nothing to see here. 
Well, there's a big accident that happened. Everybody knows it was called robo debt, and the damage is littered right across the country, into every family. And I just want to um, put on the record a short excerpt of the the interchange that I had with two uh, great Australians, Mr. and Mrs. Mundy. And I said to them, you, know, you sound like you're pretty hardworking, ordinary Australians who go along just doing your business, abiding by the law, caring for your families. We do, says Mrs Mundy. Is that a pretty fair assessment, I asked. Mr Mundy, it's a pretty fair assessment. Never been in trouble, worked hard all our life, brought up four children and done the right thing by everyone. So I, I, I acknowledge that. Because people think the government's created this narrative that people who, who were uh, attacked by them with the robo debt were dodgy. They were the dodgy Australians who just want to rip off the tax. No, these are the people who are attacked by our own government, Mr. and Mrs. Mundy. Ordinary, hard working Australians who've done nothing wrong, never ever had a day's problem with the government or the law in their life. So I said, you've made a pretty significant contribution because Mr Mundy was a teacher, public education. I don't know what schools you've been teaching him. It sounds like you've been pretty good contributors to the community over the course of your lives. Mrs Mundy, we have. What was it like then to find yourself engaged in, is this the first time you've ever found yourself in conflict with your own government? Yes, says Mr Mundy. Yes, says Mrs Mundy. It's been horrific. We've had sleepless nights. We honestly felt like second-class citizens when we had to attend the tribunal. The woman that spoke to us tr treated us like idiots. Every time we went to try to speak, we were asked to be silent. It was like something of a nightmare. Centrelink, the same thing. We've been cut off. You put in complaints, you don't get answers, you think you've solved the problem, then it might go one month, two months, and the same thing happens. It's almost like because you complain, they harass you, you know. Neither of us experienced anything like this in our life. It's just the principle of the whole thing. I feel like if we let it go, what happens to someone else who can't stand up for themselves? That, that is a typical person who was attacked by this government, who was served a robo-debt. Now, the damage and I acknowledge Senator Seward's sensitivity in saying a trigger warning, but I, I've spoken in this place about two amazing mothers who spoke to me on the phone and described the life experience of their sons before they felt they just couldn't go on. And sadly, very sadly, they took their own lives. And if anybody's in a desperate situation, I urge you to seek support. But that is the level of harassment. And, and literally sicken the dogs on its own people that this government went down with. They concocted it. And the mastermind of it, the treasurer at the time, Mr Morrison, now the Prime Minister, who presided over this abuse of government, intimidation, the shakedown of the Australian people, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of our fellow Australians. Mr Morrison was on watch as the Prime Minister and kept it going. Kept it going. No wonder they don't want us to see the documents because this was cooked up really, really badly. The impact has been devastating. Now it got to a point where you know, the people actually got together and they got to a court and the court ruled against the Australian government. And the government have had to pay $1.8 billion back to Australians. But that will never compensate for the damage and the suffering that they've had. Yet this government continues to say, no, you, you don't get a hold of these documents. Governments never give over evidence. They never give over uh, legal advice. Well, that is a lie. That is a lie. Even Christian Porter, even Christian Porter was actually able to release legal advice on the eligibility of Minister Dutton under section 44v, uh, 445 of the Constitution, dated the 24th of August 2018. Back in 2011, Minister Julia Gillard, Prime Minister Julia Gillard advised the House of Representatives that she had made available to the Leader of the Opposition, then Mr Tony Abbott, the advice of the Solicitor General on asylum seekers and offshore processing. There is precedent after precedent in Odgers 
which is the guide to what should happen in this place if the government were only willing to follow some of it. There's precedent after precedent about legal advice being provided. Now, this government continues to say that there's no way they can release this, as Senator Seawitt said, because there might be somebody else who wants to put up another claim. Well, I'll tell you why they need to release it. Because they did such a bad job in the design of this scheme. So badly were they advised by legal practitioners, or so callous were they in their ignorance of advice by legal practitioners, that they concocted an illegal scheme against their own people. Mr Gretsch gave us very, very important uh, information about the settlement of that case and what it means. Once the case was settled, there can be no continuing claim that it's against the public interest to provide this information. Mr Gretsch, who um, was, is a partner at Gordon Legal, said this. The only issues which are extant now, that is, st are still alive now, really relate only to the settlement and the mechanisms for settlement. The issues can't be relitigated in these proceedings. The settlement's approved. So, as you were pointing out, it's hard to see. In fact, it's impossible to see how the government, the Commonwealth, could legitimately sustain a claim with the fact that, while technically these proceedings are still on foot, in the sense they've not yet been discontinued, because the court has to play a supervisory role. That supervisory role relates to the settlement scheme. It's not as though the parties can go back to court and relitigate the issues and that somehow the Commonwealth could be embarrassed or prejudiced by documents that it provides to you finding their way into those court proceedings. So, with all the legal gobbledygook in the world, you can't undo the shakedown that happened. With all the legal gobbledygook in the world, you can't take away the fact that Australians deserve access to the truth. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Seawatt. Senator O'Neill seeks leave to continue her remarks. I'm sure she I does. I do seek also. leave to continue my remarks. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Seawatt. Um, could I also take note of the document related to IPCC and seek leave to continue my remarks? You may, Senator Seawatt. If there are no other senators seeking to comment, uh, take note on. Um, before we move on to uh, committee memberships, I note Senator Wish Wilson, um, you might be seeking leave. You've nodded, Senator Wish Wilson, you are seeking leave. Senator Wish Wilson, you may be on mute. Senator Wish Wilson, given that you are seeking leave, um, we might get you to log out and then back in again, and we'll continue with the program and then, or the agenda, I should say. And if you wish to seek leave at a later point, we'll try and do that then. Great. Uh, we move on to messages from the House of Representatives. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the Counterterrorism Legislation Amendment, Sunsetting Review and Other Measures Bill 2021 without amendment and agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment, Childcare Subsidy Bill 2021. The President has also received messages from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent to four laws, details of which will be incorporated in the Hansard. We might try Senator Wish Wilson again, given I can see he's logged back in. Can you hear me now? We certainly can hear you now, Senator Wish Wilson. Thank You're you, seeking leave. Uh, Acting Deputy. Um, I understand I don't, I don't need to seek leave. I just need to make a statement. The clerk has uh, advised uh, me that that's correct. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. After discussion with the President of the Senate and the clerk of the Senate, I understand uh, a comment, a sentence I made in my contribution this morning could be interpreted as, imp as impugning the character of another senator, and I withdraw any improper imputation that I may have made. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. I call the clerk. Government business order for day number two, Treasury Laws Amendment 2021 Measures Number 2 Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Seawitt. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. 
I rise, I rise to make a contribution to the Treasury Laws Amendment 2021, Measures No. 2, Bill 2021. Uh, Schedule 1 of this bill introduces changes requiring an institution to be either a registered charity or government agency in order to be entitled to um, deductible gift recipient status. While most DGRs are already registered charities, some are not. These are practical changes that will provide for improved regulation, governance and oversight of all DGRs and reduce unnecessary compliance costs. But any sensible reforms are under, the thre under threat by the government's very real and very present attempt to shut down charities um, for speaking out. Charities across Australia are calling on the government to abandon the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission Amendment 2021 Measures No. 2 Regulations of 2021. Under these regulations, charities could be deregistered if they commit or potentially commit summary offences. They could also be deregistered if they fail to maintain internal control procedures documenting their, documenting their resources are not being used to promote minor offences. In practical terms, this means charities could be deregistered for, for example, lawful activity like promoting a rally where people are peacefully blocking the entrance to a business, setting up an email group for a local community group, which um, even without the charity's knowledge and without the charity's knowledge, uses it to plan a peaceful protest involving, say, for example, a minor trespass like a sit-in somewhere. It could be failing to implement or document policies and procedures that control how staff and volunteers may behave. Every single day of every single year, charities do incredible work to support people through unprecedented crises in this country. I don't know how we would have survived or and be surviving the COVID pandemic without our charity sector. Charities are, are seeing people they have never seen before needing emergency food relief and shelter. People enduring lockdowns across the country are exp experiencing unprecedented hardship and mental health issues. This isn't the first time the government has attempted to silence charities. In fact, I've been dealing with the various attempts through this place ever since I've been here. They, could, they would rather charities just deliver services and not address the causes of the need for such services in the first place. How would we get through this crisis without our charities? But the regulation proposed by the government are in, are in danger of putting this vital work at risk. There is no doubt that they will significantly impact the ability of charities to carry out their work advocating for the most vulnerable in our community. The regulations are, in fact, a blatant attack on charities and, I'd very strongly argue, our democracy, because charities are a vital place, have a vital role in civil society and in our democracy. Last week, the scrutiny of Delegated Legislation Committee, Delegated Legislation Monitor in, in that um, monitor number 12 of 2021, noted the committee has significant unresolved concerns about the regulations. The committee is concerned about the obligations imposed on charities to maintain reasonable internal control procedures to prevent the use of their resources to promote another entity's unlawful actions. These obligations will require the ACNC Commissioner to make a substantive judgment and exercise broad discretionary powers without any clear guidance or limitations. There are many outstanding questions that need to be answered, including what objective test will be applied to determine whether a charity has complied with these, regular, these requirements. In what circumstances can the ACNC Commissioner seek advice from law enforcement agencies about compliance with the standards? Most importantly, where is the evidence to show that these regulations are needed in the first place? They are already, there are already adequate protections in place to prevent charities from engaging in unlawful acts. The committee is also concerned about the impact of the regulations on implied freedom of political communication. The regulations may restrict a charity's ability to support or promote certain types of political protest without having committed any unlawful act themselves. The committee has asked the Assistant Treasurer for detailed advice on 
Um, what objective test will be applied to determine whether a charity has complied with the, re with the requirements and how the instrument as a whole does not Im impermissibly restrict the implied freedom of political action. The regulations have serious wide-ranging cons consequences for 59,000 charities across this country. I would like to commend the committee for its commitment to scrutinising regulations closely. The scrutiny of delegated legislation committee is going to continue to scrutinise uh, these regulations and, f and um, think hard about the, and I urge all in this place to think hard about the devastating impact these, these changes will have on charities and the most vulnerable members of our communities. We cannot, we simply cannot afford to abandon our charities at a time when we need them so much. Thank you, Senator Seward. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise tonight to make some comments about uh, this uh, particular uh, T-Lab bill, and, and I want to speak uh, just about the offshore banking unit policy. So the offshore banking unit policy was introduced uh, by the former Treasurer, Mr Keating, in 1987 uh, with a view that Australia would be a, an open, uh, dynamic uh, economy, one which wanted to be a tech and finance centre, one that uh, was um, wanting to attract a sort of business where an Australian domiciled company uh, could be uh, providing financial services to organisations and to people uh, who were not ne necessarily uh, residents onshore. So the principle being you would uh, con conduct your business through an Australian organisation but conduct it offshore uh, to an offshore consumer. Uh, in 1992, uh, it was uh, a 10 per cent, a 10 per cent policy, ta tax policy was applied uh, to this particular uh, offshore banking unit. Now that is a significant discount to the uh, overall corporate tax rate, which today sits at 30 per cent. And so offshore uh, banking unit organisations, uh, subject to the law of Australia, um, have a 20 per cent tax discount on eligible, eligible activities. And again, uh, it is designed for offshore transactions, not available to Australians. Uh, now, th th this is a concept which is not unique to Australia and was put in place wisely by that Labor government because we do have ambition to have a... Um, something's happening up there. We do have an ambition uh, to be a, a clever country, an economy uh, which has a, a large and growing tech and finance centre uh, and one that is able to attract offshore investment uh, in order to create more jobs in Australia in that services sector. And that need hasn't gone away since 1987. In fact, that need is more pronounced than ever. Uh, and so I think the reason we're here uh, looking at the repeal and the closing of the offshore banking unit uh, is because there have been judgments made by the OECD uh, that, th that the offshore banking unit as put in place by the former Labor government, it was a harmful tax practice. Um, now, on that basis, uh, there are many, many countries which have harmful tax practices in Luxembourg and Ireland and Singapore uh, because they operate at significant discounts to the headline tax rates of those countries where they provide services to companies that are doing business effectively offshore. And so I think we need to tread very carefully in the removal of the offshore banking unit, and that's what this bill does. It effectively closes the offshore banking unit to new entrants with a view to grandfathering out the existing users of the offshore banking unit uh, by the end of the financial year of 2022. And that can't be the end of the story because we still want to provide those sort of services uh, in a tax-preferred environment, because our competitors will continue to do so. And so the Treasurer's statement in closing down the offshore banking unit refers to the need to replace the offshore banking unit. And I think that we should be looking to do that over the next 12 months, uh, because there are at least a thousand jobs on the line, mainly in Melbourne and Sydney, which rely upon having uh, some sort of policy certainty here. 
Uh, last year, I commissioned a group of people in the tech and finance centre to give some uh, advice to me in my role as a senator for New South Wales about what we could do to improve the competitive position of the country in this tech and finance space. And the report chaired by former Macquarie banker Mr Andrew Lowe has provided a number of, of options. Now, one of the options that the committee came up with could actually be used to replace the offshore banking unit. Uh, the Lowe committee proposed an idea of having um, an incremental business activity regime, which is an interesting idea. I mean, it would effectively be a, a system which would come in place uh, where companies were relocating to Australia and bringing those jobs onshore from places like Hong Kong. And I think it would be remiss of the Senate to uh, ignore the geopolitical and economic changes that are happening in our region, uh, especially in relation to Hong Kong. I mean, Hong Kong um, is going through the greatest disruption in terms of its, its legal stability, um, given that it now has uh, the draconian national security law from Beijing uh, applying in Hong Kong, um, which is going to, I think, in the long run, chill foreign investment in that jurisdiction. So when you look around our region, and you, you think of Singapore and you think of Hong Kong as strong tech and finance hubs, um, the instability in Hong Kong should be an opportunity for Australia to try and capture some of that growth. So what we shouldn't be doing is trying to close down avenues where Australia can attract that growth and investment and jobs from places like Hong Kong. And so I think the, the timing of this, the removal and the closing down of the offshore banking unit at the behest of the OECD, where you think we'd have perhaps a bit more purchase now, um, really does need to come with um, a strong commitment that the Treasurer has made to replacing the OBU. So uh, the Low Committee has come up with one option, which is an incremental business activity regime. Uh, the Senate Committee that I'm chairing will also look at, at options. But it, it is a, a very important principle that we don't get bashed up by multilateral institutions uh, that take away our capacity to be competitive and leave the capacity to be competitive in other countries, um, largely in Europe. And so I think this is a very important principle, principle for Australia to be committed to dynamic policies like the offshore banking unit, which was put in place, uh, and all credit to Mr Keating for doing it, um, some 30 years ago. And so the, the way forward on offshore banking unit um, has to be that we're, we're, we are going to be at least as competitive as Singapore, um, at least as competitive as, as Ireland, at least as competitive as the UK in relation to finance and banking services. Now, I'll make one final point, and that is that um, there's been much discussion through the OECD recently as well about the, the new global commitment amongst OECD member nations to a minimum tax rate, a 15 per cent minimum corporate tax rate. Now, if we had a minimum global tax rate of 15 per cent, which would be half the Australian statutory rate, um, and that was applying to the offshore banking unit, which is to be abolished in the next two years, um, I don't think that would be a great problem. I think you would, you would find that those 1,000 jobs that are hanging off the offshore banking unit today um, would be there tomorrow um, if you were to ratchet up the tax rate by 5 per cent. So what, what I am very, very anxious that we must be doing over the next 6 to 12 months is looking at the options to replace the offshore banking unit, because as this bill goes through, and I expect it will go through both chambers, um, the offshore banking unit will, will, be, will be closed. It will be uh, due to close in 2023, and so it is critical that we provide a commitment to the people that are employing these 1,000 Australians, mainly in Sydney and some in Melbourne, that there will be an arrangement that retains the competitiveness that they enjoy today in some form. And we need to look at the options that were flagged by Mr Lowe, and we need to look at the options um, that may fall out of having a minimum global tax rate that has been flagged by the OECD. And we need to do that over the next six to 12 months because the clock will run down very quickly. There will be many other distractions over the next six to nine months, I'm sure. Uh, and it's very important that we, that we value these jobs in services 
just as much as we value the jobs in coal mining and other parts of the economy. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Deputy President. I rise to speak to the Treasury Laws Amendment 2021 Measures No. 2 Bill. This bill, as colleagues have pointed out, undertakes largely technical amendments via two schedules. And the first concerns the regulation of charities, and the second concerns the tax treatment of offshore banking units. And as my colleague Senator Watt uh, explained in the contribution he made earlier, although Labor supports these changes, they are sensible changes, we will be taking the opportunity presented in this bill to address other very serious problems created by the Morrison government in respect to these two policy areas. It's ironic, really, that the government has described the charities' provisions as an opportunity to support and strengthen the charity sector. Because, in fact, the charity sector is under incredible attack, regulated by a person who is, by so many words and so many deeds, demonstrably unsuitable to occupy the position of charity regulant. The government now plans to give him further powers further powers to persecute those charities that are not, it seems, of a flavour that the government likes. The government proposes to extend the ability of the Charities Commissioner to deregister a charity for a summary offence or because the Charity Commissioner anticipates that the organisation will commit a summary offence. It is draconian, it is unnecessary, and as group after group after group has pointed out, it will lead to unconscionable anomalies in the way that charitable organisations are run, enormous amounts of red tape and an unfair exposure, an unfair regulatory exposure, which does nothing to strengthen the charity sector, can only weaken it. And it's indicative of a government led by a man with a glass jaw. Mr Morrison hates criticism. He cannot deal with criticism. You can see him seize up when he's even asked a question, especially a question asked by a lady journalist. I've seen it happen. And so it's not surprising that he seeks to muzzle those organisations that might advocate for the people who don't have very much, might advocate for people with disabilities, might advocate for the environment, might advocate for future generations that like, would like a climate that they can live in safely. Not surprising that Mr Morrison doesn't like some of the arguments that are put forward by Australia's charities, but unacceptable that he would seek to regulate them in the way that is proposed. And Labor stands with the charity sector. That is being unfairly targeted in this way. And it's why we are moving a second reading amendment, calling on the Senate to note that the government is pursuing these changes to charity law that could stop charities and churches from speaking up for core principles and articles of faith in civil society, limiting their freedom of political communication, limiting their participation in our democratic system. This is not in Australia's interests, and it's on that basis that we move the second reading amendment that I believe has been circulated or is shortly to be circulated in my name. Turning to Schedule 2, this is the schedule of the bill that amends the Income Tax Assessment Act to remove the pre preferential tax treatment that is provided for offshore banking units and provides transitional arrangements for those existing offshore banking units. In 2018, the OECD Forum for Harmful Tax Practices determined Australia's OBU regime to be a harmful and preferential tax regime. In response, the regime will be closed to new entrants. Existing participants will be allowed to use this tax treatment until the end of 2022-23. It's good. It's good that the government is finally cracking down on the schemes that let multinationals take advantage of our tax system. It only took them three years. Like so many things with this government, they are never, ever quick to move. But it's better late than never. But there is more to do. And it's why the second reading amendment that I referred to earlier calls on the Senate to recognise that the government has failed to curtail the use of tax havens and tax avoidance schemes by multinational corporations. And accordingly, Deputy President, I move the second reading amendment uh, that 
I understand has been circulated, although I concede I do not have one on my desk. Thank That's you. all right. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you. Um, the, as the leader of the Labor Party has flagged, uh, Labor will have more to say about multinational tax ahead of the next election. But I do also, in this speech, uh, wish to foreshadow a substantive amendment that Labor will be moving during the committee stage relating to job seeker transparency. Earlier this year, we found out that $13 billion in JobKeeper went to firms that increased their turnover during the pandemic. It went to Monaco-based billionaires, men's-only clubs and the highest fee private schools in the country. And this is a shocking waste. $13 billion is more than the government spent on the childcare subsidy last year. It is more than the government spent on public schools last year. JobKeeper was supposed to support firms that were suffering. It was supposed to support workers whose jobs were at risk. It was never meant to go to firms whose profits were rising. It was a good idea. Labor argued for a scheme which would support people's connection to their workplace during the worst phases of the pandemic, but it was implemented very, very badly. And if the Morrison government had avoided this waste, it could have afforded to extend the JobKeeper to the one million casual workers who missed out on any support. It could have saved people from losing their jobs. It could have saved those many young people, those many women in the hospitality and retail sectors that missed out. It could have saved them from losing jobs and livelihoods during the pandemic. And if this waste had been avoided, we would have more to spend on supporting Australians currently in lockdown those struggling to pay rent and put food on the table. The Prime Minister has never asked any of these companies to pay back a single cent. He says that calls to pay JobKeeper back are the politics of envy. Now We know what the answer to this problem is, something that the Liberal Party is apparently entirely allergic to, and that is transparency and accountability. Transparency is not a radical solution in this context. Both New Zealand and the United States keep public databases of companies that receive income support. It doesn't make a difference. Well, in the early months of JobKeeper, 15 per cent of the money went to firms with rising earnings, and some companies have repaid, with repayments totalling $225 million, about a quarter of a per cent of the total. But almost all of those repayments have come from public companies. And what's the significance? Those, of course, are the companies whose JobKeeper receipts had to be reported in their annual reports. Those were the companies exposed to some measure of public scrutiny. In New Zealand, which has an online register listing all recipients of their wage subsidy scheme, around 5 per cent has been repaid. It's a very big difference, isn't it, to the very small amount that has been offered back here by those companies who did pretty well. And this is most likely a result of greater transparency. And Labor has been calling for more transparency for a long time. It's why we were happy to support an amendment that Senator Patrick moved in the last sitting fortnight. Unfortunately, that amendment was to the bill providing support for people in lockdown. The government is so opposed to transparency that it's pretty clear it was willing to play chicken. Play chicken with that support for people in lockdown to avoid the consequences of scrutiny on their waste, on their mismanagement. And there was a chance that insisting on the amendment here in the Senate would have delayed support for those in lockdown, including thousands in Western Sydney. It says something about this government, that the Prime Minister was prepared to let the livelihoods of Australians on COVID support payments become collateral damage in his fight against the transparency that the Senate has demanded of his government. It's an outcome Labor doesn't want to risk. But we strongly believe that the public deserves to know how its money is being spent. We were, and we remain, committed to finding other opportunities to force the government to be more transparent about JobKeeper payments. And I will have more to say about Labor's amendments during the committee stage. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Brockman. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I too rise to speak on the Treasury Laws Amendment 
2021 Measures No. 2 Bill 2021. Uh, and in particular, I will um, spend most of my time um, this evening speaking on the deduct deductible gift recipient status uh, element of this bill. It does have two schedules. I'll just note uh, the second schedule regarding offshore banking units, I believe, is, is largely uh, uncontroversial and is um, agreed by uh, everyone in this chamber. I hope, I hope that is the case. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, dwelling there. However, I will uh, address some of the issues just raised by Senator McAllister, and I will remind the Australian people that, again, that, that a little more than 12 months ago, we were entering a pandemic, uh, the likes of which we had not seen for 100 years, the economic outcomes of which we could not guess, um, the level of uncertainty in those first few months of last year were extraordinary. Uh, in setting up the JobKeeper scheme, the government did allow businesses to bake it, base it on what they felt was going to happen into the future. Uh, this was done for a very good reason. In situations like this, confidence, confidence is absolutely key to maintaining and bouncing out of the negative impacts, maintaining high levels of confidence to maintain economic activity, and then to have the ability for companies, companies through maintaining a link to their employees, but the confidence of those business leaders, those managers, to actually bounce out of the, 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 the negative impacts of a one in 100 year uh, a, a global event of very significant economic proportions is willfully ignored by those opposite. Confidence was, right from the beginning, always going to be key. Confidence that by closing the borders rapidly and early, as the Morrison government did, we would protect the health of Australians. Confidence that acting in a strong way uh, to protect uh, businesses, um, uh, economic underpinnings and to protect the links of those businesses with their employees was a part of sustaining that confidence in the Australian economy and in the, the, um, the business sector and in, in the, the hard-working Australians who wanted to stay connected to those jobs, who wanted to stay connected to the employees. Now, it was a compact with business. They had to um, they had to make a projection as to what the thought the negative impact on their businesses be. And did all those businesses get that projection correct? No, they did not. In fact, because of the swift actions this government took in doing such things, difficult things, things that were recommended by others in the international stage that we should not do, like closing our international border very quickly with, at first, just Wuhan, then wider China, then to other affected areas around the globe before finally, unfortunately, having to close our international borders um, to pretty much the rest of the world. Uh, in doing so, obviously, it was, that was always going to have a dramatic impact on the economy. Add to that, add to that, the internal lockdowns that we faced over a period of time, unfortunately, still going on today. Unfortunately, still going on today. So we have a rolling economic impact. We have government acting strongly, decisively, in the face of an economic crisis, the likes of which the, the, the nation has not seen since the Great Depression acting strongly and decisively to allow those businesses to estimate where they would be and in good faith say, you do the right thing. You keep your employees connected to this workplace and we will underpin that through the JobKeeper program. And that is what occurred. And now, subsequently, uh, quite frankly, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, what is a bit of a political stunt that those opposite obviously uh, revel in, um, they want to now seek to look at those rules retrospectively. Now, I think that the government made it very clear right up front what the rules of that initial phase of JobKeeper were. They changed over time. 
that was done at a particular point in time with a particular set of circumstances, and the rules were very clear. And this government stands behind them. Um, and I think, and I will get on to deductible gift recipient status, uh, 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 um, Deputy President, but um, I, I, I think that that economic underpinning that we put into our society not only protected jobs, it not only protected our, um, our for-profit economic sector, if you like, but it also uh, did an extraordinary amount to allow our, our not-for-profits, our charity sector, our deductible gift recipient um, status organisations to actually continue their work as well. It kept a level of activity and certainty and confidence in the entire Australian economy that stretched not just through the for-profit sector but into the not-for-profit sector, into our civil society. It allowed Australians to continue um, to a great degree uh, to supporting those charities and organisations that they wished to support. Now, I do wish to um, get to the actual provisions of this bill. Uh, the bill makes a number of changes to tax law to implement reforms to the administration and oversight of organisations with DGR, deductible gift recipient, status. DGR uh, organisations are those which can receive donations that are tax deductible. If a donation is tax deductible, donors can deduct the amount of their donations from their taxable income when they lodge their tax returns. The Australian Taxation Office is responsible for decisions on DGR endorsement. Schedule 1 of the bill amends the Income Tax Assessment Act 1997 to require non-government entities seeking endorsement as a DGR to be a charity registered with the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profit Commission or be operated by a registered charity. Ancillary funds and specifically listed entities will continue to be exempt from this requirement. The requirement to be a charity already applies to the majority of the general DGR categories in Subdivision 30B of the 1997 Tax Law. Currently, for the remaining 11, 11 DGR categories, the requirement to be a registered charity or government agency does not need to be satisfied for the fund, authority or institution to be entitled to DGR endorsement. As charity registration is not a precondition for DGR endorsement for these categories, but it is for other categories, there can be an inconsistent governance and reporting requirements for these DGRs. Making charity registration a precondition for DGR endorsement across all the general DGR categories will improve the consistency of regulation, governance and oversight of DGRs, while also reducing unnecessary compliance cost. When the amendments take effect, DGR applicants will generally have to register as a charity with the ACNC before applying for DGR endorsement. There will be streamlined processes to allow DGR applicants to lodge a single application with the ACNC seeking charity registration and indicating their intention to be endorsed, endorsed as a DGR or as a DGR for the operation of a fund, authority or institution. Once the ACNC is satisfied that an, the applicant is entitled to be registered as a charity, the ACNC will pass on the necessary information to the ATO to assess the applicant's entitlement to DGR endorsement. The amendments include a 12-month transition period which will provide non-charity DGRs with the time to meet the requirements for charity registration without losing DGR status. Eligible DGRs may also have access to additional three-year transition period. Improved consistency, governance and oversight of DGR entities will ultimately help support continued public confidence and to support the sector and DGR entities. And I think this last point is absolutely imperative for, for those out there listening to this debate to understand. There is a level of confusion uh, within the general public about what all these various categories mean. What is DGR versus what is a charity? Um, this, clarifying this and making it very clear that um, everyone has to fit within this governance framework will enhance the way that yeah, yeah. charities are viewed, will enhance the status of those organisations within the general public's eye and will actually improve confidence and improve the sector over time. Now, now once again, I'll, I'll just return to where I started. 
This government is committed to having a very strong charities and civil society. It's why we have done many of the things that we have done over the last 12 months. Uh, it's good to see that uh, this legislation is before us now. It's um, very clear that, contrary to what those opposite have been saying for the last few weeks, this government uh, is capable of doing many things at once and doing many yeah. things very well. So, uh, with those few short comments, I thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Sheldon. David, thank you, uh, Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Treasury Law Amendment 2021, Measures No. 2, Bill 2021. <coughs> Labor supports the two schedules of this bill. Schedule 1 makes some minor changes to the Income Tax Assessment Act to require non government entities seeking endorsement as a deductible gift recipient. To be a charity registered with the Australian Charities and Not for Profits Commission or to be operated by a registered charity. This measure to improve the consistency of governance and oversight of deductible gift recipients is a small but welcome change from Mr Morrison's ongoing war on charities. Mr Morrison's war on charities has ramped up in the recent weeks. With the unveiling of new regulations that would allow Mr Morrison's charity commissioner to silence and deregister charities for criticising Mr Morrison or for speaking out on their core issues. This silencing of opinion in dissent is something you might expect from Xi Jinping in China or Putin in Russia, not here in Australia. Because Mr Morrison has introduced these changes as regulations rather than a bill, they, not, they need not even to need to be approved by parliament. It is anti-democratic, it is chilling. So what exactly do these regulations say? They say that any Australian charity can be deregistered and shut down if a single employee or volunteer engages in any unlawful contact. That includes minor trespassing or vandalism. And not only that, but charities can also be deregistered and shut down if they fail to ensure the resources are not used to promote or support this conduct. So what does this mean in practice? Well, some of the most highly respected charities in Australia have shared examples of conduct that might now mean they can be shut down for good. The ACT Council of Social Service CEO, Dr Emma Campbell, said, and I quote, if enacted, these new regulations will mean that charities could be deregistered for the most minor of offences, such as blocking a footpath at a public vigil or placing a sticker on a lamppost. The CEO of the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service, George Silvani, said, under these laws, the Aboriginal Legal Service could be deregistered if one of our employees attended a protest organised by a third party and temporarily obstructed traffic during that protest. And also Nicole Hornsby, Executive Director of Baptist Care Australia, has decided the measures, as I quote, totally unreasonable. Because the list goes on, CEO of Finney's, Toby O'Connor, says, and I quote, the administrative burden of monitoring all their activities is enormous and not warranted. Unlawful acts are already covered by existing criminal law. These changes increase red tape for no good reason. Casey Chambers, the Executive Director of Anglicare Australia said, and I quote, this is silly and it's going to have consequences which will not be good for anybody. Who they'll come after first is anyone's guess. An open letter by including Amnesty International and the Fred Hollows Foundation says, and I quote, our reputations can be harmed, our boards could be stood down and replaced, and at worst, we could be deregistered as a charity. In times of crisis and disaster, we want to say, will we forced to slow down our response and seek advice on possible risks created by these unnecessary proposals? These regulations must be abandoned. The work of Australia's charities should not be stifled when the country needs us the most, they said. So there you are, the ACT Council of Social Services, the Aboriginal Legal Service, Baptist Care, Anglicare, Vinnies, 
Fred Hollows Foundation and Amnesty International all roundly opposing these regulations. These are the groups that Mr. Morrison is trying to crack down on and 60,000 other charities. The government's own Treasury review recommended that the existing regulation around unlawful conduct should be scrapped. So the laws as they are were already deemed too harsh by the government's own review. And instead, Mr. Morrison wants to dramatically increase the restrictions on charities. We all know why this is happening and it needs to be called out. Mr. Morrison does not want charities, those who advocate and support the most vulnerable people in Australia, disagreeing with his callous and harmful policies. Whenever Mr. Morrison introduces laws which attack vulnerable Australians, such as his deadly robo-debt policy, he does not want charities to speak out on their behalf. It is the exact same approach the Morrison government has long taken towards trade unions. Because ultimately, in Mr Morrison's Australia, charities, trade unions and the shrinking middle class are on one side and he is on the other. Schedule 2 of the bill amends the Income Tax Assessment Act to remove the preferential tax treatment provided for offshore banking units. Offshore banking units are effectively a tax loophole for financial uh, services companies to provide banking services to offshore customers. Labor supports this move and it's almost at the least that the Morrison government could do to address corporate tax avoidance. After eight years of this government, we still have a third large companies in Australia paying no tax on their profits. And when Mr Morrison and his colleagues were in opposition, they voted against the laws that Labor government proposed to begin closing tax loopholes. That brings me to the groups Mr Morrison is actively trying to protect and shield from criticism. The billionaires who have been wrought in the public purse through JobKeeper. Labor is moving an amendment to this bill to create a transparent register of firms with an annual turnover of more than $10 million that receive JobKeeper. Mr Morrison's JobKeeper system is unique. It is the only system of its kind in the world that was introduced with zero, zero transparency. In New Zealand, there is an online register listing all the firms that received their equivalent of JobKeeper. Of course, as a result of that, many New Zealand companies, which actually increased their earnings during the pandemic, have paid the money back. Now, here in Australia, there is no, no online register. There is no requirement for highly profitable companies to pay the money back. The Morrison government has been fighting tooth and nail to stop the Australian public from seeing what it has been doing with their money. Now, we have barely scratched the surface on companies that actually increase their profits by receiving JobKeeper. Thankfully, to ASX reporting requirements, we do at least know about ASX listed companies that have rorted the system. In fact, according to the corporate our advisory group, Ownership Matters, nearly 90% of JobKeeper that has been returned has come from public companies. This shows that transparency does cut out the rorting. But there are plenty of highly profitable companies that have refused to pay that money back. And there we will be many, many more that we still don't even know about. Because Mr Morrison opposes JobKeeper transparency and he supports companies being allowed to use public money to pay dividends, pay down debt and pay executive bonuses. So we know who the losers in the Morrison economy is. Middle class Australians who are suffering through eight years of record low wage growth, who are seeing their jobs made insecure and who no longer have <coughs> middle class pay for middle class jobs. Now we know charities are losers in, the Mor in Mr Morrison's economy. Is threatened to shut them down for even the most trivial infringements. And we know small businesses in Western Sydney are another of Mr. Morrison's losers because they are suffering through a month of lockdown because of this botched vaccine rollout. But who are the winners in the Morrison economy? They're billionaires, of course. And Mr. Morrison's top winner is Jerry Harvey. Harvey Norman 
more than doubled their profit during COVID-19 while receiving $22 million in JobKeeper. Jerry Harvey did not even have to lift a finger to receive that $22 million, which is many times more than the vast majority of Australians will make in their lifetime. Did Mr Morrison even ask him to pay it back? Of course not. Jerry Harvey took that public money and paid himself a $78 million dividend. This is the same Jerry Harvey who once said, and I quote, you could go out and give a million dollars to a charity tomorrow to help the homeless. You could argue that it's just wasted. They are not putting anything back into the community. You are helping a whole heap of no hopers to survive for no good reason. They are just a drag on the whole community. It helped to keep them alive, but did it help our society? No. Society might have been better off without them. That's Jerry Harvey's views. Well, I think society would be better off without million billionaires like Jerry Harvey leeching off the public purse. These are the sorts of vile, sneering billionaires that Mr Morrison is running a protection racket for. Of course, Jerry Harvey isn't Mr Morrison's only winner. There are other billionaires. James Packer, who's worth $4.69 billion, received $110 million in JobKeeper through his company Crown. John Gandall, who was worth $5.4 billion, received $11 million in JobKeeper through his company Vicinity Centres. And Brett Bundy, who was worth $2.2 billion, received $6.48 million in JobKeeper through various retail brands. And of course, there is the Pokies King Lenny Ainsworth, worth $4.42 billion who received $11 million in JobKeeper through his company, Aristocrat Leisure. And of course, Aristocrat uh, went on to pay dividends of $63.9 million to shareholders. That's our money. Now, these are the big winners in Mr. Morrison's economy. The billionaires who are only ever after a quick phone call away from a big public cash out from Mr. Morrison, with no expectation they will ever have to pay it back. At the same time, Mr. Morrison has instructed Centrelink to chase more than 11,000 workers who received JobKeeper with debt recovery notices. Those 11,000 working Australians are being hounded by alleged overpayments of JobKeeper. Now, how disgraceful is that? And this gets to the core of why Mr. Morrison is so opposed to any transparency around JobKeeper. Because the truth is that JobKeeper is the biggest corporate and billionaire welfare wrought in Australian history. Mr. Morrison and his mates like Jerry Harvey can never again sit on their gilded thrones and complain about doll bludgers or welfare recipients. Because Jerry Harvey is the biggest doll bludger in Australian history. And if the Australian public was ever given a glimpse at the scale of the rorting that Mr. Morrison has allowed through JobKeeper, would be a national disgrace on par with his box botched vaccine rollout. So I urge the Senate to support Labor amendments to force some desperately needed transparency into the JobKeeper scheme. I note Senator Patrick and others on the crossbench have also been advocating for greater transparency in JobKeeper. It appears that the Australian Parliament is in fact very unified around this cause the exception of the Liberal and National Parties. I don't know how many of members or senators of the, the Liberal and National Parties can go back to their electorates and tell them that with a straight face that they are coming to Canberra to represent their interests. If they're going to stand there, here, there today and vote against this measure, that would increase transparency around JobKeeper rorting. If they are going to go to Canberra and say, no, Jerry Harvey deserves that $22 million welfare payment, he earned it. Mr Morrison may be able to do that with a straight face, but I would hope that some of his colleagues could not. Mr Morrison is, of course, a seasoned veteran of talking out at both sides of his mouth. He runs scare campaigns about debt and deficit while racking up the largest debt and deficit in Australian history. A trillion dollars in debt, thanks in large part to the billions he handed out to billionaires in JobKeeper. 
Mr Morrison says that the Australian government could not afford to provide JobKeeper to casual workers, while giving Jerry Harvey $20 million in JobKeeper. Mr Morrison says highly profitable big businesses should not have to pay JobKeeper, while handing, pounding 11,000 welfare recipients with JobKeeper debt recovery notices. On vaccines, lockouts, lockdowns, bushfires, aged care, the NDIS, sexual harassment at work, and labour hire in the mining sector, the list goes on and on. Thank Australians you, Senator Sheldon. Your time has expired. Senator Scar. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I must say that I uh, always like following Senator Sheldon, but on this occasion his rhetoric wasn't as bright as his jumper. It was a, it's a beautiful blue jumper. I saw you um, on the TV screen, Senator Sheldon, and uh, I thought, where's that? What's that, that little tender blue in the sky? And it was uh, Senator Sheldon. But um, uh, it's always good to uh, follow Senator Sheldon. Um, and I'm also pleased, I might say, Madam Deputy President, Senator Seawitz in the, uh, in the chamber as I, um, as I make this contribution. And if I can say this to Senator Seawitz during this week, um, if Senator Seawitz was to speak, and I'm not sure if you are speaking uh, on this legislation, can I say to you, sorry? Well, I, can I say to you, Senator Seward, I anticipate that I could. I know what you had said, and, and you would have said it with the great passion uh, you bring to all the debates that um, you bring to this place. And I really uh, pay tribute to you as a, a relatively newcomer to this place. I mean, you've been a great example for everyone to follow. I guess maybe I should say something nice about all the senators in the chamber, but I'll, uh, I'll, uh, and I, I won't say it's going to get progressively harder as I go around the chamber, <laughs> but because um, it wouldn't. Um, but uh, I should get back to the uh, the topic for discussion, which is, uh, of course, uh, the legislation which we're talking about today, which deals with charities. If I can, if I can just talk one moment about this issue with respect to JobKeeper, and I, I just want to flip it. I want, to, I want to make it a positive. Let's make the, the negative a positive. Tony, Senator Sheldon made some negative points, and I, I take them on board. But let's talk about some positive points with respect to JobKeeper. The first point is it was a massively successful system. It was a game changer. It absolutely was a game changer, game changer when this pandemic first hit Australia. It was an absolute game changer. And I think we as a country, both sides of parliament, all of us should be very satisfied with the impact that JobKeeper had in saving hundreds and hundreds of thousands of jobs and making sure that businesses, small and large, could keep operating. That was just so important. And I, like many representatives in this place, would have, have met people, business people uh, across Queensland who described what it was like when they were under such stress at that time, and then the announcement of JobKeeper arrived, and it just was transformative. They saw a future. So let's, let's take a moment to reflect on how successful the system was, how successful the policy initiative was. So let's do that first. Second thing to note is what's being discussed here isn't a question of companies going outside the realm of what was permitted by the JobKeeper legislation. And it should be noted. It should be noted at the time companies were applying for the JobKeeper uh, incentive. At that point in time, no one knew what the future was going to be like. Companies didn't know whether or not they were going to be profitable in the eight or nine or ten months ahead. They just didn't know. The policy was available for them. It was intended to be a generous policy. It was intended to be proportionate. It was intended to be limited in time frame, but it was intended to get the money out there as quickly as possible, and it was successful. And the companies who applied for those JobKeeper payments didn't know what the future held for them. Third point I want to make is let's talk about some of the companies who did, in fact, who have, in fact, paid back some of the JobKeeper which they've received. And I think we should take a we should take a moment in this place to acknowledge those companies to acknowledge the companies who considered in their own circumstances, and I don't know all of their circumstances, but I think we should acknowledge some of the companies who have repaid JobKeeper payments to the Commonwealth, to the Australian people. And I just want to mention a few at this point in time and call out to them and congratulate to them, because I think their example is a shining bright example for all Australians. The first one is CIMIC. They received $20 million of JobKeeper payments, repaid $20 million. Iluca Resources 
received $13.6 million in JobKeeper payments and repaid $13.6 million. Santos received $4 million, repaid $4 million. Domino's Pizza, I wouldn't know who they were, never heard of them. They re don't laugh too loud, Senator Hume. They received $0.8 million and, re and repaid $0.8 million. Adelaide Brighton received $0.2 million, repaid $0.2 million. Toyota apparently received $18 million and repaid $18 million. And that, sorry? Oh, what a feeling, Senator Smith. Absolutely. Oh, what a feeling. That's right. That's right. A bit of product placement in the Senate. Uh, there were also four companies outside the ASX 300 who also repaid JobKeeper amounts, and I think we should acknowledge them as well. Australian Clinical Labs, Peter Warren Automatic, Universal Store and Dust Group. So congratulations to all of those companies who, at the point in time of the pandemic, were entitled to receive the JobKeeper payments. They didn't know what was going to happen in the months following, but they applied for the JobKeeper payments, got the JobKeeper payments. Looking back on time, they didn't need them, and in good conscience, in accordance with their social licence, they repaid those amounts. And I congratulate each and every one of those companies. Now, if I can move on to uh, the issue with respect to um, charities. There was a bit of talk around uh, regulations etc. in the charity space. Um, let me simply say that I commend the work of our scrutiny committees to everyone. Um, who uh, watches what happens in this place um, and uh, reiterate again how uh, much I enjoy serving on both uh, scrutiny committees uh, with my good friend Senator Carr uh, on the other side of the chamber. And I think our scrutiny system does, uh, does great work and I'm sure it will do great work uh, in the years and years to come. With respect to charities, I think the first point to note is that our charities perform an absolutely crucial role in terms of filling the gaps, making sure aid is provided to those less well off in our community, to vulnerable Australians. Government can't do it all. Government cannot do it all. And I've seen over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic just how important our charities are in terms of reaching different groups of people, different cohorts of people who weren't being given um, enough aid, not through any act of bad faith or anything, but simply they're falling between the cracks. For whatever reason, our charities are always there to support them. And that's a wonderful thing. And not only are our charities there to support those vulnerable people, but Australians are there to support those charities as well. And that also is a great thing. And that spirit of philanthropy, that spirit of generosity uh, goes to the very heart of what it means to be an Australian. The second point I want to make is in relation to tax deductibility. I think it is fit and proper that we as a civic society give an incentive to the private citizen to make a charitable donation. So I fully support the concept of deductible um, gifts uh, which can be taken off your assessable income. And I think that's an important principle to note. But I think also, I think also it's quite reasonable for the government and also for individual taxpayers who are donating to these charities to expect there to be some sort of conformity, some sort of consistency with respect to the regulation of charities and those groups and organisations who get the benefit of deductible gift status. And it should be noted in 2017 the Treasury actually identified 28,000 28, different organisations. It actually surprised me—28,000 different organisations who qualify for the deductible gift recipient classification, 18 per cent of those were not charities. 18 per cent of those were not registered charities. 10 per cent government entities and 8 per cent others who can transition to become registered charities. So that's what we're talking about there. That's the field we're talking about. The 8 per cent of the 28,000, those were the figures back in 2017. And I think it is important I think it is important that there's consistency, consistency in approach for deductible gift recipients and also for charities. And that's what this legislation, Schedule 1 of this legislation, in any event, seeks to do, promote that consistency. And what's the framework? What's the framework those deductible gift recipients are being brought under? I think they're being brought under a framework which is absolutely appropriate in terms of the regulation of charities. And I think Australia has a very robust system in terms of regulating our charities and ensuring, as the Australian people 
are entitled to be insured with respect to, that our charities are well run, transparent and accountable. And of course, this happens under the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission Act. And under that act, there are six standards. There are six standards that have to be met by any charity, and I want to run through those six standards. The first is the purpose and not-for-profit nature. So a registered charity must be <coughs> not-for-profit and work towards their charitable purpose. The charitable purpose must go to the heart of the organisation. That charitable purpose must go to the heart of what that organisation does. And the charity must be able to demonstrate this and provide information about their purpose to the public. So that charitable, that charitable foundation has to go to the heart of the organisation. The second standard is in relation to accountability to members. So charities must have members who can take reasonable steps to find out what the charity is doing. The charity has <coughs> got to be accountable to those members. So the members have a legitimate a legitimate right to raise concerns, raise issues and have those concerns addressed by the charity. A charity can't just be run, a charity should not be run, ever just run, for the benefit of a small group at the top. It needs to be accountable for the, to the membership, and that's absolutely <coughs> crucial. The third standard is compliance with Australian laws, and there was some discussion with respect to uh, proposed regulations in that regard. I note at the moment, just for the record, that charities must not commit a serious offence such as fraud under any Australian law or breach of law that may result in a penalty of 60 penalty units, which is currently $13,320 or more. Standard four, suitability of responsible persons. Charities must take reasonable steps to be satisfied that it's reasonable persons, responsible persons I should say, such as the board or trust committees of a trustee organisation, are not disqualified from managing a corporation under the Corporations Act. If you've been disqualified from managing a corporation under the Corporations Act, you shouldn't be on the executive board or a director of a charity. That should go without saying. <coughs> if you can't be a director of a company, you shouldn't be a director of a charity. St Standard five, duties of responsible persons. Charities must take reasonable steps to make sure that responsible persons are subject to understand and carry out the duties set out in this standard, including to act with reasonable care and diligence, to disclose conflicts of interest and to ensure that the financial affairs of the charity are managed responsibly. And that's fair and reasonable. That's fair and reasonable. If charities are going to get the benefit, if charities are going to get the benefit that their revenue, there's an incentive for people to make donations to them to provide them with a source of revenue. If charities are going to get the benefit of that, the flip side of that is they need to be responsibilities and duties imposed upon those who are running the charity. And standard six, maintaining and enhancing public trust and confidence in the Australian not-for-profit sector. And I want to quote this because this is really important. A charity must take reasonable steps to become a participating non-government institution if the charity is or is likely to be identified as being involved in the abuse of a person, either a in an application for redress made under section 19 of the National Redress Scheme for Institutional Child Sexual Abuse Act 2018, or b in information given in response to a request from the National Redress Scheme operator under the Redress Act. And I would like to take this opportunity, if I could, to commend the work that my very, very good friend, um, and I don't say that lightly, um, even under parliamentary privilege, of uh, Senator Smith in relation to um, the work that he's done in this space. I think it's um, incredibly important uh, work, and I know, uh, I know how seriously uh, Senator Smith treats that work. Um, and I know that it comes from, um, comes from the heart, which is so important to the survivors of those horrific, uh, horrific events. And I, I, just, just on that, I, I can remember how shocked I was seeing the list of Queensland-based charities and not-for-profit organisations um, who had come within the National Redress Scheme. It, it was just, it was nearly everyone. It was nearly everyone. And, it gives um, everyone a, a cause for, um, for deep reflection. So those are the six standards, Madam Deputy President, in relation to uh, where these um, deductible gift recipients are going to have to transition to, to the charitable uh, legislation. And that's fit and proper that they should do so. But they'll also be given time to do so. They'll also be given time to do so. So they'll be given at least 12 months 
in order to make that transition, to get their paperwork together, to do all the things they need to to transition. And that time can be extended. That time can be extended in certain circumstances if, uh, if the regular regulator sees fit uh, to provide an extension of time. And I should say uh, uh, one of the scrutiny committees on which I've sought has also had something to say about, um, about those circumstances as well. So I think it is fit and proper that there be a situation where the uh, organisations can be given more than 12 months to make that transition if they need more than 12 months. So on that basis, Madam Deputy President, I'm happy to um, um, support this legislation, support this work, bill. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, and um, I will make a contribution, um, which really goes to the part of this legislation that seeks to deal with offshore banking units. But before I do that, I just want to uh, respond to some of the, the statements from Senator Scar, who I know takes his work in this place very seriously, and uh, and being part of the committee that looks at legislation with great care. Uh, you know, I always listen carefully to what he has to say. But I also listen carefully to people who go out into our community and act with charity, whether that's an expression of a particular faith perspective or an expression of a particular philosophical perspective about the world and the, our place in it, uh, whether it's uh, you know, the uh, Islamic call to you know, give 10 per cent to care for others. And we've got that going on all over the country right now. The people who are upset with the government for what they're proposing to do are none other than Anglicare, Anglicare Australia, Mini Vinnies, St Vincent de Paul. They've got a few things to say about the government pulling a Swifty here. So we should be very, very careful to look at what the government is actually attempting with this piece of legislation. I think we should be particularly mindful uh, because of the warning. Like it's really it's like a great neon sign that we should be looking at very carefully because it comes from um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Gary Johns. Now he, he's kind of a hand-picked guy that this government decided to put in charge of the ACNC as the commissioner. And and He's been, you know, no, no pushover, as I understand it. I didn't have any encounters with him, but I understand he's he's uh, quite a, a serious and ruthless operator in some ways, in his own way. But uh, I can tell you what he said about this: that there is no charity, no charity, that has its reg has had its registration withdrawn due to activity of the kind that this government is purporting to need correction. So, alarm bells and neon signs, we need to be careful about what's embedded in this piece of legislation, and I hope that we might get to the bottom of that as we move into um, uh, the consideration in detail phase of this bill. But there is an important part of this bill um, that I rise to discuss today, uh, and that is to look at what's happening with the tax treatments of offshore banking units. I particularly want to speak to the reforms on offshore banking units and laud the work that's done to remove tax breaks for offshore financial institutions. Uh, in this time of national debt that Australia has never before seen and a great need to build up domestic capabilities, we should be closing these wasteful tax loopholes. Now, the tax concession was initially started as an incentive to attract and maintain highly global financial sector activity. Uh, particularly, it was seeking to draw uh, Hong Kong and Singapore. However, over the years, with so much change in the financial market, what's happened is this has actually become a loophole that preferenced harmful financial activities due to its low tax rate of 10 per cent and an interest withholding tax exemption on interest payments made by offshore banking units on eligible offshore borrowings. It sounds like a great mouthful, and uh, if you don't have much to do with offshore banking units, I suppose it's a little unintelligible. But it's not good. It's not good. In 2018, the OECD um, Forum on Harmful Tax Practices blasted this current regime and, and what it was doing, because it had an effect of attracting offshore businesses to Australia because it, ring, it then provided them with ring fencing to avoid Australian transactions from its scope. Now that's not good. That doesn't make us good international citizens. So 
Here we go. We come to this reform three years later. This bill will ensure that offshore banking units will not receive any special taxation arrangements and offshore banking units will be subject to the applicable corporate tax rate that Australian financial institutions play. Now, while the OBU regime has been effectively closed since 2018, this bill will forever bury this tax giveaway and end all of the grandfathering of this scheme by 2024-25. So, effectively, this part of the bill that I'm discussing is a correction and long overdue reform that I wholly support. However, as is the style and practice of this government, this is a reform that's coming too late and in a piecemeal fashion. And what we've seen over eight years of government with a failure to act on such a loophole as this is that Australians are missing out on millions of dollars of tax revenue that slip through these loopholes for overseas banking units that has been going on year after year after year after year. Count up eight, and it ends up being an awful lot of money. Now, Labor has been working very hard to draw attention to this reality. Very proud of the um, tireless work that we've done in the financial sector space to constantly stand up um, to the financial sector, the financial services sector, and for good practice in the financial ser services sector. It was Labor who pushed for the Hain Royal Commission. Um, and there may be people in this chamber who stand up and they make all sorts of claims along the lines of uh, a former senator who said uh, he was here to, and I quote, keep the bastards honest. It's been Labor position, the official position of the opposition who have constantly fought the government to protect Australian consumers and not let the reckless pursuit of private wealth for a few crush the dreams of everyday Australians. Now, Labor pushed the multinationals and the government for years and years to tighten laws around this multinational tax avoidance and to get these companies just to pay their fair share. There's nothing wrong with asking multinational companies to have the same standards as Australian companies and pay their tax. Labor pushed the government to support the Royal Commission into banks but the government voted against that 27 times. And because they did that and because they perpetuated a, a system for so long that was replete with widespread rotting of Australian customers, um, we had to push. We really had to push to prompt an ethical reshaping of Australia's entire financial sector. Now, Labor pushed for that inquiry into the auditing sector. That promoted a complete rethink of Australian companies, how they're audited, and what the conflicts of interest that happen in auditing between the work of consultants and auditors and the big four professional services firms. That was a really great piece of work by the um, Joint Committee for Parliamentary um, for Corporations and Financial Services. And um, the report was really a roadmap for this government for action to take, but so often as this government does, the work gets done. They get given the plan and then they forget to show up for work and don't get on with the job of doing the things that need to be done to make life better and safer for people here in Australia. The Australian people look to Labor to stand up for social justice and equity, certainly in the workplace, but also in the marketplace, a healthy and functioning business uh, environment is vital to the creation of jobs and the opportunities that that gives all Australians to grow and fulfil their potential. We understand, as the Labor Party, how vital people's retirement is. And in the absence of dignity in retirement for too many Australians, we created superannuation for Australian workers. Right now, we are firmly invested in an ethical financial sector to ensure that the retirement incomes of millions of Australians are managed in an ethical and efficient way that benefits them, their families, their lives and their communities. We could all benefit from ethical practice in the financial sector. 
rather than a few benefiting uh, with, uh, with impunity. I support our financial services sector to continue to be a world leader and grow in its role as a financial services centre for this, the Asia-Pacific region. As fintech providers keep innovating and digital wallets become more commonplace than leather ones, I think that regulation needs to keep pace and ensure that Australian consumers are protected. It's a solemn role of this government to safeguard their interests, and I'll always fight to ensure consumers are heard. Uh, in a recent inquiry uh, of the Corporations and Financial Services Committee, and I see Senator Hume uh, sort of nodding there, we, we actually looked into what was happening in the digital wallet space. And I have to say it was quite concerning to find out that 80 per cent of the transactions that occur in the country occur on a phone that looks like this, an Apple phone, and 20 per cent happen on Android phones. And, and that is because the profile of people who own these Apple phones tend to be people who have a, a bit more money. And within these phones, I mean, we put our thumb on the older ones and you just point it generally. There's a little chip in the corner and it goes across and all of a sudden your money's transferring. Well, the government needs to be paying attention to what's going on there. Because in the space between where you put that chip on that little reader and where the person who sells you a good or product gets the money, that whole piece of infrastructure in the middle is completely outside any regulation in this country. The ACCC don't know what to do with it. Uh, th there's just a mess in there. There's nobody watching carefully what's going on. And what we have now is this massive, of because of COVID, of course, we've had this massive increase in the amount of people using digital technologies to pay for things. And we've got, a po got to a point now where it was about 24 per cent just a couple of years ago of transactions using that technology. Now we're at a point where it's going to be over 51 per cent by the time we get to the end of the year. And in jurisdictions that are pretty similar to us, they're up into the 80 per cent. So it's important that our government is on to this stuff. I know that there's been a review that was you know, heralded in October last year. Hurry up, hurry up, we've got to find out about what's going on in the financial space. And a good friend of the Treasurer's, uh, Mr Farrell, apparently, one of his former colleagues, was uh, commissioned to do a second report for the government. It was supposed to be due in April. Didn't land on the minister's, on, on the minister's uh, the Treasurer's desk until the 1st of June. Here we are, just about hitting September. No sign of it. We've got problems that are under construction as I speak tonight. How many people will have used that technology and the government's not paying attention? And that's why this legislation that deals with overseas banking units is actually too late for it to be good government, but at least it's finally got done. But the government is found too often wanting in this space where good action should be taken. And then I contrast that with you know, Mr Gary John's very significant neon signal that the government's doing something pretty dodgy with regard to charities. So dodgy that charities like St Vincent de Paul, Anglicare um, and other, other agencies that we know so many people in our community rely on are saying, do not allow the government to put in regulation that's going to change what we're able to do. Do not put a lot more red tape in place. Do not attack us. Because that's what's happening, to the point where they've put out an open letter. So, with regard to uh, this bill and what it does in terms of making sure that Australians uh, can no longer be ripped off by overseas banking units, I will vote for this bill. I'm glad to vote for it. it finally, close one of the most generous loopholes in our taxation system that's been open for far too long. I look forward to working with all those in this place to ensure that there is an ethical financial sector that makes money in an honest, non-exploitative way, one that pays its fair share of taxes, and one in this changing time of a switch to a digital economy is considered in a way that anticipates the exploitation of Australian small business owners and their customers, who deserve much better care, consideration and protection from this government that they, than they are currently being afforded. Too late. Everything's not a race to them. 
But in the end, the people who pay the price for this government not doing its day job properly are the Australian people. Thank you. Senator Macdonald. Thank, thank you, Madam Acting and uh, Madam Deputy President. I rise to speak in support of the Treasury Laws Amendment 2021 Measures No. 2 Bill 2021 and changes to offshore banking unit rules as they apply to groups wanting to register for status as a, a deductible gift recipient. Now, this uh, measure makes changes to the Income Tax Assessment Act 1997 to require non-government entities seeking endorsement as a deductible gift recipient to be a charity registered with the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission or operated by a registered charity. And ancillary funds and specifically listed entities will be exempt from this requirement. Now, charities and charitable bodies operate best when they have the full trust of the public. And this bill seeks to reinforce the framework on which that partnership is built. And these changes are designed to help the affected entities and their donors by making absolutely clear the entity's tax deductible status. It is similar to how some com companies stamp their products RSPCA approved or with the Heart Foundation tick. Doing that is reassuring to the people handing over their money because the product carries a scent by an official certifying authority. With deductible gift recipients, this bill grants them roll gold government recognised status as a legitimate operation people can donate to confidently. It will also improve the consistency of rules governing deductible gift recipients, providing clarity and improving efficiency so they can maximise the time spent on helping their chosen causes. And the requirement to be a charity already applies to the majority of the general DGR recipient categories in tax law. But this measure will amend the special conditions applying to other general DGR categories. This measure takes effect from three months after the bill receives royal assent, the 12-month transition period which will provide non-charity DGR recipients with times to meet the requirements for charity registration without losing their existing status. So I touch on um, just a few of the details uh, in the legislation because I think it has already been so well covered off by Senator Starr, the always gracious Senator Scar. Um, but I did want to touch on some of the other points that have been made, particularly around the multinational tax avoidance, because it has to be acknowledged that we are a global leader in the international fight against corporate and multinational tax avoidance. And since the 1st of July 2016 to the 30th of April 2021, the ATO has raised around $21.5 billion in tax liabilities against large public groups, multinational corporations, wealthy individuals and associated groups. And of this, $13.5 billion in liabilities were raised from multinationals and large companies. So this has uh, generated cash collections of around $12.5 billion already. And since 2016, we have implemented more than a dozen measures to address corporate and multinational tax avoidance. Um, this includes adopting the actions recommended by the OECD G20 base erosion and profit shifting, including country by country reporting, hybrid mismatch rules, anti treaty ab abuse rules, strengthened transfer pricing rules, and signing the multilateral instrument. Adopting other measures beyond BPPS, including a multinational anti avoidance law, which ensures companies do not avoid a taxable presence in Australia a diverted profits tax, double penalties for multinationals that seek to avoid tax, impose tax conditions on foreign investors and strengthen thin capitalisation laws. Enhanced whistleblower protection have been enacted to, to limit disincentives for individuals to report tax misconduct to the ATO. The mail has led an additional $8 billion of sales revenue being booked in Australia each year. So Australia has played a key role in driving the agenda on the OECD G20 BEPS process. We're on the BEPS steering committee, have contributed to every G20 meeting where this is discussed and have implemented BEPS rep rep uh, recommendations. So these are really important points to make and uh, I listen with interest to those opposite. Uh, I listen to the increasingly breathless hyperbole about 
what should have or could have happened uh, at the beginning of COVID. Um, I mean, I think we all recall the dark days of March 2020 with the terrible uncertainty of the pandemic. What would it mean to people's uh, security? What would it mean to their ability to put food on the table? The introduction of JobKeeper and JobSeeker has been something that was massively welcomed uh, by Australians at all levels, uh, even at the most basic of ensuring uh, mental health security for people who just didn't know what was going to happen next. And so the appalling attack by the opposition uh, on the very sensible approach that was taken during those dark days uh, just beggars belief. Um, and it seems that they have forgotten their own stimulus package of the Rudd days of 2009, uh, when they too understood that there is a time for stimulating the economy and providing security uh, to the people of Australia. Uh, so. Uh, the opposition seems to think there is only two jobs in, in leading a government. And of course, that is not only not true, uh, it gives you much discomfort to think about them ever holding the uh, Treasury positions because they just truly don't know what the job entails. So I recommend this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Patrick, remotely. Thank you very much. Um, um, Acting Deputy President, so I rise tonight to uh, to, to speak on uh, the TLAB two bill. Um, I'm not going to focus on the uh, on the substantive aspects of the bill, rather on the um, amendment that has been moved by uh, S Senator McAllister um, or foreshadowed by Senator McAllister. Um, look, I will start by saying that uh, um, Senator, Senator Scar has risen in this debate and uh, has presented a perspective, and I'll come to that in a, in a, in a short while. I just wonder, um, everyone seems to like Senator Scar. Uh, I'm wondering if he's trying to take the trophy of uh, Senator Dean Smith. Uh, we'll have to see as a function of time uh, what happens in that space. But uh, uh, yeah, Senator Scar did rise and speak about the benefits of the JobKeeper program. And I, don't, I think everyone around the chamber would agree that JobKeeper was a necessary measure during COVID-19. There's no question that there were companies that absolutely needed to have a, um, uh, a hand uh, up, um, or indeed a hand out from the government to help them through a most difficult time. And no one begrudges those companies for having taken that money. We have to remember that the purpose of the program was in fact uh, uh, to try and maintain a connection between employers and employees. And it was effective in doing that. And we didn't put in place a lot of uh, constraints or controls. Uh, and you know, part of the problem we've found ourselves in is that the government uh, were mindful of the need to uh, assist without having too much red tape and allowed companies to estimate what their uh, what, what their profit might be, what their turnover might be moving forward. And everyone had a right to basically say, look, things look pretty grim. There's no issue with the approach that was taken by the government. However, we now know that uh, there are a number of companies that have come through the other side of uh, the pandemic with increased profits with increased profits, which they've then uh, you know, uh, directed uh, at uh, bigger dividends and, and uh, executive bonuses. So what, what's happened here is we've taken taxpayers' generosity through the JobKeeper program uh, and basically funneled that into the pockets of investors and the pockets of executives. And that was never what this money was intended for. Now, I agree with Senator Scar that not, none of these companies have broken any law. The law was very loose in the way in which it was created and uh, was done so because of the uncertainty moving forward. But now it is uh, incumbent upon the, the company directors, those who have um, uh, taken uh, the money and then managed to make a much larger profit than what they uh, already had. Had. And look, we know from analysis that's been done by the PBO 
that this uh, that that the amount of money we're talking about is somewhere of the order of twelve and a half billion dollars. Twelve and a half billion dollars that was basically handed over to companies who, in the end, did not need it. Now. Uh, the proper thing for all of these companies to do is to hand back that money. I'm talking about the companies that did better as a result of uh, the circumstances of the pandemic. You know, the taxpayer doesn't want money back from those companies that struggle. They don't mind the fact that they've helped them out. But the companies that did well need to look long and hard at themselves. And one of the ways in which we can assist them in doing so is to make public exactly how much each company received. So it's very clear who received the JobKeeper and how much they received. Uh, that can be looked at uh, in relation to how well they did. And uh, we can use that to basically um, uh, encourage companies to repay money. Now, we know this has worked in New Zealand. In New Zealand, you can go, in fact, well, in Australia, you can go onto a New Zealand government website and uh, look for, and you know, people can just uh, use Google to, to, to look for a site that uh, goes to their wage subsidy programs. And you can type in the name of any company, Qantas, uh, Harvey Norman, uh, any company in New Zealand that, that's operating, and it will tell you uh, exactly how much JobKeeper or their equivalent was received, and indeed other assistance money, uh, and in the case where it is a wage subsidy, how many employees were uh, involved in um, uh, uh, in the you know in the transaction. So you know if there were 100 employees or 200 employees, so that you can see that information. Uh, and th this is not information that uh, that is. Uh, sensitive to the companies, it's taxpayers' information. It's the amount of money the government has handed over. Um, and in New Zealand, what they've managed to do is get back 5% uh, of the monies paid under their program. What have we got back here in Australia? 0.25%. Just a fraction. And the difference between the two countries is simply transparency, turning on the lights and letting everyone see, and letting everyone make their own assessment. And uh, that has brought about a return of money that can be used for many other things, many important things that we need in society. You know, we, we see in the chamber, uh, uh, regularly we, we come into the cha chamber and we see cuts being made to programs. Just imagine what $12.5 billion could do. Um, that would be of great assistance. And that's why we can't turn our back on this. That's why we need to look at what happened here. Again, not suggesting companies have broken the law, but that they have a moral obligation uh, to uh, uh, return money that was provided to them for a different reason, uh, for, for money that was generously given to them by the taxpayer for a particular purpose. Thank you, and Senator that Patrick. Been... You'll be in continuation. It being 7.20. Thank you very much. It being 7.20, I propose the Senate now adjourn. Senator Chandler. Thank you. I rise this evening to pay tribute to a remarkable woman, an inspiring teacher, a selfless community contributor and fearless liberal, Mrs Beth Darcy, who passed away on the 9th of August 2021. I've spoken about Mrs Darcy in this place once before in my maiden speech to the chamber, and I think that's particularly telling of the impact she had upon me when she taught me at St Michael's Collegiate School. William Butler Yeats said, "'Education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire.' I have no doubt that I speak on behalf of many of Mrs Darcy's former students when I say that no one could light a fire quite like she did. It was considered a rite of passage for collegiate girls to attend civics lessons with Mrs Darcy in preparation for the annual Year 6 Canberra trip. For weeks in the lead up to my trip in November 2002, Mrs Darcy taught us the fundamentals of our democracy from holding elections to passing legislation. Our lessons culminated in a mock election with Mrs Darcy, of course, performing the role of returning officer. 
Once we arrived in Canberra, our lessons were applied even further in practice during a tour of Parliament House, with Mrs Darcy taking the lead. We met with what seemed like dozens of parliamentarians and questioned them about their role as re representatives and decision makers. I was fascinated with the idea of how my vote could one day, through the structures enshrined in our constitution, impact upon the decisions that were being made in this place. That fascination was firmly rooted in a strong understanding of how those structures worked, and that understanding came from Mrs Darcy. As the Dean of St David's Cathedral, the very Reverend Richard Humphrey, said in a sermon at her funeral last week, she not only taught active citizenship, she lived it. Beyond the fundamental importance of our democracy, the other thing Mrs Darcy impressed upon me was that it was entirely possible, indeed necessary, to provide our young people with a robust civics education, in turn creating informed and active citizens with a deep respect for our democratic institutions in a completely objective and nonpartisan way. While, of course, she told us of the existence of political parties, never in any of our civics classes did Mrs Darcy provide any political commentary. In fact, it wasn't until almost a decade later when I joined the Liberal Party that I happened across Mrs Darcy at a party function and realised for all this time she'd been a card-carrying member. As it turned, she'd even run as a Liberal candidate for the seat of Denison, now known as Clark, at the 1989 state election. At this time, when I reconnected with Mrs Darcy again, I told her what an impact she'd had on me, encouraging my interest in politics. And even then, nearly 10 years later, she said, Please, Claire, tell me you didn't join the Liberal Party because of me. I always tried so hard to make sure I was apolitical when I was teaching you girls. I reassured her that she was absolutely non-partisan in her teachings, but couldn't quite bring myself to say that she had nothing to do with me joining the Liberal Party. Because fundamentally, I know it was my exemplary civics education provided by Mrs Darcy that fortified in me a deep respect for our democracy and our political institutions and drove me to contribute to those institutions in some meaningful way by joining a political party and ultimately seeking election to the federal parliament. From that meeting, I came to know Mrs Darcy not just as my former teacher, but as a tireless volunteer for the Liberal Party in Tasmania. Her contribution, particularly in the Clark electorate as a member of the West Hobart branch, was well regarded by many. And when Mrs Darcy chose to make her views known on an issue at a meeting, well, we knew very well to listen. Along with her husband, Max, who passed away in 2011, Beth Darcy was a much-loved member of the Hobart Anglican community, particularly through her long-standing association with my alma mater, Collegiate, and the Hutchins School. While I wasn't able to attend Beth's funeral at St David's due to the Canberra lockdown, it was a testament to Mrs Darcy's legacy to see so many people associated with those two schools in attendance via the live stream I viewed alongside a number of others last Tuesday. She was also a committed Rotarian and valued member of the Lyric Singers Choral Group. Mrs Darcy is survived by her three children, Jane, Alison and Andrew, and seven grandchildren, all of whom I know will miss their family matriarch so much. But I know Mrs Darcy's legacy will live on in the people's lives she's impacted, in the communities she's given back to so tirelessly, and perhaps most importantly, in the hundreds of fires she's lit in her former students by inspiring them to lives of learning and active citizenship. Mrs Darcy, our democracy is so better for the impact that you have had. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I arrived this evening to talk about an organisation that I've been following for a significant period of time. It's an innovative, exciting project that, has that is taking a 25-year approach. Children's Ground, it's called. Children's Ground is a not-for-profit organisation designed and led by First Nations peoples to end in enduring injustice and disadvantage. The organisation is First Nations family and community led, driven and implemented at both the board and community levels. First Nations cultural governance is at the front and centre of delivery. Their governance system recognises the equal importance of cultural governance and corporate governance, and their community governance committees are comprised of 100 per cent local First Nations peoples. The Children's Ground approach is a 25-year integrated and preventative approach and is founded on systemic change across five service areas 
which are education, health, economic independence, culture and community development. Children's Ground has developed and delivers an evidence-based approach collecting data for every child, family and community to measure, demonstrate and evaluate what is working and to learn from, gathering evidence to drive systemic reform in government policy and service delivery. The Children's Ground approach is designed for long-term change. They have a 25-year strategy for change within communities and across the system and know that change will take time so they will walk alongside each child for an entire generation. This is what I find so exciting. They are not a quick fix or program-based model, but focused on outcomes, investing, investing in prevention rather than responding to crises. Children's Ground is an organisation working towards not only changing the lives of the communities they work with, but completely changing the systems that have failed First Nations people since colonialisation. They are doing this through the practice, leadership and evidence. Each community has agency and control over their project and are governed in their, in their operations by the local community and traditional owners. For example, in Central Australia, they have Umba Kana Kalaga, which is the Aranda name for Children's Ground. And they follow the direction of, children's, of, the, of their uh, Central Australia Governance Committee. In West Arnhem, they are called, and I apologise for my mangled uh, pronunciation, Wadu Gariyamari Ran, which means we are all standing together as one family walking the path with our children. Despite their community integrated approach, Children's Ground is struggling to get long-term funding commitments from uh, the government in key areas of education and health. Children's Ground is working in nine communities and receiving limited funding for only three. To meet the government's close the gap measures, we need to meet we need to have community-led solutions backed by government. We cannot keep starting wonderful projects like Children's Ground and then having them peter out or abruptly end because funding has ceased. We know this is there for the long term. Children's Ground is continuing to grow as more First Nations communities hear and see the results and seek their services. Continued support from the Australian government to maintain health and education activities that privileges First Nations language, culture and connection to country to maintain First Nations leadership and decision making will make the change the next generation are wanting. I urge the government to please work with and support Children's Ground to meet their aspirations in the next few years. This is truly such an important, in fact groundbreaking program that I really urge the government to get on board with this group. They are doing amazing work and they need support. I urge everybody here to go and have a look at their website, to talk to them and learn what they're trying to achieve in their 25-year vision, which is, as I articulated, is talking about a generation, so achieving true generational change. Senator Bragg. Well, I rise tonight to address the Senate on the question of uh, superannuation policy. Uh, people would be aware that uh, New South Wales has been enduring a very lengthy lockdown, and one of the major uh, issues uh, that has fallen out of this lockdown has been the disproportionate impact on small business. I mean, it's all good, it's all well and good for people who work in the public sector or work for big businesses uh, to be immune from the crisis, uh, but it is the people who are in personal care sectors that are most affected. And these are travel agents and barbers and hairdressers uh, and beauticians, and the list goes on. And one of the things that comes up regularly in conversation that I have with people who are working in these affected small business sectors uh, is why can't they get access to their super like they could last year? Now, I think last year uh, we put forward a very effective policy called Early Release Super, which was very engaging for people. And I think it is quite uh, mean and nasty that we would deny people access to their own money above and beyond the disaster support payments. And, and this takes me to uh, a couple of policy ideas that I have. I mean, one is that there should be a permanent early release scheme for people. I mean, people can get access to their super now uh, for um, 
IVF and for lap band surgery um, where trustees granted. And I think that in the absence of the government uh, wanting to put in place a scheme, a permanent scheme, uh, I think it is appropriate that trustees do look upon the cases raised by small business people in particular uh, and grant them access to their own money, because it is, after all, their money. And if they are going to grant people access to their own money for IVF and for lap band surgery, then certainly uh, if, if small businesses are at risk of never recovering from the lockdowns, then they should be granted access to their super. And I'm very happy to assist people in making those representations. The other issue I wanted to raise is we need to uh, pursue longer-term productivity enhancing reforms. Um, now, super is a huge bet the nation has taken, and it is probably one of the um, riskiest policies we've ever enacted. 10% uh, of people's money goes off to these funds. Uh, they generally manage it quite poorly. Um, and people are, as I have already discussed, denied access to this money. Um, it, it's, been given to, it's been given to the financial institutions and it's been given to the unions uh, by politicians 30 years ago for, for, various, for, for various political reasons. And I take the interjection, and here we go, the vested interest defending the crooked super scheme. Fantastic. Crooked. It's crooked. It's all crooked. And, and, the, and, and, the, and the point here is, and I take the interjections, and once again, Labor will do anything for big super. You'll do anything to defend big super. Keep going, keep going. You're making my point for me. Making my point. It's a, it's a, it's a party of vested interests. This is fantastic. Keep going, keep going. There we go. Thank you. I look for, we'll look forward to clipping that a bit later. So we take the interjections. And the point here is that 30 years ago, Paul Keating, Mr Keating, gave the keys to the city to the financial institutions and to the unions. And they have run this industry for themselves, not for the workers. The, return, the, the, returns are, the returns are poor relative to other options. And one of the things that we should be pursuing over the next, ne next little while is we should be pursuing the future, the future Fund as a option for default super. It's, it's outperformed all the average super funds and it's something that I think could work very well. Now, the Labor Party want to, want to bind people up in, in red tape and in opas, uh, opaque Order. structures uh, because they don't want people to run their own affairs, because you believe in paternalism, uh, because you want to separate people from the money, because you want the donations that flow through to the unions into your political party. And that's what it's all about. It's all about money. But what we're interested in, and what I'm interested in, is pursuing policies which uh, enable people to get control of their own affairs. And what we should be doing is looking at ways to make this system work better because it's not working in the interests of people. Who could imagine that we would have a policy that is designed to reduce the cost of an ageing population that costs the taxpayer more than it saves? It costs the taxpayer more than it saves. It costs the taxpayer more than it saves. It, is, it doesn't work. It doesn't get people off the pension. All it does is line the coffers of the unions and the Labor Party, and they will defend that to the hilt. The Labor Party would rather save super than save Australia, and that's why they're opposed to early release. They're opposed to any measure that is designed to improve the system for workers, because you're not here for workers. You're here for yourselves, the party of vested interests. You should be ashamed of yourselves. We should pursue these reforms because they would improve outcomes for workers, and that's who we're here to serve. Senator O'Neill. <laughs> oh, I've got to stop myself from laughing at that uh, contribution. It's hard to take it seriously. But um, look, uh, Mr. President, I, I rise to speak on a critically important matter to Australia's not-for-profit and charity sector, and, and that is to um, Assistant Minister Suker's new proposed regulations to gag charities. Um, the so-called champions of free speech on the other side are silent when it comes to this new regulation. Uh, they rail against any kind of red tape in this uh, chamber all of the time, except when it comes to silencing those who dare to speak out, who dare to speak out particularly against the government. Now, I've seen Sel Senator Alex Antic decry cancel culture for a fake campaign to change the name of Magnum ice cream. Senator Canavan's cracked open colonial beers in solidarity with brewing company. Yet they've said nothing about these new regulations. They've all been silent silent about this attempt to shut down dissent in the charity sector. They're happy to play a pointless game of culture wars. But when it really matters, when their own government is proposing to shut down debate from Christian, from Islamic, from Jewish, 
from non-denominational other charities, this government is nowhere to be found. The new regulations the government's proposing will actually inhibit free speech and gag dissenters to the government's agenda. They're even going to give the ACNC commissioner the power to deregister a charity if it reasonably, and I quote, if it reasonably believed it was more likely than not that that entity will not comply with a government standard. No charge or guilty verdict required. Where is the natural justice in that? And it's not just me saying this. Anglicare Australia, the St Vincent de Paul Society, the Benevolent Society, Baptist Care Australia, Uniting Care Australia, Catholic Social Services Australia, they're all signatories to an open letter against these changes. That's an extraordinary step for those charities to take at a time when they're fighting to do the very best they can for people under such pressure in our community during this COVID crisis. The letter that they published clearly states, and I quote, these new rules undermine the legitimate and lawful advocacy of what we do. They will stifle the voices of the people we represent and stifle our mission to create a just society where all Australians can live their lives with dignity. Anglicare leader Casey Chambers was right about the regulations when she said, they're not just an attack on charities, they're an attack on democracy. These regulations are hardly needed, and they're instead a cynical ploy to stop charities from speaking out against the government in an election year, and that's pure and simple. Unlawful acts are clearly already unlawful. This type of collective punishment is deeply harmful and unwarranted. The government's own review into charities legislation recommended a complete repeal of the standard this same government now seeks to broaden. So let's just break that down one more time. The government undertook a review into charities and to charities legislation. That review, at the government's own request, said repeal the standard and instead this government is now seeking to broaden that. Gary Johns is the ACNC commissioner. And Mr Johns has confirmed the fact that there is no charity that he oversees, and he oversees them all, no charity that's had their registration withdrawn due to activity. Now, these proposed regulations will divert time, resources and donations away from charity work and into compliance, dealing with new red tape, and that will not help Australians. It will not help charities help Australians to recover from the dual shocks of a recession and a pandemic. It's not effective regulation designed to fill a loophole or address a societal ill. In fact, it's an intimidation tactic by the government to silence its critics. I ask all those on the other side who get angry at the thought of a brand of beer, cheese or ice cream changing their name, think instead what really matters, the government shutting down free speech of the entire charity sector. That is just unbelievable and it must not occur. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. It is with some level of bewilderment and frustration that I make this contribution this evening. It is a frustration I carry on behalf of commuters across Greater Hobart, because as anyone living in the Greater Hobart area knows, traffic congestion in our city has been worsening for some years. And so it was pleasing to see some two and a half years ago, the federal government, federal government make a commitment, a promise, to the people of Hobart that they would invest serious dollars into alleviating, in fact, busting traffic congestion in our city. Yet it was an announcement received with some trepidation and, unfortunately, as it turns out, rightly so. The Hobart Urban Congestion Package was first committed to, to by the then Minister, Alan Tudge, on the 22nd of February 2019 a package of $25 million that was meant to, and I quote, ease congestion and improve access in and around the city's northern suburbs, end quote. That's according to the Morrison government's own media statement making the announcement. Now we know that announcements are something that this Prime Minister is particularly good at. He loves to make them, and that's fine. But the problem we all have is not in the announcement, 
but in the delivery, because it is this component of the commitment-making process that this Prime Minister has particular difficulty following through on. In fact, the overwhelming evidence to date is that he simply can't do it. And this particular project, something that amounts, uh, amounts at this stage to nothing more than an announcement, is the perfect case in point. Because here we are, two and a half years on from actually signing the Hobart City deal, and the Morrison government still can't decide what to do with the $25 million earmarked for tackling urban conge congestion in the Hobart's northern suburbs. In fact, we have learned through the estimates process that there have been no fewer than eight meetings with relevant stakeholders in this time, and yet nothing tangible appears to have come from any of them. Indeed, the latest announcement to come from government following the stakeholder meeting in May was for the commissioning of yet a, wait for it, another study into the issue. It will be a further two months before discussions can progress following the results of the latest of several studies commissioned by the state and federal Liberal governments. They have certainly got the process of undertaking stu studies down pat. It is a pity they can't figure out how to uh, figure out how to do the actual infrastructure delivery part. The government claims this study is a, part, a key part of progressing the project. Strange then, and it has taken eight separate stakeholder meetings and 18 months to reach this realisation. One would have thought that this kind of project scoping study would have been the very first thing you would do for the project of this type. But you see, even the federal government's own infrastructure department has recognised the painstakingly slow nature of the government's half-hearted attempt to make good on its promise. At estimates back in May, it, in response to questioning as to why it has taken so long to identify how this funding commitment might be progressed, the committee was told by departmental officials, and I quote, I think we'll probably escalate this one a little more than we have so far to the extent that we haven't been able to identify projects within the budget for the conge congestion package. I think it, it's one where we'll all have to have a pretty hard-headed negotiation with Tasmania and ensure that we get some projects identified soon for Hobart, and that's something that we'll prioritise inside the par um, department." End quote. And it's been two and a half years. And yet, when it comes to urban congestion package, Hobartians are nowhere near knowing a time frame for the starting or the completion of this project, or indeed what this project even is. This failure to deliver on infrastructure commitment in Tasmania has been laid bare repeatedly through the estimate process. In fact, 81 per cent of the Liberal, Liberals' promised infrastructure spend for Tasmania is still in the in planning phase. This simply isn't good enough. But it's classic Mor Mr Morrison, big on flashy announcements, pretending to get things done, but when it comes to actually delivering on his commitment, he leaves us all stuck in the slow lane. With Mr Morrison's, it's all talk, 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 talk. Tasmanians deserve a government that will actually follow through and deliver on co commitments. Tasmanians deserve a government that will build infrastructure and tackle congestion, a government that is on your, their side, an Albanese Labor government. Senator Roberts, remote. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, my remarks will be on the most basic of human rights, freedom to protest. State premiers have declared a war on peaceful protest against their policies, including the Freedom Day rallies. Yet they allow protests they agree with, such as Black Lives Matter. An ethical nightmare over human rights is brewing between the parliaments and the people. It's the fault of blind political ambition leveraged off a virus that has turned out to be, according to government health experts' own data, no more harmful than a bad flu. It's time we cancelled the COVID apocalypse. It's time to end the use of COVID as an excuse to implement all powerful legislation that it exempts itself from proper scrutiny. Both the Biosecurity Act of 2015 and the National Emergency Declaration Act of 2020 make a mockery of 120 years of legislation, 800 years of common law. Both pieces of legislation are being used in ways never put to the people. Together, these acts trespass unreasonably on the rights and liberties of everyday Australians. No parliament that wishes to call itself a democracy can grant indefinite, absolute and unscrutinised power. 
state premiers have entered into a COVID arms race with each other, leaving Australians trapped in the middle of the crossfire. Huge increases in suicide attempts, children phoning helplines in unprecedented numbers, and small businesses in ruins. And what created this? Federal Parliament's failure to hold the line against fear and misuse of power. Emergency should mean a dissolution of rights, should not mean a dissolution of rights, especially when a state of emergency can be stretched out for months, years, or even indefinitely. COVID policy has turned into a parallel legal system, embraced by a Prime Minister who has encouraged health orders that permanently alter the landscape of work and travel. Death has become a matter of politics and mismanagement, used to prevent the sacred freedom to assemble and protest peacefully. If Australians cannot protest, parliaments will never be held accountable for errors in judgment. One of parliament's many mistakes is in the presentation of COVID data. Given without context, they tower over us, Viewed in context, COVID harm barely deviates from normal. Parliament cannot promise safety. Safety is an outcome of parliaments following policies that protect our freedoms and our rights. Instead of handling, handling COVID with a view to these important guiding principles, politicians have suffocated Australia under the weight of biosecurity powers, resulting in displays of cruelty that have shocked the whole world. The fact is, we are not safe. We are not safe from our own parliaments. Freedom protests are a criticism of COVID policies and Parliament's atrocious governance. Like the manufacturers of vaccines, Parliaments do not want to hear any complaints about the quality of their work. Despite this Parliament's best attempts to control people, we are blessed with a nation full of people who refuse to live under the coercion of fear. This may be considered civil dis disobedience. I call it common sense. The Prime Minister's role is to perform his duty with pragmatism and calm. Instead, Scott Morrison has rattled the cage of fear and enticed state politicians to do the same. Instead of focusing on trust, this parliament endorses spending tens of millions of dollars advertising COVID fear. Operation COVID Shield is now an attempt to use military to force the behaviour associated with trust without any attempt to create the meeting of the minds necessary for trust. Abused people may well obey their captors, but they do not trust them. The more rights parliaments steal from Australians, the less likely people are to trust. Australians use, ask for choice in COVID treatments, and the government suppress peer-reviewed and internationally accepted alternatives like ivermectin. Australians ask for vaccine manufacturers to accept liability for their products, and instead were denied any recourse in the event of personal harm. Australians tried to report fatal side effects, and for months, the parliament, the legacy media and social media silenced them. Australians took to the streets to tell this parliament and state premiers that the health orders were destroying millions of lives and the states hunted them down like criminals. To enforce compliance, parliaments will need more policies like Operation COVID Shield, more police, more defence force members in our streets. Force will still fail because fear and intimidation are a terrible plan. The damage done to the sacred trust between the people and parliaments is catastrophic. Parliamentary policy has destroyed trust in vaccines, creating two classes of people in Australia, those who profit from the pandemic and those who suffer from it. Policy, not COVID, has destroyed trust in vaccines. COVID Shield seeks to repair it with the rhetoric of war. Everyday Australians are not buying this nonsense. Australians know that the parliament, what the parliaments, the military and the health bureaucrats do not know. We will not be divided. We have one flag, we are one community, and we are one nation. Thank you. Senator Rice, remotely. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. It was only nine days ago that the Taliban arrived in Kabul. It was only nine days ago that the Afghan president, Ashraf Ghani, flew out. In the last nine days, there has been a desperate effort by Western governments to be getting people out of Afghanistan, a desperate effort to get their defence force, to get their citizens, to get their permanent residents, to get their families of permanent residents, and to get human rights defenders women's rights defenders, journalists, other people out of Afghanistan. Australia has, over the last nine days, managed to get hundreds, maybe it's up to a thousand yet people. And we have got heartbreaking, heartwarming stories against this heartbreaking backdrop, this heartbreaking backdrop of Afghanistan having fallen once again to the brutal regime of the Taliban Amongst that backdrop, we've now got some heartwarming stories of people that we've been able to get out. 
and I followed the progress of a group of 11 people over the weekend who included human rights defenders, who included democracy workers, included a woman who was a 23-year-old who was trained to be a pilot, a four-year-old, a four-month-old, four who are now, as I speak, in flight to Australia. But the people that we have managed to get out, they have been at the very end of the pipe. These human rights defenders, good people, people of ethnic minorities such as the Hazara, who are going to, we know if they are left behind under a regime of the Taliban, they are at immense risk of death. They are at immense risk of not getting through. So it's great that we have been able to get some of them out. But the window for getting people out is closing rapidly. And the people that basically this pipeline of people that we've been able to get out, that's drying up. Thousands of people are putting in Herculean efforts to be trying to be making the systems work to get people out. And it is, they are to be commended, but it is at the end of the pipe of, and then there are going to be so many millions of people who are going to be left behind. And it's the end of a 20 year war that has failed to create a lasting peace. It's the 20, end of a 20 year war that did not succeeded, succeed in building robust institutions. It's the end of a 20 year war that was based on imperialism and power over, not power with. It didn't work. And now we are just doing our desperate best to pick up the pieces. But it's no wonder that it didn't work. Yes, in 2001, we had a problem. The Taliban in Afghanistan were brutal. They were awful. They were executing thousands of people. It was a terrible, terrible regime. But an invasion serving the interests of the imperial power, the invading powers, that imperialist war, it was not the solution to that problem. It has made the world less safe. It crea has created more terrorism. And it has, been, it has meant that come the forces withdrawing, the government collapsing, the institutions not surviving. We could have done things differently if we had, got, if we had, had a human rights-centred approach rather than the approach of having power over and control over. But we didn't. So what do we do now? We are left to just pick up the pieces. In Australia, is part of that problem. So we have got a responsibility to be help doing our utmost to be picking up those pieces. We have committed by the end of, um, by the August the 31st, when that pipe is gonna shut, we might get a thousand people, we might get 2000 people out. We need to do more. We have got a commitment now from our government to accept 3000 refugees from Afghanistan. We need to have so many more. We need to have an allocation of at least 20,000 refugees to pay, to do some acknowledgement of our role in this problem. We need to be giving permanent protection to the four and a half thousand temporary protection visa people who are currently in Australia. And we need to be committing ourselves to be working for justice, working for peace, working for human rights in the world through our defence policy, through our foreign policy, so that wars like this never occur again. Thank you, Senator Rice. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9.30am. Thank you.